by Joseph Lewis French. Forward by James H. Hyslop, LLD, Secretary of the Society for Psychical Research. Great, Great ghost, ghost Stories. Ghost stories lend themselves well to fiction. They leave the imagination entirely free. In ordinary fiction, especially of the realistic type, we expect some concessions to be made to facts, but when it comes to ghost story, we assign no limits to the imagination. This is because the supernatural world offers us no standards for curbing our fancy. Icarus is given impunity in that atmosphere, and there is no sun to melt his wings. Whatever our wishes, we do not expect ghosts to be real, and we are fancy-free to invent or distort as we may. But in the twilight of human knowledge, it was not thus. The boundaries of the real and the unreal were undefined, and the belief in the supernatural, while it allowed the imagination free reigns, revealed little difference between its creations and the ideas men held of the actual world. In this overlapping of the real and the imaginary, the ghost story arose and has never lost its interest for men, though the cold judgment of science deprived the real thing of its terrors. As knowledge increased and extended its domain, ghosts were reduced to hallucinations, much to the disappointment of lovers of the marvelous, and cultivated minds could only toy with them as objects either of literary fancy or of amusement against their less fortunate neighbors who desired to believe in them. Intellectuals who came into contact with stories like those in the phantasms of the living indulgently spoke of them with a mixture of humor and tolerance, which prevented them from either believing or denying them. But writers of fiction had no responsibilities and were not judged by the standards of either belief or unbelief, while the general public followed its tastes and imagination, chafed under the restraints of skepticism, and chose the easy road to satisfaction. In the present age, which is saturated with psychic research, whatever the motive or outcome of that movement, ghost stories have been revived partly because you can invoke interest under the cloak of science and partly because of an interest in the unknown and the desire to please our fancies, and fiction, which is art and not science, can escape the duty of preaching. The psychologist, however, may detect a concealed realism in the most audacious feats of the imagination, or an interest in the supernatural when the mind struggles to conceal or to ridicule it. Hence, a collection of ghost stories, whatever their nature, may have their value for every class of readers. Some will want to invoke age and general human interest in behalf of certain prejudices, and others will want to quote them as illustrations of superstition. But all will like a good story well told and appealing to the imagination, which always affords mankind more satisfaction than facts. Besides, a collection of them may reveal disguises which science may uncover, however deeply concealed, by the respectability that will not offend science, or by the ignorance which suspects that there is more in them than is dreamt of in our philosophy. At any rate, we may read them without demanding that they shall conform to our sense of reality and without expecting science to restrain the imagination. In other words, literature and its artistic interests will excuse us 
for an interest in them, while science will not hold us accountable for any indulgence of that interest. If the knowing can penetrate the veil and discover any truth in them, far beyond the ken of ordinary mortals, all others may complacently enjoy the illusion that they are superior to both science and superstition. With Macaulay, literature was more than the consolations of philosophy. This was because philosophy has only to be true while literature has only to please. Or is it because literature is nearer the truth and can please at the same time. Perhaps in this age when we are beginning to break down the barriers which science has set to the imagination, and this by an expansion of science itself, which is the nemesis of its own prejudices and arbitrarily imposed limits, we may find the salvation of both the intellect and the will. However this may be, with apparitions as a proved fact, and on the theory not due to chance in all instances, the fancies of the past may prove to have been founded in fact, however dressed to suit the purposes of literary art. James H. Hyslop, New York, September 15th, 1917 by Lord Edward Bulwer-Lytton. The, the House and the, the brain. brain. A friend of mine, who was a man of letters and a philosopher, said to me one day, as if between jest and earnest, Fancy, since we last met, I have discovered a haunted house in the midst of London. Really? Haunted? And by what? Ghosts? Well, I can't answer that question. All I know is this. Six weeks ago, my wife and I were in search of a furnished apartment. Passing a quiet street, we saw on the window of one of the houses a bill. Apartments furnished. The situation suited us. We entered the house, liked the rooms, engaged them by the week, and left them the third day. No power on earth could have reconciled my wife to stay longer, and I don't wonder at it. What did you see? It was not so much what we saw or heard that drove us away. It was an undefinable terror which seized both of us whenever we passed by the door of a certain unfurnished room, in which we neither saw nor heard anything. Accordingly, on the fourth morning I summoned the woman who kept the house and attended on us, and told her that the rooms did not quite suit us and we would not stay out our week. She said dryly, I know why. You have stayed longer than any other lodger. Few ever stayed a second night, none before you a third. But I take it they have been very kind to you. They, who, I asked, affecting to smile. Why, they who haunt the house, whoever they are. I don't mind them. I remember them many years ago when I lived in this house, not as a servant. But I know they will be the death of me some day. I don't care, I'm old, and must die soon anyhow. And then I shall be with them and in this house still. The woman spoke with so dreary a calmness that, really, it was a sort of awe that prevented my conversing with her further. I paid for my week, and too happy were my wife and I to get off so cheaply. "'You excite my curiosity,' said I. "'Nothing I should like better than to sleep in a haunted house. Pray,' 
Give me the address of the one which you left so ignominiously. My friend gave me the address, and when we parted, I walked straight toward the house thus indicated. It is situated on the north side of Oxford Street, in a dull but respectable thoroughfare. I found the house shut up, no bill at the window, and no response to my knock. As I was turning away, a beer boy, collecting pewter pots at the neighboring areas, said to me, Do you want anyone at that house, sir? Yes. I heard it was to be let. Let? Mr. J. offered Mother, who chars for him, a pound a week, just to open and shut the windows, and she would not. Would not? And why? The house is haunted, and the old woman who kept it was found dead in her bed with her eyes wide open. They say the devil strangled her. Pooh! You speak of Mr. J. Is he the owner of the house? Yes. Where does he live? In G Street, number blank. I gave the pot boy the gratuity earned by his liberal information, and I was lucky enough to find Mr. J. at home, an elderly man, with intelligent countenance and prepossessing manners. I communicated my name and my business frankly. I said I heard the house was considered to be haunted, that I had a strong desire to examine a house with so equivocal a reputation, that I should be greatly obliged if he would allow me to hire it, though only for a night. I was willing to pay for that privilege, whatever he might be inclined to ask. Sir, said Mr. J., with great courtesy, the house is at your service for as short or as long a time as you please. Rent is out of the question. The poor old woman who died in it three weeks ago was a pauper whom I took out of a workhouse, for in her childhood she had been known to some of my family, and had once been in such good circumstances that she had rented that house of my uncle. She was a woman of superior education and strong mind and was the only person I could ever induce to remain in the house. Indeed, since her death, which was sudden, and the coroner's inquest, which gave it a notoriety in the neighborhood, I have so despaired of finding any person to take charge of the house, much more a tenant, that I would willingly let it rent free for a year to anyone who would pay its rates and taxes. How long is it since the house acquired this sinister character? That I can scarcely tell you, but very many years since. The old woman I spoke of said it was haunted when she rented it between thirty and forty years ago. I never had one lodger who stayed more than three days. I do not tell you their stories. To no two lodgers have there been exactly the same phenomena repeated. It is better that you should judge for yourself than enter the house with an imagination influenced by previous narratives. Only be prepared to see and to hear something or other, and take whatever precautions you yourself please. Have you never had a curiosity yourself to pass a night in that house? Yes, I passed not a night, but three hours in broad daylight alone in that house. My curiosity is not satisfied, but it is quenched. I have no desire to renew the experiment. You cannot complain, you see, sir, that I am not sufficiently candid. 
and unless your interest be exceedingly eager, and your nerves unusually strong, I honestly add that I advise you not to pass a night in that house. My interest is exceedingly keen, said I, and though only a coward will boast of his nerves in situations wholly unfamiliar to him, Yet my nerves have been seasoned in such variety of danger that I have the right to rely on them, even in a haunted house. Mr. J. said very little more. He took the keys of his house out of his bureau, gave them to me, and thanking him cordially for his frankness and his urbane concession to my wish, I carried off my prize. Impatient for the experiment, as soon as I reached home, I summoned my confidential servant, a young man of gay spirits, fearless temper, and as free from superstitious prejudice as anyone I could think of. F, said I, you remember in Germany how disappointed we were at not finding a ghost in that old castle? which was said to be haunted by a headless apparition. Well, I have heard of a house in London, which, I have reason to hope, is decidedly haunted. I mean to sleep there tonight. From what I hear, there is no doubt that something will allow itself to be seen or to be heard. Something perhaps excessively horrible. Do you think, if I take you with me, I may rely on your presence of mind, whatever may happen? Oh, sir, pray trust me, answered F, grinning with delight. Very well. Then here are the keys of the house. This is the address. Go now. Select for me any bedroom you please. And since the house has not been inhabited for weeks, make up a good fire, air the bed well, see, of course, that there are candles as well as fuel. Take with you my revolver and my dagger, so much for my weapons, arm yourself equally well. And if we are not a match for a dozen ghosts, we shall be but a sorry couple of Englishmen. I was engaged for the rest of the day on business so urgent that I had not leisure to think much on the nocturnal adventure to which I had plighted my honor. I dined alone and very late, and while dining read, as is my habit, I selected one of the volumes of Macaulay's Essays. I thought to myself that I would take the book with me. There was so much of healthfulness in the style and practical life in the subjects that it would serve as an antidote against the influence of superstitious fancy. Accordingly, about half-past nine, I put the book into my pocket and strolled leisurely toward the haunted house. I took with me a favorite dog, an exceedingly sharp, bold, and vigilant bull terrier, a dog fond of prowling about strange ghostly corners and passages at night in search of rats, a dog of dogs for a ghost. It was a summer night, but chilly the sky somewhat gloomy and overcast. Still there was a moon, faint and sickly, but still a moon. And if the clouds permitted after midnight, it would be brighter. I reached the house, knocked, and my servant opened the door with a cheerful smile. All right, sir, and very comfortable. Oh said I, rather disappointed. Have you not seen or heard anything remarkable? Well, sir, I must own I have heard something queer. What? What? 
the sound of feet pattering behind me, and once or twice small noises like whispers close at my ear, nothing more. You are not at all frightened? I, not a bit of it, sir. And the man's bold look reassured me on one point, viz. that happen what might, he would not desert me. We were in the hall, the street door closed, and my attention was now drawn to my dog. He had at first run in eagerly enough, but had sneaked back to the door and was scratching and whining to get out. After patting him on the head and encouraging him gently, the dog seemed to reconcile himself to the situation and followed me and F through the house, but keeping close at my heels, instead of hurrying inquisitively in advance, which was his usual and normal habit in all strange places. We first visited the subterranean apartments, the kitchen, and other offices, and especially the cellars in which there were two or three bottles of wine still left in a bin, covered with cobwebs and, evidently, by their appearance, undisturbed for many years. It was clear that the ghosts were not wine-bibbers. For the rest, we discovered nothing of interest. There was a gloomy little backyard with very high walls. The stones of this yard were very damp, and what with the damp, and what with the dust and smoke-grime on the pavement, our feet left a slight impression where we passed. And now appeared the first strange phenomenon witnessed by myself in this strange abode. I saw, just before me, the print of a foot suddenly form itself, as it were. I stopped, caught hold of my servant, and pointed to it. In advance of that footprint, as suddenly, dropped another. We both saw it. I advanced quickly to the place. The footprint kept advancing before me, a small footprint, the foot of a child. The impression was too faint thoroughly to distinguish the shape, but it seemed to us both that it was the print of a naked foot. This phenomenon ceased when we arrived at the opposite wall, nor did it repeat itself on returning. We remounted the stairs and entered the rooms on the ground floor, a dining parlor, a small back parlor, and a still smaller third room that had been probably appropriated to a footman, all still as death. We then visited the drawing rooms, which seemed fresh and new. In the front room I seated myself in an armchair, F placed on the table the candlestick with which he had lighted us. I told him to shut the door. As he turned to do so, a chair opposite to me moved from the wall quickly and noiselessly, and dropped itself about a yard from my own, immediately fronting it. Why, this is better than the turning table, said I with a half laugh and as I laughed, my dog put back his head and howled. F, coming back, had not observed the movement of the chair. He employed himself now in stilling the dog. I continued to gaze on the chair and fancied I saw on it a pale blue, misty outline of a human figure but an outline so indistinct that I could only distrust my own vision. The dog was now quiet. Put back that chair opposite to me, said I to F. Put it back to the wall. F obeyed. Was that you, sir? 
said he, turning abruptly. I? What? Why, something struck me. I felt it sharply on the shoulder, just here. No, said I. But we have jugglers present, and though we may not discover their tricks, we shall catch them before they frighten us. We did not stay long in the drawing rooms. In fact, they felt so damp and so chilly that I was glad to get to the fire upstairs. We locked the doors of the drawing rooms, a precaution which, I should observe, we had taken with all the rooms we had searched below. The bedroom my servant had selected for me was the best on the floor, a large one with two windows fronting the street. The four-posted bed, which took up no inconsiderable space, was opposite to the fire, which burnt clear and bright. A door in the wall to the left, between the bed and the window, communicated with the room which my servant appropriated to himself. This last was a small room with a sofa bed, and had no communication with the landing place, no other door but that which conducted to the bedroom I was to occupy. On either side of my fireplace was a cupboard, without locks, flush with the wall, and covered with the same dull brown paper. We examined these cupboards, only hooks to suspend female dresses, nothing else. We sounded the walls, evidently solid, the outer walls of the building. Having finished the survey of these apartments, warmed myself a few moments, and lighted my cigar, I then, still accompanied by F., went forth to complete my reconnoiter. In the landing place there was another door. It was closed firmly. Sir, said my servant in surprise, I unlocked this door with all the others when I first came. It cannot have got locked from the inside, for— Before he had finished his sentence, the door, which neither of us was then touching, opened quietly of itself. We looked at each other a single instant. The same thought seized both. Some human agency might be detected here. I rushed in first— my servant followed. A small, blank, dreary room without furniture. A few empty boxes and hampers in a corner. The small window. The shutters closed. Not even a fireplace. No other door but that by which we had entered. No carpet on the floor. And the floor seemed very old, uneven worm-eaten, mended here and there, as was shown by the whiter patches on the wood, but no living being and no visible place in which a living being could have hidden. As we stood gazing around, the door by which we had entered closed as quietly as it had before opened. We were imprisoned. For the first time I felt a creep of undefinable horror. Not so, my servant. Why, they don't think to trap us, sir. I could break that trumpery door with a kick of my foot. Try first, if it will open to your hand, said I, shaking off the vague apprehension that had seized me while I unclose the shutters and see what is without. I unbarred the shutters. The window looked on the little back yard I have before described. There was no ledge without, nothing to break the sheer descent of the wall. 
No man getting out of that window would have found any footing till he had fallen on the stones below. F, meanwhile, was vainly attempting to open the door. He now turned round to me and asked my permission to use force. And I should state here, in justice to the servant, that far from evincing any superstitious terrors, his nerve, composure, and even gaiety amid circumstances so extraordinary compelled my admiration and made me congratulate myself on having secured a companion in every way fitted to the occasion. I willingly gave him the permission he required. But though he was a remarkably strong man, his force was as idle as his milder efforts. The door did not even shake to his stoutest kick. Breathless and panting, he desisted. I then tried the door myself, equally in vain. As I ceased from the effort, again that creep of horror came over me, but this time it was more cold and stubborn. I felt as if some strange and ghastly exhalation were rising up from the chinks of that rugged floor and filling the atmosphere with a venomous influence hostile to human life. The door now very slowly and quietly opened as of its own accord. We precipitated ourselves into the landing place. We both saw a large, pale light, as large as the human figure, but shapeless and unsubstantial, move before us and ascend the stairs that led from the landing into the attic. I followed the light and my servant followed me. It entered to the right of the landing, a small garret, of which the door stood open. I entered in the same instant. The light then collapsed into a small globule, exceedingly brilliant and vivid, rested a moment on a bed in the corner, quivered, and vanished. We approached the bed and examined it. A half-tester, such as is commonly found in attics devoted to servants. On the drawers that stood near it, we perceived an old faded silk handkerchief, with the needle still left in a rent half-repaired. The kerchief was covered with dust. Probably it had belonged to the old woman who had last died in that house, and this might have been her sleeping room. I had sufficient curiosity to open the drawers. There were a few odds and ends of female dress, and two letters tied round with a narrow ribbon of faded yellow. I took the liberty to possess myself of the letters. We found nothing else in the room worth noticing, nor did the light reappear. But we distinctly heard, as we turned to go, a pattering footfall on the floor just before us. We went through the other attics, in all four, the footfall still preceding us, nothing to be seen, nothing but the footfall heard. I had the letters in my hand, just as I was descending the stairs, I distinctly felt my wrist seized, and a faint soft effort made to draw the letters from my clasp. I only held them the more tightly, and the effort ceased. We regained the bedchamber appropriated to myself, and I then remarked that my dog had not followed us when we had left it. He was thrusting himself close to the fire and trembling. 
I was impatient to examine the letters, and while I read them, my servant opened a little box in which he had deposited the weapons I had ordered him to bring, took them out, placed them on a table close at my bedhead, and he occupied himself in soothing the dog, who, however, seemed to heed him very little. The letters were short. They were dated, the dates, exactly thirty-five years ago. They were evidently from a lover to his mistress or a husband to some young wife. Not only the terms of expression, but a distinct reference to a former voyage indicated the writer to have been a seafarer. The spelling and handwriting were those of a man imperfectly educated, but still the language itself was forcible. In the expressions of endearment there was a kind of rough wild love, but here and there were dark unintelligible hints at some secret not of love, some secret that seemed of crime. We ought to love each other, was one of the sentences I remember. For how everyone else would execrate us if all was known. Again, don't let anyone be in the same room with you at night. You talk in your sleep. And again, what's done can't be undone. And I tell you there's nothing against us unless the dead could come to life. Here there was underlined in a better handwriting, a female's, They do! At the end of the letter, latest in date, the same female hand had written these words. Lost at sea the 4th of June, the same day as... I put down the letters and began to muse over their contents. Fearing, however, that the train of thought into which I fell might unsteady my nerves, I fully determined to keep my mind in a fit state to cope with whatever of marvelous the advancing night might bring forth. I roused myself laid the letters on the table, stirred up the fire, which was still bright and cheering, and opened my volume of Macaulay. I read quietly enough till about half-past eleven. I then threw myself dressed upon the bed and told my servant he might retire to his own room but must keep himself awake. I bade him leave open the door between the two rooms. Thus alone, I kept two candles burning on the table by my bedhead. I placed my watch beside the weapons and calmly resumed my Macaulay. Opposite to me, the fire burned clear, and on the hearth rug, seemingly asleep, lay the dog. In about twenty minutes, I felt an exceedingly cold air pass by my cheek like a sudden draught. I fancied the door to my right, communicating with the landing place, must have got open, but no, it was closed. I then turned my glance to my left and saw the flame of the candles violently swayed as by a wind. At the same moment, the watch beside the revolver softly slid from the table. Softly, softly. No visible hand. It was gone. I sprang up, seizing the revolver with one hand, the dagger with the other. I was not willing that my weapons should share the fate of the watch. Thus armed, I looked round the floor. No sign of the watch. Three slow, loud, distinct knocks were now heard at the bedhead. My servant called out, 
Is that you, sir? No. Be on your guard. The dog now roused himself and sat on his haunches, his ears moving quickly backward and forward. He kept his eyes fixed on me with a look so strange that he concentrated all my attention on himself. Slowly he rose up, all his hair bristling, and stood perfectly rigid and with the same wild stare. I had not time, however, to examine the dog. Presently my servant emerged from his room, and if ever I saw horror in the human face, it was then. I should not have recognized him had we met in the street, so altered was his every lineament. He passed me by quickly, saying in a whisper that seemed scarcely to come from his lips, Run, run, it is after me. He gained the door to the landing, pulled it open, and rushed forth. I followed him into the landing involuntarily, calling him to stop. But without heeding me, he bounded down the stairs, clinging to the balusters, and taking several steps at a time. I heard, where I stood, the street door open. Heard it again clap too. I was left alone in the haunted house. It was but for a moment that I remained undecided whether or not to follow my servant. Pride and curiosity alike forbade me so dastardly a flight. I re-entered my room, closing the door after me, and proceeded cautiously into the interior chamber. I encountered nothing to justify my servant's terror. I again carefully examined the walls to see if there were any concealed door. I could find no trace of one, not even a seam in the dull brown paper with which the room was hung. How, then, had the thing, whatever it was, which had so scared him, obtained ingress except through my own chamber? I returned to my room, shut and locked the door that opened upon the interior one, and stood on the hearth, expectant and prepared. I now perceived that the dog had slunk into an angle of the wall, and was pressing himself close against it, as if literally striving to force his way into it. I approached the animal and spoke to it. The poor brute was evidently beside itself with terror. It showed all its teeth, the slaver dropping from its jaws, and would certainly have bitten me if I had touched it. It did not seem to recognize me. Whoever has seen at the zoological gardens a rabbit, fascinated by a serpent, cowering in a corner, may form some idea of the anguish which the dog exhibited. Finding all efforts to soothe the animal in vain, and fearing that his bite might be as venomous in that state as in the madness of hydrophobia, I left him alone, placed my weapons on the table beside the fire, seated myself, and recommenced my Macaulay. I now became aware that something interposed between the page and the light. The page was overshadowed. I looked up, and I saw what I shall find it very difficult, perhaps impossible, to describe. It was a darkness shaping itself forth from the air in very undefined outline. I cannot say it was of a human form, and yet it had more resemblance to a human form, or rather shadow, than to anything else. As it stood, wholly apart and distinct from the air and the light around it, its dimensions seemed gigantic, 
the summit nearly touching the ceiling. While I gazed, a feeling of intense cold seized me. An iceberg before me could not more have chilled me, nor could the cold of an iceberg have been more purely physical. I feel convinced that it was not the cold caused by fear. As I continued to gaze, I thought, but this I cannot say with precision, that I distinguished two eyes looking down on me from the height. One moment I fancied that I distinguished them clearly, the next they seemed gone, but still two rays of a pale blue light frequently shot through the darkness as from the height on which I half-believed, half-doubted, that I had encountered the eyes. I strove to speak. My voice utterly failed me. I could only think to myself, Is this fear? It is not fear. I strove to rise in vain. I felt as if weighed down by an irresistible force. Indeed, my impression was that of an immense and overwhelming power opposed to my volition, that sense of utter inadequacy to cope with a force beyond man's, which one may feel physically in a storm at sea, in a conflagration, or when confronting some terrible wild beast, or rather perhaps the shark of an ocean. I felt morally. Opposed to my will was another will, as far superior to its strength as storm, fire, and shark are superior in material force to the force of man. And now, as this impression grew on me, now came at last horror, horror to a degree that no words can convey. Still I retained pride, if not courage, and in my own mind I said, This is horror, but it is not fear. Unless I fear, I cannot be harmed. My reason rejects this thing. It is an illusion. I do not fear. With a violent effort, I succeeded at last in stretching out my hand toward the weapon on the table. As I did so, on the arm and shoulder, I received a strange shock, and my arm fell to my side, powerless. And now, to add to my horror, the light began slowly to wane from the candles. They were not, as it were, extinguished, but their flame seemed very gradually withdrawn. It was the same with the fire. The light was extracted from the fuel. In a few minutes the room was in utter darkness. The dread that came over me to be thus in the dark with that dark thing whose power was so intensely felt brought a reaction of nerve. In fact, terror had reached that climax, that either my senses must have deserted me, or I must have burst through the spell. I did burst through it. I found voice, though the voice was a shriek. I remembered that I broke forth with words like these, I do not fear. My soul does not fear and at the same time I found strength to rise. Still in that profound gloom I rushed to one of the windows, tore aside the curtain, flung open the shutters. My first thought was light, and when I saw the moon high, clear, and calm, I felt a joy that almost compensated for the previous terror. There was the moon, there was also the light from the gas lamps in the deserted, slumberous street. I turned to look back into the room. The moon penetrated its shadow very palely and partially, but still there was light. 
the dark thing, whatever it might be, was gone, except that I could yet see a dim shadow, which seemed the shadow of that shade against the opposite wall. My eye now rested on the table, and from under the table, which was without cloth or cover, an old mahogany round table, there rose a hand, visible as far as the wrist. It was a hand seemingly as much of flesh and blood as my own, but the hand of an aged person, lean, wrinkled, small too, a woman's hand. That hand very softly closed on the two letters that lay on the table. The hand and letters both vanished. Then there came the same three loud, measured knocks I had heard at the bedhead before this extraordinary drama had commenced. As those sounds slowly ceased, I felt the whole room vibrate sensibly, and at the far end there rose, as from the floor, sparks or globules like bubbles of light, many-colored, green, yellow, fire-red, azure. Up and down, to and fro, hither, thither, as tiny will-o'-the-wisps, the sparks moved, slow or swift, each at its own caprice. The chair, as in the drawing-room below, was now advanced from the wall without apparent agency, and placed at the opposite side of the table. Suddenly, as forth from the chair, there grew a shape, a woman's shape. It was distinct as a shape of life, ghastly as a shape of death. The face was that of youth, with a strange mournful beauty. The throat and shoulders were bare, the rest of the form in a loose robe of cloudy white. It began sleeking its long yellow hair, which fell over its shoulders. Its eyes were not turned toward me, but to the door. It seemed listening, watching, waiting. The shadow of the shade in the background grew darker, and again I thought I beheld the eyes gleaming out from the summit of the shadow, eyes fixed upon that shape. As if from the door, though it did not open, there grew out another shape, equally distinct, equally ghastly, a man's shape, a young man's. It was in the dress of the last century, or rather in a likeness of such dress, for both the male shape and the female, though defined, were evidently unsubstantial, impalpable, simulacra, phantasms. And there was something incongruous, grotesque, yet fearful, in the contrast between the elaborate finery the courtly precision of that old-fashioned garb with its ruffles and lace and buckles, and the corpse-like stillness of the flitting wearer. Just as the male shape approached the female, the dark shadow started from the wall, all three for a moment wrapped in darkness. When the pale light returned, the two phantoms were as if in the grasp of the shadow that towered between them, and there was a blood stain on the breast of the female, and the phantom male was leaning on its phantom sword, and blood seemed trickling fast from the ruffles, from the lace, and the darkness of the intermediate shadow swallowed them up. They were gone and again the bubbles of light shot and sailed and undulated, growing thicker and thicker and more wildly confused in their movements. The closet door to the right of the fireplace now opened, and from the aperture there came forth the form of an aged woman, 
In her hand, she held letters, the very letters over which I had seen the hand close, and behind her I heard a footstep. She turned round as if to listen, and then she opened the letters and seemed to read, and over her shoulder I saw a livid face, the face as of a man long drowned, bloated, bleached, seaweed tangled in his dripping hair, and at her feet lay a form as of a corpse, and beside the corpse there cowered a child, a miserable, squalid child, with famine in its cheeks and fear in its eyes. And as I looked in the old woman's face, the wrinkles and lines vanished, and it became a face of youth, hard-eyed, stony, but still youth. And the shadow darted forth and darkened over those phantoms as it had darkened over the last. Nothing now was left but the shadow, and on that my eyes were intently fixed, till again eyes grew out of the shadow, malignant serpent eyes, and the bubbles of light again rose and fell, and in their disordered, irregular, turbulent maze mingled with the wan moonlight. And now from these globules themselves, as from the shell of an egg monstrous things burst out. The air grew filled with them, larvae so bloodless and so hideous that I can in no way describe them, except to remind the reader of the swarming life which the solar microscope brings before his eyes in a drop of water, things transparent, supple, agile, chasing each other, devouring each other, forms like not ever beheld by the naked eye. As the shapes were without symmetry, so their movements were without order. In their very vagrancies there was no sport. They came round me and round, thicker and faster and swifter, swarming over my head, crawling over my right arm, which was outstretched in involuntary command against all evil beings. Sometimes I felt myself touched, but not by them. Invisible hands touched me. Once I felt the clutch as of cold, soft fingers at my throat. I was still equally conscious that if I gave way to fear, I should be in bodily peril and I concentrated all my faculties in the single focus of resisting stubborn will. And I turned my sight from the shadow, above all from those strange serpent eyes, eyes that had now become distinctly visible. For there, though in naught else around me, I was aware that there was a will and a will of intense, creative, working evil, which might crush down my own. The pale atmosphere in the room began now to redden, as if in the air of some near conflagration. The larvae grew lurid as things that live in fire. Again the moon vibrated. Again there were heard the three measured knocks, and again all things were swallowed up in the darkness of the dark shadow, as if out of that darkness all had come, into that darkness all returned. As the gloom receded, the shadow was wholly gone. Slowly, as it had been withdrawn, the flame grew again into the candles on the table, again into the fuel in the grate. The whole room came once more calmly, healthfully into sight. The two doors were still closed, the door communicating with the servant's room still locked. In the corner of the wall, into which he had so convulsively niched himself, lay the dog. I called to him. No movement. I approached. 
the animal was dead. His eyes protruded, his tongue out of his mouth. The froth gathered round his jaws. I took him in my arms. I brought him to the fire. I felt acute grief for the loss of my poor favorite. Acute self-reproach. I accused myself of his death. I imagined he had died of fright. But what was my surprise on finding that his neck was actually broken? Had this been done in the dark? Must it not have been by a hand human as mine? Must there not have been a human agency all the while in that room? Good cause to suspect it. I cannot tell. I cannot do more than state the fact fairly. The reader may draw his own inference. Another surprising circumstance my watch was restored to the table from which it had been so mysteriously withdrawn. But it had stopped at the very moment it was so withdrawn. Nor, despite all the skill of the watchmaker, has it ever gone since. That is, it will go in a strange, erratic way for a few hours and then come to a dead stop. It is worthless. Nothing more chanced for the rest of the night. Nor, indeed, had I long to wait before the dawn broke. Nor till it was broad daylight did I quit the haunted house. Before I did so, I revisited the little blind room in which my servant and myself had been for a time imprisoned. I had a strong impression, for which I could not account that from that room had originated the mechanism of the phenomena, if I may use the term, which had been experienced in my chamber. And though I entered it now in the clear day, with the sun peering through the filmy window, I still felt, as I stood on its floors, the creep of the horror which I had first there experienced the night before and which had been so aggravated by what had passed in my own chamber. I could not, indeed, bear to stay more than half a minute within those walls. I descended the stairs, and again I heard the footfall before me. And when I opened the street door, I thought I could distinguish a very low laugh. I gained my own house, expecting to find my runaway servant there. But he had not presented himself, nor did I hear more of him for three days, when I received a letter from him, dated from Liverpool, to this effect. Honored sir, I humbly entreat your pardon, though I can scarcely hope that you will think that I deserve it, unless, which heaven forbid, you saw what I did. I feel that it will be years before I can recover myself, and as to being fit for service, it is out of the question. I am therefore going to my brother-in-law at Melbourne. The ship sails tomorrow. Perhaps the long voyage may set me up. I do nothing now but start and tremble and fancy it is behind me. I humbly beg you, honored sir, to order my clothes and whatever wages are due to me to be sent to my mother's at Walworth. John knows her address. The letter ended with additional apologies, somewhat incoherent, and explanatory details as to effects that had been under the writer's charge. This flight may perhaps warrant a suspicion that the man wished to go to Australia and had been somehow or other fraudulently mixed up with the events of the night. I say nothing in refutation of that conjecture. Rather, I suggest it as one that would seem to many persons the most probable solution of improbable occurrences. 
My belief in my own theory remained unshaken. I returned in the evening to the house to bring away in a hack cab the things I had left there with my poor dog's body. In this task I was not disturbed, nor did any incident worth note befall me, except that still, on ascending and descending the stairs, I heard the same footfall in advance. On leaving the house, I went to Mr. J.'s. He was at home. I returned him the keys, told him that my curiosity was sufficiently gratified, and was about to relate quickly what had passed, when he stopped me and said, though with much politeness, that he had no longer any interest in a mystery which none had ever solved. I determined at least to tell him of the two letters I had read, as well as of the extraordinary manner in which they had disappeared, and I then inquired if he thought they had been addressed to the woman who had died in the house, and if there were anything in her early history which could possibly confirm the dark suspicions to which the letters gave rise. Mr. J. seemed startled, and after musing a few moments answered, I am but little acquainted with the woman's earlier history, except, as I before told you, that her family were known to mine. But you revive some vague reminiscences to her prejudice. I will make inquiries and inform you of their result. Still, even if we could admit the popular superstition that a person who had been either the perpetrator or the victim of dark crimes in life could revisit, as a restless spirit, the scene in which those crimes had been committed, I should observe that the house was infested by strange sights and sounds before the old woman died. You smile. What would you say? I would say this, that I am convinced, if we could get to the bottom of these mysteries, we should find a living human agency. What? You believe it is all an imposture? For what object? Not an imposture in the ordinary sense of the word. If suddenly I were to sink into a deep sleep, from which you could not awake me, but in that sleep could answer questions with an accuracy which I could not pretend to when awake, tell you what money you had in your pocket, nay, describe your very thoughts. It is not necessarily an imposture any more than it is necessarily supernatural. I should be, unconsciously to myself, under a mesmeric influence, conveyed to me from a distance by a human being who had acquired power over me by previous rapport. But if a mesmerizer could so affect another living being— can you suppose that a mesmerizer could also affect inanimate objects, move chairs, open and shut doors, or impress our senses with the belief in such effects? We never have been en rapport with a person acting on us. No. What is commonly called mesmerism could not do this, but there may be a power akin to mesmerism and superior to it, the power that in the old days was called magic. That such a power may extend to all inanimate objects of matter, I do not say. But if so, it would not be against nature. It would only be a rare power in nature, which might be given to constitutions with certain peculiarities, and cultivated by practice to an extraordinary degree. That such a power might extend over the dead, 
that is, over certain thoughts and memories that the dead may still retain, and compel, not that which ought properly to be called the soul, and which is far beyond human reach, but rather a phantom of what has been most earth-stained on earth to make itself apparent to our senses. It is a very ancient, though obsolete, theory, upon which I will hazard no opinion. But I do not conceive the power to be supernatural. Let me illustrate what I mean from an experiment which Paracelsus describes as not difficult, and which the author of the Curiosities of Literature cites as credible. A flower perishes, you burn it. Whatever were the elements of that flower while it lived are gone, dispersed, you know not whither. You can never discover nor recollect them. But you can, by chemistry, out of the burned dust of that flower, raise a spectrum of the flower, just as it seemed in life. It may be the same with the human being. The soul has as much escaped you as the essence or elements of the flower. Still, you may make a spectrum of it, and this phantom, though in the popular superstition it is held to be the soul of the departed, must not be confounded with the true soul. It is but the idolon of the dead form. Hence, like the best attested stories of ghosts or spirits, the thing that most strikes us is the absence of what we hold to be the soul, that is, of superior emancipated intelligence. These apparitions come for little or no object. They seldom speak when they do come. If they speak, they utter no ideas above those of an ordinary person on earth. Wonderful, therefore, as such phenomena may be, granting them to be truthful, I see much that philosophy may question, nothing that it is incumbent on philosophy to deny, viz. nothing supernatural. They are but ideas conveyed somehow or another, we have not yet discovered the means, from one mortal brain to another. Whether, in so doing, tables walk by their own accord, or fiend-like shapes appear in a magic circle, or bodiless hands rise and remove material objects, or a thing of darkness, such as presented itself to me, frees our blood, still am I persuaded that these are but agencies conveyed, as by electric wires, to my own brain from the brain of another. In some constitutions there is a natural chemistry, and those constitutions may produce chemic wonders. In others a natural fluid, call it electricity, and these may produce electric wonders. But the wonders differ from natural science in this. They are alike objectless, purposeless, puerile, frivolous. They lead on to no grand results, and therefore the world does not heed, and true sages have not cultivated them. But sure I am that of all I saw or heard, a man, human as myself, was the remote originator and I believe unconsciously to himself as to the exact effects produced, for this reason. No two persons, you say, have ever experienced exactly the same thing. Well, observe, no two persons ever experience exactly the same dream. If this were an ordinary imposture, the machinery would be arranged for results that would but little vary. 
if it were a supernatural agency permitted by the Almighty, it would surely be for some definite end. These phenomena belong to neither class. My persuasion is that they originate in some brain now far distant, that that brain had no distinct volition in anything that occurred, that what does occur reflects but its devious, motley, ever-shifting, half-formed thoughts. In short, that it has been but the dreams of such a brain put in action and invested with a semi-substance, that this brain is of immense power, that it can set matter into movement, that it is malignant and destructive, I believe. Some material force must have killed my dog. The same force might, for aught I know, have sufficed to kill myself had I been as subjugated by terror as the dog, had my intellect or my spirit given me no countervailing resistance in my will. It killed your dog? That is fearful. Indeed, it is strange that no animal can be induced to stay in that house, not even a cat. Rats and mice are never found in it. The instincts of the brute creation detect influences deadly to their existence. Man's reason has a sense less subtle, because it has a resisting power more supreme. But enough. Do you comprehend my theory? Yes, though imperfectly, and I accept any crotchet, pardon the word, however odd, rather than embrace at once the notion of ghosts and hobgoblins we imbibed in our nurseries. Still, to my unfortunate house the evil is the same. What on earth can I do with the house? I will tell you what I would do. I am convinced from my own internal feelings that the small unfurnished room— at right angles to the door of the bedroom which I occupied, forms a starting point or receptacle for the influences which haunt the house. And I strongly advise you to have the walls opened, the floor removed, nay, the, the whole room pulled down. I observe that it is detached from the body of the house, built over the small backyard, and could be removed without injury to the rest of the building. And you think, if I did that, you would cut off the telegraph wires. Try it. I am so persuaded that I am right, that I will pay half the expense if you will allow me to direct the operations. Nay, I am well able to afford the cost. For the rest, allow me to write to you. About ten days after, I received a letter from Mr. J., telling me that he had visited the house since I had seen him, that he had found the two letters I had described replaced in the drawer from which I had taken them, that he had read them with misgivings like my own that he had instituted a cautious inquiry about the woman to whom I rightly conjectured they had been written. It seemed that thirty-six years ago, a year before the date of the letters, she had married, against the wish of her relations, an American of very suspicious character. In fact, he was generally believed to have been a pirate. She herself was the daughter of very respectable tradespeople, and had served in the capacity of a nursery governess before her marriage. She had a brother, a widower, who was considered wealthy, and who had one child of about six years old. A month after the marriage, the body of this brother was found in the Thames near London Bridge. There seemed some marks of violence about his throat, 
but they were not deemed sufficient to warn the inquest in any other verdict than that of found drowned. The American and his wife took charge of the little boy, the deceased brother, having by his will left his sister the guardianship of his only child, and in the event of the child's death the sister inherited. The child died about six months afterward. It was supposed to have been neglected and ill-treated. The neighbors deposed to having heard it shriek at night. The surgeon who had examined it after death said that it was emaciated as if from want of nourishment, and the body was covered with livid bruises. It seemed that one winter night the child had sought to escape, crept out into the back yard, tried to scale the wall, fallen back exhausted, and had been found at morning on the stones in a dying state. But though there was some evidence of cruelty, there was none of murder and the aunt and her husband had sought to palliate cruelty by alleging the exceeding stubbornness and perversity of the child who was declared to be half-witted. Be that as it may, at the orphan's death the aunt inherited her brother's fortune. Before the first wedded year was out, the American quitted England abruptly and never returned to it. He obtained a cruising vessel, which was lost in the Atlantic two years afterward. The widow was left in affluence, but reverses of various kinds had befallen her. A bank broke, an investment failed. She went into a small business and became insolvent, and she entered into service, sinking lower and lower from housekeeper down to maid of all work, never long retaining a place, though nothing decided against her character was ever alleged. She was considered sober, honest, and peculiarly quiet in her ways. Still, nothing prospered with her, and so she had dropped into the workhouse from which Mr. J. had taken her, to be placed in charge of the very house which she had rented as mistress in the first year of her wedded life. Mr. J. added that he had passed an hour alone in the unfurnished room which I had urged him to destroy, and that his impressions of dread while there were so great, though he had neither heard nor seen anything, that he was eager to have the walls bared and the floors removed, as I had suggested. He had engaged persons for the work, and would commence any day I would name. The day was accordingly fixed. I repaired to the haunted house. We went into the blind dreary room, took up the skirting, and then the floors. Under the rafters, covered with rubbish, was found a trap-door, quite large enough to admit a man. It was closely nailed down with clamps and rivets of iron. On removing these, we descended into a room below, the existence of which had never been suspected. In this room there had been a window and a flue, but they had been bricked over, evidently, for many years. By the help of candles we examined this place. It still retained some mouldering furniture, three chairs, an oak settle, a table, all of the fashion of about eighty years ago. There was a chest of drawers against the wall, in which we found, half rotted away, old-fashioned articles of a man's dress, such as might have been worn eighty or a hundred years ago by a gentleman of some rank, costly steel buttons and buckles, like those yet worn in court dresses, a handsome court sword, 
in a waistcoat which had once been rich with gold lace, but was now blackened and foul with damp. We found five guineas, a few silver coins, and an ivory ticket, probably for some place of entertainment long since passed away. But our main discovery was in a kind of iron safe fixed to the wall, the lock of which it cost us much trouble to get picked. In this safe were three shelves and two small drawers. Ranged on the shelves were several small bottles of crystal, hermetically stoppered. They contained colorless volatile essences, of the nature of which I shall only say that they were not poisonous. Phosphor and ammonia entered into some of them. There were also some very curious glass tubes and a small pointed rod of iron with a large lump of rock crystal and another of amber, also a lodestone of great power. In one of the drawers we found a miniature portrait set in gold, and retaining the freshness of its colors most remarkably, considering the length of time it had probably been there. The portrait was that of a man who might be somewhat advanced in middle life, perhaps forty-seven or forty-eight. It was a remarkable face, a most impressive face. If you could fancy some mighty serpent transformed into a man, preserving in the human lineaments the old serpent type, you would have a better idea of that countenance than long descriptions can convey. The width and flatness of frontal, the tapering elegance of contour disguising the strength of a deadly jaw, the long, large, terrible eye glittering and green as the emerald, and withal a certain ruthless calm as if from the consciousness of an immense power. Mechanically, I turned round the miniature to examine the back of it, and on the back was engraved a pentacle. In the middle of the pentacle, a ladder, and the third step of the ladder was formed by the date 1765. Examining still more minutely, I detected a spring. This, on being pressed, opened the back of the miniature as a lid. With inside the lid was engraved, Mariana to thee, be faithful in life and in death, to blank. Here follows a name that I will not mention, but it was not unfamiliar to me. I had heard it spoken of by old men in my childhood as the name borne by a dazzling charlatan who had made a great sensation in London for a year or so, and had fled the country on the charge of a double murder within his own house, that of his mistress and his rival. I said nothing of this to Mr. J., to whom reluctantly I resigned the miniature. We had found no difficulty in opening the first drawer within the iron safe. We found great difficulty in opening the second. It was not locked, but it resisted all efforts, till we inserted in the chinks the edge of a chisel. When we had thus drawn it forth, we found a very singular apparatus in the nicest order. Upon a small thin book, or rather tablet, was placed a saucer of crystal. This saucer was filled with a clear liquid. On that liquid floated a kind of compass, with a needle shifting rapidly round but instead of the usual points of the compass were seven strange characters, not very unlike those used by astrologers to denote the planets. 
A peculiar but not strong nor displeasing odor came from this drawer, which was lined with a wood that we afterward discovered to be hazel. Whatever the cause of this odor, it produced a material effect on the nerves. We all felt it. Even the two workmen who were in the room, a creeping, tingling sensation from the tips of the fingers to the roots of the hair. Impatient to examine the tablet, I removed the saucer. As I did so, the needle of the compass went round and round with exceeding swiftness, and I felt a shock that ran through my whole frame, so that I dropped the saucer on the floor. The liquid was spilled, the saucer was broken. The compass rolled to the end of the room, and at that instant the walls shook to and fro as if a giant had swayed and rocked them. The two workmen were so frightened that they ran up the ladder by which we had descended from the trap door, but seeing that nothing more happened, they were easily induced to return. Meanwhile, I had opened the tablet. It was bound in plain red leather with a silver clasp. It contained but one sheet of thick vellum, and on that sheet were inscribed, within a double pentacle, words in old monkish Latin, which are literally to be translated thus. On all that it can reach within these walls, sentient or inanimate, living or dead, as moves the needle, so work my will. Accursed be the house, and restless be the dwellers therein. We found no more. Mr. J burned the tablet and its anathema. He raised to the foundations the part of the building containing the secret room with the chamber over it. He had then the courage to inhabit the house himself for a month, and a quieter, better-conditioned house could not be found in all London. Subsequently, he led it to advantage, and his tenant has made no complaints by A. T. Quiller Couch. The Roll Call of the Reef. Yes, sir, said my host the quarryman, reaching down the relics from their hook in the wall over the chimney piece. They've hung there all my time, and most of my father's. The woman won't touch em. They're afraid of the story. So here they'll dangle and gather dust and smoke till another tenant comes and tosses them out of doors for rubbish. Phew! Tis coarse weather, surely. He went to the door, opened it, and stood studying the gale that beat upon his cottage front, straight from the manacle reef. The rain drove past him into the kitchen a slant like threads of gold silk in the shine of the wreckwood fire. Meanwhile, by the same firelight, I examined the relics on my knee. The metal of each was tarnished out of knowledge, but the trumpet was evidently an old cavalry trumpet, and the threads of its party-colored sling, though fretted and dusty, still hung together. Around the side drum, beneath its cracked brown varnish, I could hardly trace a royal coat of arms and a legend running, Per mare per teram, the motto of the Marines. Its parchment, though black and scented with wood smoke, was limp and mildewed, and I began to tighten up the straps under which the drumsticks had been loosely thrust with the idle purpose of seeing if some music might be got out of the old drum yet. But as I turned it on my knee, I found the drum attached to the trumpet sling by a curious barrel-shaped padlock, and paused to examine this. 
The body of the lock was composed of half a dozen brass rings, set accurately edge to edge, and rubbing the brass with my thumb, I saw that each of the six had a series of letters engraved around it. I knew the trick of it, I thought. Here was one of those word padlocks, once so common, only to be opened by getting the rings to spell a certain word which the dealer confides to you. My host shut and barred the door and came back to the hearth. "'Twas just such a wind, east by south, that brought in what you've got between your hands. Back in the year nine it was. My father has told me the tale a score of times. You're twisting round the rings, I see, but you'll never guess the word. Parson Kendall, he made the word, and he locked down a couple of ghosts in their graves with it, and when his time came, he went to his own grave and took the word with him. Whose ghosts, Matthew? You want the story, I see, sir. My father could tell it better than I can. He was a young man in the year nine, unmarried at the time, and living in this very cottage, just as I be. That's how he came to get mixed up with the tale. He took a chair, lighted a short pipe, and went on, with his eyes fixed on the dancing violet flames. Yes, he had been about thirty year old in January 189. The storm got up in the night of the 21st of that month. My father was dressed and out long before daylight. He never was one to bide in bed, let be that the gale by this time was pretty near lifting the thatch over his head. Besides which, he'd fenced a small tatty patch that winter down by Lowland Point, and he wanted to see if it stood the night's work. He took the path across Gunner's Meadow, where they buried most of the bodies afterward. The wind was right in his teeth at the time, and once on the way, he's told me this often, a great strip of oarweed came flying through the darkness and fetched him a slap on the cheek like a cold hand. He made shift pretty well till he got to Lowland, and then had to drop upon hands and knees and crawl, digging his fingers every now and then into a shingle to hold on, for he declared to me that the stones, some of them as big as a man's head, kept rolling and driving past till it seemed the whole foreshore was moving westward under him. The fence was gone, of course, not a stick left to show where it stood, so that when first he came to the place, he thought he must have missed his bearings. My father, sir, was a very religious man, and if he reckoned the end of the world was at hand, there in the great wind and night, among the moving stones, you may believe he was certain of it when he heard a gun fired, and with the same saw a flame shoot up out of the darkness to windward, making a sudden fierce light in all the place about. All he could find to think or say was, The second coming! The second coming! The bridegroom cometh, and the wicked he will toss like a ball into a large country. And being already upon his knees, he just bowed his head and bided, saying this over and over. But by and by, between two squalls, he made bold to lift his head and look, and then by the light, bluish color twas, he saw all the coast clear away to Manacle Point, and off the manacles in the thick of the weather, a sloop of war with top gallants housed, driving stern foremost toward the reef. It was she, of course, that was burning the fire. 
My father could see the white streak and the ports of her quite plain as she rose to it, a little outside the breakers, and he guessed easy enough that her captain had just managed to wear ship and was trying to force her nose to the sea with the help of her small bower anchor and the scrap or two of canvas that hadn't yet been blown out of her. But while he looked, she fell off, giving her broadside to it, foot by foot, and drifting back on the breakers around Carn Dew and the Varses. The rocks lie so thick thereabout that twas a toss-up which she struck first. At any rate, my father couldn't tell at the time, for just then the flare died down and went out. Well, sir, he turned then in the dark and started back for Kovrak to cry the dismal tidings, though well knowing ship and crew to be past any hope. And as he turned, the wind lifted him and tossed him forward like a ball, as he'd been saying, and homeward along the foreshore. As you know, tis ugly work, even by daylight, picking your way among the stones there, and my father was prettily knocked about at first in the dark. But by this twas nearer seven than six o'clock, and the day spreading. By the time he reached North Corner, a man could see to read print. Howsoever, he looked neither out to sea nor toward Kovrak, but headed straight for the first cottage, the same that stands above North Corner today. A man named Billy Ede lived there then, and when my father burst into the kitchen bawling, wreck, wreck, he saw Billy Ede's wife, Anne, standing there in her clogs with a shawl over her head and her clothes wringing wet. Save the chap, says Billy Ede's wife, Anne. What do you mean by crying stale fish at that rate? But tis a wreck, I tell ye. I've a zedin too, so has every one with an eye in his head. And with that, she pointed straight over my father's shoulder, and he turned, there, close under Dolor Point, at the end of Kovrak Town, he saw another wreck washing, and the point black with people, like emmets, running to and fro in the morning light. While he stood staring at her, he heard a trumpet sounded on board. The notes coming in little jerks, like a bird rising against the wind, but faintly, of course, because of the distance and the gale blowing, though this had dropped a little. She's a transport, said Billy Ede's wife, Anne, and full of horse soldiers, fine long men. When she struck, they must have pitched the horses over first to lighten the ship for a score of dead horses had washed in afore I left half an hour back, and three or four soldiers, too, fine long corpses and white breeches and jackets of blue and gold. I held the lantern to one, such a straight young man. My father asked her about the trumpeting. That's the queerest bit of all. She was burning a light when me and my man joined the crowd down there. All her masts had gone. Whether they carried away or were cut away to ease her, I don't rightly know. Her keelson was broke under her, and her bottom sagged and stove, and she had just settled down like a setting hen, just the leastest list to starboard but a man could stand there easy. They had rigged up ropes across her, from bulwark to bulwark, and beside these the men were mustered, holding on like grim death wherever the sea made a clean breach over them, and standing up like heroes as soon as it passed. The captain and the officers were clinging to the rail of the quarter-deck, 
all in their gold uniforms, waiting for the end as if twas King George they expected. There was no way to help, for she lay right beyond cast of line, though our folk tried it fifty times. And beside them clung a trumpeter, a whacking big man. And between the heavy seas he would lift his trumpet with one hand and blow a call. And every time he blew, the men gave a cheer. There, she says, hark ye now, there he goes again. But you won't hear no cheering any more, for few are left to cheer, and their voice is weak. Bitter cold the wind is, and I reckon it numbs their grip of the ropes, for they were dropping off fast with every sea when my man sent me home to get his breakfast. Another wreck, you say? Well, there's no hope for the tender deers, if tis the manacles. You better run down and help yonder, though tis little help any man can give. Not one came in alive while I was there. The tides flow in, and she won't hold together another hour, they say. Well, sure enough, the end was coming fast when my father got down to the point. Six men had been cast up alive, or just breathing, a seaman and five troopers. The seaman was the only one that had breath to speak and while they were carrying him into the town, the word went round that the ship's name was the Despatch, transport, homeward bound from Karuna, with a detachment of the Seventh Hussars that had been fighting out there with Sir John Moore. The seas had rolled her further over by this time, and given her decks a pretty sharp slope, but a dozen men still held on. Seven by the ropes near the ship's waist, a couple near the break of the poop, and three on the quarter deck. Of these three, my father made out one to be the skipper. Close to him clung an officer in full regimentals. His name they heard after was Captain Duncanfield. And last came the tall trumpeter, and if you'll believe me, the fellow was making shift there, to the very last, to blow God save the king. What's more, he got to send us victorious before an extra big sea came bursting across and washed them off the deck, every man but one of the pair beneath the poop, and he dropped his hold before the next wave, being stunned, I reckon. The others went out of sight at once, but the trumpeter, being, as I said, a powerful man as well as a tough swimmer, rose like a duck, rode out a couple of breakers, and came in on the crest of the third. The folks looked to see him broke like an egg at their very feet, but when the smother cleared, there he was lying face downward on a ledge below them. And one of the men that happened to have a rope round him, I forgot the fellow's name, if I ever heard it, jumped down and grabbed him by the ankle as he began to slip back. Before the next big sea, the pair were hauled high enough to be out of harm, and another heave brought them up to grass. Quick work? but Master Trumpeter wasn't quite dead, nothing worse than a cracked head and three staved ribs. In twenty minutes or so, they had him in bed with the doctor to tend him. Now was the time, nothing being left alive upon the transport, for my father to tell of the sloop he'd seen driving upon the manacles. And when he got a hearing, though the most were set upon salvage, and believed a wreck in the hand, so to say, to be worth half a dozen they couldn't see, a good few volunteered to start off with him and have a look. They crossed Lowland Point, no ship to be seen on the manacles nor anywhere upon the sea. 
One or two was calling my father a liar. Wait till we come to Dean Point, said he. Sure enough, on the far side of Dean Point, they found the sloop's mainmast washing about with half a dozen men lashed to it, men in red jackets, every mother's son drowned and staring. And a little further on, just under the Dean, three or four bodies cast up on the shore, one of them a small drummer boy, side drum and all. And nearby, part of the ship's gig with HMS Primrose cut on the sternboard. From this point on the shore was littered thick with wreckage and dead bodies, the most of them Marines in uniform, and in Godrevy Cove in particular, a heap of furniture from the captain's cabin, and among it a watertight box not much damaged, and full of papers by which, when it came to be examined next day, the wreck was easily made out to be the primrose of eighteen guns, outward bound from Portsmouth, with a fleet of transports for the Spanish War. Thirty sail I've heard, but I've never heard what became of them." Being handled by merchant skippers, no doubt they rode out the gale, and reached the Tagus safe and sound. Not but what the captain of the Primrose, Maine was his name, did quite right to try and club-haul his vessel when he found himself under the land. Only he never ought to have got there if he took proper soundings, but it's easy talking. The Primrose, sir, was a handsome vessel. For her size, one of the handsomest in the King's service, and newly fitted out at Plymouth Dock. So the boys had brave pickings from her in the way of brasswork, ships, instruments, and the like, let alone some barrels of stores not much spoiled. They loaded themselves with as much as they could carry, and started for home, meaning to make a second journey before the preventive men got wind of their doings and came to spoil the fun. Hello, says my father, and dropped his gear. I do believe there's a leg moving. And running for, he stooped over the small drummer boy that I told you about. The poor little chap was lying there, with his face a mass of bruises, and his eyes closed. But he had shifted one leg an inch or two, and was still breathing. So my father pulled out a knife, and cut him free from his drum. That was lashed on to him with a double turn of manila rope, and took him up and carried him along here to this very room that we're sitting in. He lost a good deal by this, for when he went back to fetch the bundle he'd dropped, the preventive men had got hold of it, and were thick as thieves along the foreshore. So that t'was only by paying one or two to look the other way that he picked up anything worth carrying off, which you'll allow to be hard, seeing that he was the first man to give news of the wreck. Well, the inquiry was held, of course, and my father gave evidence, and for the rest they had to trust to the sloop's papers, for not a soul was saved besides the drummer boy, and he was raving in a fever, brought on by the cold and the fright. And the seamen and the five troopers gave evidence about the loss of the despatch. The tall trumpeter, too, whose ribs were healing, came forward and kissed the book but somehow his head had been hurt in coming ashore, and he talked foolish-like, and t'was easy seen he would never be a proper man again. The others were taken up to Plymouth, and so went their ways, but the trumpeter stayed on in Covrack, and King George, finding he was fit for nothing, sent him down a trifle of a pension after a while, enough to keep him in board and lodging with a bit of tobacco over.
Now the first time that this man, William Talifer, he called himself, met with the drummer boy, was about a fortnight after the little chap had bettered enough to be allowed a short walk out of doors, which he took, if you please, in full regimentals. There never was a soldier so proud of his dress. His own suit had shrunk a brave bit with the salt water, but into ordinary frock and corduroy he declared he would not get not if he had to go naked the rest of his life. So my father, being a good-natured man and handy with the needle, turned to and repaired damages with a piece or two of scarlet cloth cut from the jacket of one of the drowned marines. Well, the poor little chap chanced to be standing in this rig-out down by the gate of Gunner's Meadow, where they had buried two score and over of his comrades. The morning was a fine one, early in March month, and along came the cracked trumpeter, likewise taking a stroll. Hello, says he. Good morning. And what might you be doing here? I was a wishin', says the boy. I had a pair of drumsticks. Our lads were buried yonder without so much as a drum tapped or a musket fired, and that's not Christian burial for British soldiers. What? says the trumpeter, and spat on the ground. A parcel of marines. The boy eyed him a second or so, and answered up. If I had a tav a turf handy, I'd bung it at your mouth, you greasy cavalryman, and learn you to speak respectful of your betters. The Marines are the handiest body of men in the service. The trumpeter looked down on him from the height of six foot two and asked, Did they die well? They died very well. There was a lot of running to and fro at first, and some of the men began to cry and a few to strip off their clothes. But when the ship fell off for the last time, Captain Maine turned and said something to Major Griffiths, the commanding officer on board, and the Major called out to me to beat to quarters. It might have been for a wedding, he sang it so cheerful. We'd had word already that twas to be parade order and the men fell in as trim and decent as if they were going to church. One or two even tried to shave at the last moment. The major wore his medals. One of the seamen, seeing I had work to keep the drum steady, the sling being a bit loose for me and the wind what you remember, lashed it tight with a piece of rope, and that saved my life afterward a drum being as good as cork until it stove. I kept beating away until every man was on deck. And then the Major formed them up and told them to die like British soldiers, and the chaplain was in the middle of a prayer when she struck. In ten minutes she was gone. That was how they died, cavalrymen. And that was very well done, drummer of the Marines. What's your name? John Christian. Mine's William George Talifer, trumpeter of the Seventh Light Dragoons, the Queen's Own. I played God Save the King while our men were drowning. Captain Duncanfield told me to sound a call or two to put them in heart. But that matter of God save the king was a notion of my own. I won't say to hurt the feelings of a marine, even if he's not much over five foot tall, but the queen's own hussars is a tearin' fine regiment. As between horse and foot, tis a question of which gets a chance. All the way from Sahugan to Karuna, twas we that took and gave the knocks at Mayorga and Rueda and Beneventi. The reason, sir, I can speak the name so pat 
is that my father learned them by heart afterward from the trumpeter, who was always talking about Mayorga and Rueda and Beneventi. We made the rear guard after General Paget, and drove the French every time and all the infantry did was to sit about in wine shops till we whipped em out and steal and straggle and play the tomfool in general and when it came to a stand-up fight at Karuna, twas we that had to stay seasick aboard the transports and watch the infantry in the thick of the caper very well they behaved too especially the fourth regiment and the forty-second Highlanders, and the dirty half-hundred. Oh, ay, they're decent regiments, all three. But the Queen's own Hussars is a tearin' fine regiment. So you played on your drum when the ship was going down? Drummer John Christian, I'll have to get you a new pair of sticks. The very next day the trumpeter marched into Helston, and got a carpenter there to turn him a pair of boxwood drumsticks for the boy. And this was the beginning of one of the most curious friendships you ever heard tell of. Nothing delighted the pair more than to borrow a boat off my father and pull out to the rocks where the primrose and the despatch had struck and sunk. And on still days, "'Twas pretty to hear them out there off the manacles, "'the drummer playing his tattoo, "'for they always took their music with them, "'and the trumpeter practicing calls "'and making his trumpet speak like an angel. "'But if the weather turned roughish, "'they'd be walking together and talking. "'Leastwise the youngster listened "'while the other discoursed about Sir John's campaign "'in Spain and Portugal, "'telling how each little skirmish befell, "'and of Sir John himself and General Baird "'and General Paget and Colonel Vivian, "'his own commanding officer, "'and what kind of men they were, "'and of the last bloody stand-up at Karuna and so forth as if neither could have enough. But all this had to come to an end in the late summer, for the boy, John Christian, being now well and strong again, must go up to Plymouth to report himself. T'was his own wish, for I believe King George had forgotten all about him, but his friend wouldn't hold him back. As for the trumpeter, my father had made an arrangement to take him on as lodger, as soon as the boy left. And on the morning fixed for the start, he was up at the door here by five o'clock, with his trumpet slung by his side, and all the rest of his belongings in a small valise. A Monday morning it was, and after breakfast he had fixed to walk with the boy some way on the road toward Helston, where the coach started. My father left them at breakfast together and went out to meet the pig and do a few odd morning jobs of that sort. When he came back, the boy was still at table, and the trumpeter sat with the rings in his hands hitched together just as they be at this moment. Look at this, he says to my father, showing him the lock. I picked it up off a starving brass worker in Lisbon, and it is not one of your common locks that one word of six letters will open at a time. There's genius in this lock, for you've only to make the ring spell any six-letter word you please and snap down the lock upon that, and never a soul can open it, not the maker even, until somebody comes along that knows the word you snapped it on. Now Johnny here's going— and he leaves his drum behind him, for though he can make pretty music on it, the parchment sags in wet weather by reason of the sea water getting at it. And if he carries it to Plymouth, they'll only condemn it and give him another. And as for me, I shan't have the heart to put lip to the trumpet any more when Johnny's gone. 
So we've chosen a word together and locked em together upon that. And by your leave, I'll hang em here together on the hook over your fireplace. Maybe Johnny'll come back, maybe not. Maybe, if he comes, I'll be dead and gone, and he'll take em apart and try their music for old sake's sake. But if he never comes, nobody can separate em for nobody beside knows the word. And if you marry and have sons, you can tell them that here are tied together the souls of Johnny Christian, drummer of the Marines, and William George Talifer, once trumpeter of the Queen's own hussars. Amen. With that, he hung the two instruments upon the hook there, the boy stood up and thanked my father and shook hands, and the pair went out of the door toward Helston. Somewhere on the road they took leave of one another, but nobody saw the parting nor heard what was said between them. About three in the afternoon the trumpeter came walking back over the hill, and by the time my father came home from the fishing the cottage was tidied up, and the tea ready, and the whole place shining like a new pin. From that time for five years he lodged here with my father, looking after the house and tilling the garden, and all the time he was steadily failing, the hurt in his head spreading in a manner to his limbs. My father watched the feebleness growing on him, but said nothing and from first to last neither spake a word about the drummer John Christian, nor did any letter reach them, nor word of his doings. The rest of the tale you are free to believe, sir, or not, as you please. It stands upon my father's words, and he always declared he was ready to kiss the book upon it before judge and jury. He said, too, that he never had the wit to make up such a yarn, and he defied anyone to explain about the lock, in particular, by any other tale. But you shall judge for yourself. My father said that about three o'clock in the morning, April 14th, of the year 14, he and William Talifer was sitting here, just as you and I, sir, are sitting now. My father had put on his clothes a few minutes before and was mending his spiller by the light of the horn lantern, meaning to set off before daylight to haul the trammel. The trumpeter hadn't been to bed at all. Toward the last, he mostly spent his nights, and his days too, dozing in the elbow chair where you sit at this minute. He was dozing then, my father said, with his chin dropped forward on his chest, when a knock sounded upon the door, and the door opened, and in walked an upright young man in scarlet regimentals. He had grown a brave bit, and his face the color of wood ashes, but it was the drummer, John Christian. Only his uniform was different from the one he used to wear, and the figures thirty-eight shone in brass upon his collar. The drummer walked past my father as if he never saw him, and stood by the elbow chair and said, Trumpeter, trumpeter, are you one with me? and the trumpeter just lifted the lids of his eyes and answered, How should I not be one with you, drummer Johnny, Johnny boy? If you come, I count. If you march, I mark time, until the discharge comes. The discharge has come tonight, said the drummer, and the word is Karuna no longer. And stepping to the chimney place, he unhooked the drum and trumpet, and began to twist the brass rings of the lock, spelling the word aloud so C O R 
U N A. When he had fixed the last letter, the padlock opened in his hand. Did you know, Trumpeter, that when I came to Plymouth, they put me into a line regiment? The thirty eighth is a good regiment, answered the old hussar, still in his dull voice. I went back with them from Sahagan to Karuna. At Karuna, they stood in General Eraser's division on the right. They behaved well. But I'd fain see the Marines again, says the drummer, handing him the trumpet. And you, you shall call once more for the Queen's own. Matthew, he says suddenly, turning on my father. And when he turned, my father saw for the first time that his scarlet jacket had a round hole by the breastbone, and that the blood was welling there. Matthew, we shall want your boat. And my father rose on his legs like a man in a dream, while the two slung on, the one his drum, and t'other his trumpet. He took the lantern and went quaking before them down to the shore, and they breathed heavily behind him, and they stepped into his boat, and my father pushed off. Row you first for Dolor Point, says the drummer. So my father rowed them past the white houses of Kovrak to Dolor Point, and there, at a word, lay on his oars. And the trumpeter, William Talifer, put his trumpet to his mouth and sounded the reveille. The music of it was like rivers running. They will follow says the drummer. Matthew, pull you now for the manacles. So my father pulled for the manacles and came to an easy close outside Carndu, and the drummer took his sticks and beat a tattoo there by the edge of the reef, and the music of it was like a rolling chariot. That will do, he says, breaking off. They will follow. Pull now for the shore under Gunner's Meadow. Then my father pulled for the shore and ran his boat in under Gunner's Meadow. And they stepped out, all three, and walked up to the meadow. By the gate the drummer halted and began his tattoo again, looking outward the darkness over the sea. And while the drum beat, and my father held his breath, there came up out of the sea and the darkness a troop of many men, horse and foot, and formed up among the graves, and others rose out of the graves and formed up, drowned marines with bleached faces, and pale hussars riding their horses all lean and shadowy. There was no clatter of hoofs or accoutrements, my father said, but a soft sound all the while, like the beating of a bird's wing, and a black shadow lay like a pool about the feet of all. The drummer stood upon a little knoll just inside the gate, and beside him the tall trumpeter, with hand on hip, watching them gather, and behind them both, my father clinging to the gate. When no more came, the drummer stopped playing and said, Call the roll. Then the trumpeter stepped toward the end man of the rank and called, Troop Sergeant Major Thomas Irons. And the man answered in a thin voice, Here. Troop Sergeant Major Thomas Irons, how is it with you? The man answered, How should it be with me? When I was young, I betrayed a girl. And when I was grown, I betrayed a friend. And for these I must pay. But I died as a man ought. God save the king. 
the trumpeter called to the next man. Trooper Henry Buckingham. And the next man answered, Here. Trooper Henry Buckingham, how is it with you? How should it be with me? I was a drunkard, and I stole, and in Lugo, in a wine shop, I killed a man. But I died as a man should. God save the king. So the trumpeter went down the line, and when he had finished, the drummer took it up, hailing the dead marines in their order. Each man answered to his name, and each man ended with God save the king. When all were hailed, the drummer stepped backward to his mound and called, It is well. You are content, and we are content to join you. Wait now a little while. With this, he turned and ordered my father to pick up the lantern and lead the way back. As my father picked it up, he heard the ranks of the dead men cheer and call, God save the king, all together, and saw them waver and fade back into the dark like a breath fading off a pane. But when they came back here to the kitchen, and my father set the lantern down, it seemed they'd both forgot about him, for the drummer turned in the lantern light, and my father could see the blood still welling out of the hole in his breast, and took the trumpet sling from around the other's neck, and locked drum and trumpet together again, choosing the letters on the lock very carefully. While he did this, he said, The word is no more, Karuna, but Bayonne. As you left out an N in Karuna, so must I leave out an N in Bayonne. And before snapping the padlock, he spelt out the word slowly. B A Y O N E. After that, he used no more speech, but turned and hung the two instruments back on the hook, and then took the trumpeter by the arm, and the pair walked out into the darkness, glancing neither to right nor left. My father was on the point of following when he heard a sort of sigh behind him, and there, sitting in the elbow chair, was the very trumpeter he had just seen walk out by the door. If my father's heart jumped before, you may believe it jumped quicker now. But after a bit, he went up to the man asleep in the chair and put a hand upon him. It was the trumpeter in flesh and blood that he touched. But though the flesh was warm, the trumpeter was dead. Well, sir, they buried him three days after, and at first my father was minded to say nothing about his dream as he thought it. But the day after the funeral, he met Parson Kendall coming from Helston Market, and the parson called out, Have ye heard the news the coach brought down this morning? What news? says my father. Why, that peace is agreed upon. None too soon, says my father. Not soon enough for our poor lads at Bayonne. The parson answered. Bayonne, cries my father with a jump. Why, yes. And the parson told him all about a great sally the French had made on the night of April 13th. Do you happen to know if the 38th Regiment was engaged? My father asked. Come now, said Parson Kendall. I didn't know you was so well up in the campaign. But, as it happens, I do know that the 38th was engaged 
for twas they that held a cottage and stopped the French advance. Still my father held his tongue, and when, a week later, he walked into Helston and bought a mercury off the Sherborne rider and got the landlord of the Angel to spell out the list of killed and wounded, sure enough, there among the killed was drummer John Christian of the 38th foot. After this, there was nothing for a religious man but to make a clean breast. So my father went up to Parson Kendall and told the whole story. The parson listened and put a question or two, and then asked, Have you tried to open the lock since that night? I haven't dared to touch it, said my father. Then come along and try. When the parson came to the cottage here, he took the things off the hook and tried the lock. Did he say Bayonne? The word has seven letters. Not if you spell it with one N as he did, says my father. The parson spelled it out, B-A-Y-O-N-E. Phew, says he for the lock has fallen open in his hand. He stood considering it a moment, and then he says, I tell you what, I shouldn't blab this all around the parish if I was you. You won't get no credit for truth-telling, and a miracle's wasted on a set of fools. But if you like, I'll shut down the lock again upon a holy word that no one but me shall know, and neither drummer nor trumpeter, dead or alive, shall frighten the secret out of me. I wish to heaven you would, parson, said my father. The parson chose the holy word there and then, and shut the lock upon it, and hung the drum and trumpet back in their place. He is gone long since, taking the word with him. And till the lock is broken by force, nobody will ever separate these two. By Mrs. Margaret Oliphant The Open Door I took the house of Brentwood on my return from India in 18 blank for the temporary accommodation of my family until I could find a permanent home for them. It had many advantages which made it peculiarly appropriate. It was within reach of Edinburgh, and my boy Roland, whose education had been considerably neglected, could ride in and out to school, which was thought to be better for him than either leaving him home altogether or staying there always with a tutor. The lad was doubly precious to us, being the only one left to us of many, and he was fragile in body, we believed, and deeply sensitive in mind. The two girls also found at Brentwood everything they wanted. They were near enough to Edinburgh to have masters and lessons as many as they required for completing that never-ending education which the young people seem to require nowadays. Brentwood stands on that fine and wealthy slope of country, one of the richest in Scotland, which lies between the Pentland Hills and the Firth. In clear weather, you could see the blue gleam of the great estuary on one side of you, and on the other, the blue heights. Edinburgh, with its two lesser heights, the castle and Calton Hill, its spires and towers piercing through the smoke, and Arthur's seat lying crouched behind, like a guardian no longer very needful, taking his repose beside the well-beloved charge, which is now, so to speak, able to care of itself without him, lay at our right hand. The village of Brentwood, 
with its prosaic houses, lay in a hollow almost under our house. Village architecture does not flourish in Scotland. Still, a cluster of houses on different elevations, with scraps of garden coming in between, a hedgerow with clothes laid out to dry, the opening of a street with its rural sociability, the woman at their doors, the slow wagon lumbering along, gives a center to the landscape. In the park which surrounded the house were the ruins of the former mansion of Brentwood, a much smaller and less important house than the solid Georgian edifice which we inhabited. The ruins were picturesque, however, and gave importance to the place. Even we, who were but temporary tenants, felt a vague pride in them, as if they somehow reflected a certain consequence upon ourselves. The old building had the remains of a tower, an indistinguishable mass of mason work overgrown with ivy, and the shells of the walls attached to this were half filled up with soil. At a little distance were some very commonplace and disjointed fragments of buildings one of them suggesting a certain pathos by its very commonness and the complete wreck which it showed. This was the end of a low gable, a bit of gray wall, all encrusted with lichens, in which was a common doorway. Probably it had been a servant's entrance, a back door or opening into what are called the offices in Scotland. No offices remained to be entered. Pantry and kitchen had all been swept out of being. But there stood the doorway, open and vacant, free to all the winds, to the rabbits, and every wild creature. It struck my eye the first time I went to Brentwood like a melancholy comment upon a life that was over. A door that led to nothing closed once, perhaps, with anxious care, bolted and guarded, now void of any meaning. It impressed me, I remember, from the first. So perhaps it may be said that my mind was prepared to attach to it an importance which nothing justified. The summer was a very happy period of repose for us all, and it was when the family had settled down for the winter, when the days were short and dark, and the rigorous rain of frost upon us, that the incidents occurred which alone could justify me in intruding upon the world my private affairs. I was absent in London when these events began. In London, an old Indian plunges back into the interests with which all his previous life has been associated and meets old friends at every step. I had been circulating among some half-dozen of these, and had missed some of my home letters. It is never safe to miss one's letters. In this transitory life, as the prayer book says, how can one ever be certain what is going to happen? All was well at home. I knew exactly, I thought, what they would have to say to me. The weather has been so fine that Roland has not once gone by train, and he enjoys the ride beyond anything. Dear Papa, be sure that you don't forget anything, but bring us so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so. a list as long as my arm. Dear girls and dearer mother, I would not for the world have forgotten their commissions or lost their little letters. When I got back to my club, however, three or four letters were lying for me, upon some of which I noticed the immediate, urgent, which old-fashioned people and anxious people still believe will influence the post office and quicken the speed of the mails. I was about to open one of these when the club porter brought me two telegrams one of which, he said, had arrived the night before. 
I opened, as was to be expected, the last first, and this is what I read. Why don't you come or answer? For God's sake, come, he is much worse. This was a thunderbolt to fall upon a man's head, who had only one son, and he the light of his eyes. The other telegram, which I opened with hands trembling so much that I lost time by my haste, was to much the same purpose. No better. Doctor, afraid of brain fever, calls for you day and night. Let nothing detain you. The first thing I did was to look up the timetables to see if there was any way of getting off sooner than by the night train, though I knew well enough there was not. And then I read the letters which furnished, alas, too clearly all the details. They told me that the boy had been pale for some time, with a scared look. His mother had noticed it before I left home, but would not say anything to alarm me. This look had increased day by day, and soon it was observed that Roland came home at a wild gallop through the park, his pony panting and in foam, himself as white as a sheet but with the perspiration streaming from his forehead. For a long time he had resisted all questioning, but at length had developed such strange changes of mood, showing a reluctance to go to school, a desire to be fetched in the carriage at night, which was a ridiculous piece of luxury, an unwillingness to go out into the grounds, a nervous start at every sound that his mother had insisted upon an explanation. When the boy, our boy Roland, who had never known what fear was, began to talk to her of voices he had heard in the park and shadows that had appeared to him among the ruins, my wife promptly put him to bed and sent for Dr. Simpson, which, of course, was the only thing to do. I hurried off that evening, as may be supposed, with an anxious heart. How I got through the hours before the starting of the train, I cannot tell. We must all be thankful for the quickness of the railway when in anxiety. But to have thrown myself into a post-chase as soon as horses could be put to would have been a relief. I got to Edinburgh very early in the blackness of winter morning, and scarcely dared look the man in the face at whom I gasped, What news? My wife had sent the brougham for me, which I concluded, before the man spoke, was a bad sign. His answer was that stereotyped answer which leaves the imagination so wildly free. Just the same. Just the same. What might that mean? The horses seemed to me to creep along the long, dark country road. As we dashed through the park, I thought I heard someone moaning among the trees, and clenched my fist at him, whoever he might be, with fury. Why had the fool of a woman at the gate allowed anyone to come in to disturb the quiet of the place? If I had not been in such hot haste to get home, I think I should have stopped the carriage and got out to see what tramp it was that had made an entrance and chosen my grounds of all places in the world when my boy was ill to grumble and groan in. But I had no reason to complain of our slow pace here. The horses flew like lightning along the intervening path and drew up at the door all panting as if they had run a race. My wife stood waiting to receive me with a pale face and a candle in her hand, which made her look paler still as the wind blew the flame about. He is sleeping, she said in a whisper, as if her voice might wake him and I replied when I could find my voice, also in a whisper, 
as though the jingling of the horse's furniture and the sound of their hoofs must not have been more dangerous. I stood on the steps with her a moment, almost afraid to go in, now that I was here, and it seemed to me that I saw without observing, if I may so say, that the horses were unwilling to turn round, though their stables lay that way, or that the men were unwilling. These things occurred to me afterwards, though at the moment I was not capable of anything but to ask questions and to hear of the condition of the boy. I looked at him from the door of his room, for we were afraid to go near, lest we should disturb that blessed sleep. It looked like actual sleep, not the lethargy into which my wife told me he would sometimes fall. She told me everything in the next room, which communicated with his, rising now and then, and going to the door of the communication. And in this there was much that was very startling and confusing to my mind. It appeared that ever since the winter began, since it was early dark and night had fallen before his return from school, he had been hearing voices among the ruins. At first, only a groaning, he said, at which his pony was as much alarmed as he was, but by degrees, a voice. The tears ran down my wife's cheeks as she described to me how he would start up in the night and cry out, Oh, mother, let me in! Oh, mother, let me in! With a pathos which rent her heart. And she, sitting there all the time, only longing to do everything his heart could desire. But though she would try to soothe him, crying, You are at home, my darling. I am here. Don't you know me? Your mother is here. He would only stare at her, and after a while spring up again with the same cry. At other times he would be quite reasonable, she said, asking eagerly when I was coming but declaring that he must go with me as soon as I did so to let them in. The doctor thinks his nervous system must have received a shock, my wife said. Oh, Henry, can it be that we have pushed him on too much with his work? A delicate boy like Roland. And what is his work in comparison with his health? Even you would think little of honors or prizes if it hurt the boy's health. Even I, as if I were an inhuman father, sacrificing my child to my ambition. But I would not increase her trouble by taking any notice. There was just daylight enough to see his face when I went to him, and what a change in a fortnight. He was paler and more worn, I thought, than even in those dreadful days in the plains before we left India. His hair seemed to me to have grown long and lank. His eyes were like blazing lights projecting out of his white face. He got hold of my hand in a cold and tremulous clutch, and waved to everybody to go away. Go away, even mother, he said. Go away. This went to her heart, for she did not like that even I should have more of the boy's confidence than herself. But my wife has never been a woman to think of herself, and she left us alone. Are they all gone? he said eagerly. They would not let me speak. The doctor treated me as if I were a fool. You know I'm not a fool, Papa. Yes, yes, my boy, I know. But you are ill, and quiet is so necessary. You are not only not a fool, Roland, but you are reasonable and understand. When you are ill, you must deny yourself. You must not do everything that you might do being well. 
He waved his thin hand with a sort of indignation. Then, father, I am not ill, he cried. Oh, I thought when you came you would not stop me. You would see the sense of it. What do you think is the matter with me, all of you? Simpson is well enough, but he's only a doctor. What do you think is the matter with me? I am no more ill than you are. A doctor, of course, he thinks you are ill the moment he looks at you. That's what he's there for, and claps you into bed. Which is the best place for you at present, my dear boy. I made up my mind, cried the little fellow, that I would stand it till you came home. I said to myself, I won't frighten mother and the girls. But now, father, he cried, half jumping out of bed, it's not illness. It's a secret. His eyes shone so wildly, his face was so swept with strong feeling that my heart sank within me. It could be nothing but fever that did it, and fever had been so fatal. I got him into my arms to put him back into bed. Roland, I said, humoring the poor child, which I knew was the only way. If you are going to tell me this secret, to do any good, you know you must be quite quiet and not excite yourself. If you excite yourself, I must not let you speak. Yes, father, said the boy. He was quiet directly, like a man, as if he quite understood. When I had laid him back on his pillow, he looked up at me with that grateful sweet look with which children, when they are ill, break one's heart, the water coming into his eyes in his weakness. I was sure as soon as you were here you would know what to do, he said. To be sure, my boy, now keep quiet and tell it all out like a man. To think I was telling lies to my own child, for I did it only to humor him, thinking, poor little fellow, his brain was wrong. Yes, father. Father, there is someone in the park, someone that has been badly used. Hush, my dear, you remember there is to be no excitement. Well, who is this somebody, and who has been ill-using him? We will soon put a stop to that. Ah, cried Roland, but it is not so easy as you think. I don't know who it is. It is just a cry. Oh, if you could hear it. It gets into my head in my sleep. I hear it as clear as clear. And they think that I am dreaming or raving, perhaps, the boy said, with a sort of disdainful smile. This look of his perplexed me. It was less like fever than I thought. Are you quite sure you have not dreamed it, Roland? I said. Dreamed? That? He was springing up again when he suddenly bethought himself and lay down flat with the same sort of smile on his face. The pony heard it too, he said. She jumped as if she had been shot. If I had not grasped at the reins, for I was frightened, father. No shame to you, my boy, said I, though I scarcely knew why. If I hadn't held to her like a leech, she'd have pitched me over her head and never drew breath till we were at the door. Did the pony dream it? He said with a soft disdain, yet indulgence for my foolishness. Then he added slowly, It was only a cry the first time, and all the time before you went away. I wouldn't tell you, for it was so wretched to be frightened. I thought it might be a hare or a rabbit snared. And I went in the morning and looked, but there was nothing. It was after you went I heard it really first, 
and this is what he says. He raised himself on his elbow, close to me, and looked me in the face. Oh, mother, let me in! Oh, mother, let me in! As he said the words, a mist came over his face. The mouth quivered, the soft features all melted and changed. And when he had ended these pitiful words, dissolved in a shower of heavy tears. Was it a hallucination? Was it the fever of the brain? Was it the disordered fancy caused by great bodily weakness? How could I tell? I thought it wisest to accept it as if it were all true. This is very touching, Roland, I said. Oh, if you had just heard it, father, I said to myself, if father heard it, he would do something. But mamma, you know she's given over to Simpson, and that fellow's a doctor, and never thinks of anything but clapping you into bed. We must not blame Simpson for being a doctor, Roland. No, no, said my boy with delightful toleration and indulgence. Oh, no, that's the good of him. That's what he's for, I know that. But you, you are different. You are just father, and you'll do something. Directly, Papa, directly, this very night. Surely, I said, no doubt it is some little lost child. He gave me a sudden swift look, investigating my face as though to see whether, after all, this was everything my eminence as father came to, no more than that. Then he got hold of my shoulder, clutching it with his thin hand. Look here, he said with a quiver in his voice. Suppose it wasn't living at all. My dear boy, how then could you have heard it, I said. He turned away from me with a pettish exclamation. As if you didn't know better than that. Do you want to tell me it is a ghost, I said. Roland withdrew his hand. His countenance assumed an aspect of great dignity and gravity. A slight quiver remained about his lips. Whatever it was, you always said we were not to call names. It was something in trouble, oh, father, in terrible trouble. But, my boy, I said, I was at my wit's end. If it was a child that was lost, or any poor human creature, but Roland, what do you want me to do? I should know if I was you, said the child eagerly. That is what I always said to myself. Father will know. Oh, Papa, Papa, to have to face it night after night in such terrible, terrible trouble and never to be able to do it any good. I don't want to cry. It's like a baby, I know, but what can I do else? Out there, all by itself in the ruin, and nobody to help it. I can't bear it, cried my generous boy. And in his weakness he burst out, after many attempts to restrain it, into a great childish fit of sobbing and tears. I do not know that I was ever in a greater perplexity in my life, and afterwards, when I thought of it, there was something comic in it too. It is bad enough to find your child's mind possessed with a conviction that he had seen or heard a ghost but that he should require you to go instantly and help that ghost was the most bewildering experience that had ever come my way. I did my best to console my boy without giving any promise of this astonishing kind. But he was too sharp for me. He would have none of my caresses. 
with sobs breaking in at intervals upon his voice, and the raindrops hanging on his eyelids, he yet returned to the charge. It, it will be there now. It will be there all the night. Oh, think, Papa, think if it was me. I can't rest for thinking of it. Don't, he cried, putting away my hand. Don't. You go and help it, and Mother can take care of me. But, Roland, what can I do? My boy opened his eyes, which were large with weakness and fever, and gave me a smile such, I think, as sick children only know the secret of. I was sure you would know as soon as you came. I always said, Father will know. And Mother, he cried, with a softening of repose upon his face, his limbs relaxing, his form sinking with a luxurious ease in his bed. Mother can come and take care of me. I called her and saw him turn to her with the complete dependence of a child, and then I went away and left them, as perplexed a man as any in Scotland, I must say. However, I had this consolation, that my mind was greatly eased about Roland. He might be under a hallucination, but his head was clear enough, and I did not think him so ill as everybody else did. The girls were astonished even at the ease with which I took it. How do you think he is? they said in a breath, coming round me, laying hold of me. Not half so ill as I expected, I said. Not very bad at all. Oh, Papa, you are a darling, cried Agatha, kissing me and crying upon my shoulder, while little Jeanie, who was as pale as Roland, clasped both her arms round mine and could not speak at all. I knew nothing about it, not half so much as Simpson, but they believed in me. They had a feeling that all would go right now. God is very good to you when your children look to you like that. It makes one humble, not proud. I was not worthy of it. And then I recollected that I had to act the part of a father to Roland's ghost, which made me almost laugh, though I might just as well have cried. It was the strangest mission that ever was entrusted to mortal man. It was then I remembered suddenly the looks of the men when they turned to take the brougham to the stables in the dark that morning. They had not liked it, and the horses had not liked it. I remembered that even in my anxiety about Roland, I had heard them tearing along the avenue back to the stables, and had made a memorandum mentally that I must speak of it. It seemed to me that the best thing I could do was go to the stables now and make a few inquiries. The coachman was the head of this little colony, and it was to his house I went to pursue my investigations. He was a native of the district, and had taken care of the place in the absence of the family for years. It was impossible but that he must know everything that was going on, and all the traditions of the place. The men I could see eyed me anxiously when I thus appeared at such an hour among them, and followed me with their eyes to Jarvis's house, where he lived alone with his old wife, their children being all married and out in the world. Mrs. Jarvis met me with anxious questions. How was the poor young gentleman? But the others knew— I could see by their faces that not even this was the foremost thing in my mind. After a while I elicited without much difficulty the whole story. In the opinion of the Jarvises, and of everybody about, the certainty that the place was haunted 
was beyond all doubt. As Sandy and his wife warmed to the tale, one tripping up another in their eagerness to tell everything, it gradually developed as distinct a superstition as I ever heard, and not without poetry and pathos. How long it was since the voice had been heard first, nobody could tell with certainty. Jarvis's opinion was that his father, who had been coachman at Brentwood before him, had never heard anything about it, and that the whole thing had arisen within the last ten years, since the complete dismantling of the old house, which was a wonderfully modern date for a tale so well authenticated. According to these witnesses, and to several whom I questioned afterwards, and who were all in perfect agreement, it was only in the months of November and December that the visitation occurred. During these months, the darkest of the year, scarcely a night passed without the recurrence of these inexplicable cries. Nothing, it was said, had ever been seen, at least nothing that could be identified. Some people, bolder or more imaginative than the others, had seen the darkness moving, Mrs. Jarvis said, with unconscious poetry. It began when night fell, and continued at intervals till day broke. Very often it was only an inarticulate cry and moaning, but sometimes the words which had taken possession of my poor boy's fancy had been distinctly audible. Oh, mother, let me in. The Jarvises were not aware that there had ever been any investigation into it. The estate of Brentwood had lapsed into the hands of a distant branch of the family, who had lived but little there and of the many people who had taken it, as I had done, few had remained through two Decembers. And nobody had taken the trouble to make a very close examination into the facts. No, no, Jarvis said, shaking his head. No, no, Colonel. Wa would set themselves up for a laughing stock to all the countryside. Making a wark about a ghost. Nobody believes in ghosts. It bid to be the wind in the trees, the last gentleman said. Or some effect of the water rasslin' among the rocks. He said it was a quite easy explained, but he gave up the hoose. And when you came, Colonel, we were awful anxious you should never hear. What for should I have spoiled the bargain and hammered the property for nothing? Do you call my child's life nothing? I said in the trouble of the moment, unable to restrain myself. And instead of telling this all to me, you have told it to him, to a delicate boy, a child unable to sift evidence or judge for himself, a tender-hearted young creature. I was walking about the room with an anger all the hotter that I felt it to be most likely quite unjust. My heart was full of bitterness against the stolid retainers of a family who were content to risk other people's children and comfort, rather than let a house lie empty. If I had been warned, I might have taken precautions, or left the place, or sent Roland away a hundred things which now I could not do. And here I was with my boy in a brain fever, and his life, the most precious life on earth, hanging in the balance, dependent on whether or not I could get to the reason of a commonplace ghost story. Colonel, said Jarvis solemnly, and she'll bear me witness, the young gentleman never heard a word from me. No, nor from either groom nor gardener. I'll gie ye my word for that. In the first place, is no a lad that invites ye to talk. 
There are some that are, and that are na. Some will draw ye on, till ye've telt them a clatter of the town, and I ye ken, and whiles mare. But Maister Roland, his mind's full of his books. He's aye civil and kind, and a fine lad, but no that sort. And ye see, it's for our interest, Colonel, that ye should stay at Brentwood. I took it upon me myself to pass the word. No a syllable to Maister Roland, nor to the young laddies. No a syllable. The woman servants that have little reason to be out at night ken little or nothing about it. And some think it grand to have a ghost so long as they're no in the way of coming across it. If you would have been telt the story to begin with, maybe ye would have thought so yourself. This was true enough. I should not have been above the idea of a ghost myself. Oh, yes, I claim no exemption. The girls would have been delighted. I could fancy their eagerness, their interest, and excitement. No, if we had been told, it would have done no good. We should have made the bargain all the more eagerly the fools that we are. Come with me, Jarvis, I said hastily, and we'll make an attempt to at least investigate. Say nothing to the men or to anybody. Be ready for me about ten o'clock. Me, Colonel, Jarvis said in a faint voice. I had not been looking at him in my own preoccupation, but when I did so, I found that the greatest change had come over the fat and ruddy coachman. Me, Colonel, he repeated, wiping the perspiration from his brow. There's nothing I wouldn't a do to pleasure ye, Colonel, but if you'll reflect, that I am no use to my feet. With a horse atween my legs, or the reins in my hand, I'm maybe nay worse than other men. But on fit, Colonel, it's no the boggles. But I've been cavalry, you see, with a hoarse little laugh, all my life, to face a thing you didn't understand on your feet, Colonel. He believes in it, Colonel, and ye didn't believe in it, the woman said. Will you come with me, I said, turning to her. She jumped back, upsetting her chair in the bewilderment. Me! with a scream, and then fell into a sort of hysterical laugh. I wouldn't a say but what I would go. But what would the folk say to hear of Colonel Mortimer with an old silly woman at his heels? The suggestion made me laugh, too, though I had little inclination for it. I'm sorry you have so little spirit, Jarvis, I said. I must find someone else, I suppose. Jarvis, touched by this, began to remonstrate, but I cut him short. My butler was a soldier who had been with me in India, and was not supposed to fear anything, man or devil. Certainly not the former, and I felt that I was losing time. The Jarvises were too thankful to get rid of me. They attended me to the door with the most anxious courtesies. Outside, the two grooms stood close by a little confused by my sudden exit. I don't know if perhaps they had been listening, at least standing as near as possible, to catch any scrap of the conversation. I waved my hand to them as I went past, in answer to their salutations, and it was very apparent to me that they also were glad to see me go. And it will be thought very strange but it would be weak not to add that I myself, though bent on the investigation I have spoken of, pledged to Roland to carry it out, and feeling that my boy's health, perhaps his life, depended on the result of my inquiry, I felt the most unaccountable reluctance, now that it was dark, 
to pass the ruins on my way home. My curiosity was intense, and yet it was all my mind could do to pull my body along. I dare say the scientific people would describe it the other way and attribute my cowardice to the state of my stomach. I went on, but if I had followed my impulse, I should have turned and bolted. Everything in me seemed to cry out against it. My heart thumped. My pulses all began like sledgehammers, beating against my ears and every sensitive part. It was very dark, as I have said. The old house, with its shapeless tower, loomed a heavy mass through the darkness, which was only not entirely so solid as itself. On the other hand, the great dark cedars of which we were so proud seemed to fill up the night. My foot strayed out of the path in my confusion and the gloom together, and I brought myself up with a cry as I felt myself knocked against something solid. What was it? The contact with hard stone and lime and prickly bramble bushes restored me a little to myself. Oh, it's only the old gable, I said aloud, with a little laugh to reassure myself. The rough feeling of the stones reconciled me. As I groped about thus, I shook off my visionary folly. What so easily explained is that I should have strayed from the path in the darkness. This brought me back to common existence, as if I had been shaken by a wise hand out of all the silliness of superstition. How silly it was, after all! What did it matter which path I took? I laughed again, this time with better heart, when suddenly, in a moment, the blood was chilled in my veins, a shiver stole along my spine, my faculties seemed to forsake me. Close by me, at my side, at my feet, there was a sigh. No, not a groan, not a moaning, not anything so tangible, a perfectly soft, faint, inarticulate sigh. I sprang back, and my heart stopped beating. Mistaken. No, mistake was impossible. I heard it as clearly as I hear myself speak. A long, soft, weary sigh, as if drawn to the utmost, and emptying out a load of sadness that filled the breast. To hear this in the solitude, in the dark, in the night, though it was still early, had an effect which I cannot describe. I feel it now, something cold creeping over me into my hair and down to my feet, which refused to move. I cried out with a trembling voice, Who is there? as I had done before, but there was no reply. I got home I don't quite know how, but in my mind there was no longer any indifference as to the thing, whatever it was, that haunted these ruins. My skepticism disappeared like a mist. I was as firmly determined that there was something as Roland was. I did not for a moment pretend to myself that it was possible I could be deceived. There were movements and noises which I understood all about, cracklings of small branches in the frost and little rolls of gravel on the path, such as have a very eerie sound sometimes and perplex you with wonder as to who has done it when there is no real mystery. But I assure you, all these little movements of nature don't affect you one bit when there is something. I understood them. I did not understand the sigh. That was not simple nature. There was meaning in it, feeling, the soul of a creature invisible. 
This is the thing that human nature trembles at, a creature invisible yet with sensations, feelings, a power somehow of expressing itself. Bagley was in the hall as usual when I went in. He was always there in the afternoon, always with the appearance of perfect occupation, yet, so far as I know, never doing anything. The door was open, so that I hurried in without any pause, breathless. But the sight of his calm regard, as he came to help me off with my overcoat, subdued me in a moment. Anything out of the way, anything incomprehensible, faded to nothing in the presence of Bagley. You saw and wondered how he was made, the parting of his hair, the tie of his white neckcloth, the fit of his trousers, all perfect as works of art. But you could see how they were done, which makes all the difference. I flung myself upon him, so to speak, without waiting to note the extreme unlikeliness of the man to anything of the kind I meant. Bagley, I said, I want you to come out with me tonight to watch for poachers, Colonel, he said, a gleam of pleasure running all over him. No, Bagley, a great deal worse, I cried. Yes, Colonel. At what hour, sir? The man said. But then I had not told him what it was. It was ten o'clock when we set out. All was perfectly quiet indoors. My wife was with Roland, who had been quite calm, she said, and who, though no doubt the fever must run its course, had been better ever since I came. I told Bagley to put on a thick greatcoat over his evening coat, and did the same myself with strong boots, for the soil was like a sponge or worse. Talking to him, I almost forgot what we were going to do. It was darker even than it had been before, and Bagley kept very close to me as we went along. I had a small lantern in my hand, which gave us a partial guidance. We had come to the corner where the path turns. On one side was the bowling green, which the girls had taken possession of for their croquet ground, a wonderful enclosure surrounded by high hedges of holly, three hundred years old and more, on the other the ruins. Both were black as night, but before we got so far, there was a little opening in which we could just discern the trees and the lighter line of the road. I thought it best to pause there and take breath. Bagley, I said, there is something about these ruins I don't understand. It is there I am going. Keep your eyes open and your wits about you. Be ready to pounce upon any stranger you see, anything, man or woman. Don't hurt, but seize anything you see. Colonel, said Bagley, with a little tremor in his breath, they do say there's things here, as is neither man nor woman. There was no time for words. Are you game to follow me, my man? That's the question, I said. Bagley fell in without a word and saluted. I knew then I had nothing to fear. We went, so far as I could guess, exactly as I had come, when I heard that sigh. The darkness, however, was so complete that all marks, as of trees or paths, disappeared. One moment we felt our feet on the gravel, another sinking noiselessly into the slippery grass, that was all. I had shut up my lantern, not wishing to scare anyone, whoever it might be. Bagley followed, it seemed to me, exactly in my footsteps as I made my way, as I supposed, towards the mass of the ruined house. We seemed to take a long time, groping along, seeking this, 
The squash of the wet soil under our feet was the only thing that marked our progress. After a while, I stood still to see, or rather feel, where we were. The darkness was very still, but no stiller than is usual in a winter's night. The sounds I have mentioned, the crackling of twigs, the roll of a pebble, the sound of some rustle in the dead leaves or creeping creature on the grass, were audible when you listened, all mysterious enough when your mind is disengaged, but to me cheering now as signs of the livingness of nature, even in the death of the frost. As we stood still, there came up from the trees in the glen the prolonged hoot of an owl. Bagley started with alarm, being in a state of general nervousness, and not knowing what he was afraid of. But to me, the sound was encouraging and pleasant, being so comprehensible. An owl, I said under my breath. Y yes, Colonel, said Bagley, his teeth chattering. We stood still about five minutes, while it broke into the still brooding of the air, the sound widening out in circles, dying upon the darkness. This sound, which is not a cheerful one, made me almost gay. It was natural and relieved the tension of the mind. I moved on with new courage, my nervous excitement calming down. When all at once, Quite suddenly, close to us, at our feet, there broke out a cry. I made a spring backwards in the first moment of surprise and horror, and in doing so came sharply against the same rough masonry and brambles that had struck me before. This new sound came upwards from the ground, a low, moaning, wailing voice full of suffering and pain. The contrast between it and the hoot of the owl was indescribable, the one with a wholesome wildness and naturalness that hurt nobody, the other a sound that made one's blood curdle, full of human misery. With a great deal of fumbling, for in spite of everything I could do to keep up my courage, my hands shook. I managed to remove the slide of my lantern. The light leaped out like something living and made the place visible in a moment. We were what would have been inside the ruined building had anything remained but the gable wall which I have described. It was close to us, the vacant doorway in it, going out straight into the blackness outside. The light showed the bit of wall, the ivy glistening upon it in clouds of dark green, the bramble branches waving, and below, the open door, a door that led to nothing. It was from this the voice came which died out just as the light flashed upon this strange scene. There was a moment's silence, and then it broke forth again. The sound was so near, so penetrating, so pitiful, that in the nervous start I gave, the light fell out of my hand. As I groped for it in the dark, my hand was clutched by Bagley, who I think must have dropped upon his knees. But I was too much perturbed myself to think much of this. He clutched at me in the confusion of his terror, forgetting all his usual decorum. "'For God's sake, what is it, sir?' he gasped. If I yielded, there was evidently an end of both of us. "'I can't tell,' I said, "'any more than you. That's what we've got to find out. Up, man, up!' I pulled him to his feet. Will you go round and examine the other side, or will you stay here with the lantern? Bagley gasped at me with a face of horror. Can't we stay together, Colonel, he said. His knees were trembling under him. 
I pushed him against the corner of the wall and put the light into his hands. Stand fast till I come back. Shake yourself together, man. Let nothing pass you, I said. The voice was within two or three feet of us. Of that, there could be no doubt. I went myself to the other side of the wall, keeping close to it. The light shook in Bagley's hand, but tremulous though it was, shone out through the vacant door, one oblong block of light marking all the crumbling corners and hanging masses of foliage. Was that something dark huddled in a heap by the side of it? I pushed forward across the light in the doorway and fell upon it with my hands, but it was only a juniper bush growing close against the wall. Meanwhile, the sight of my figure crossing the doorway had brought Bagley's nervous excitement to a height. He flew at me, gripping my shoulder. "'I've got him, Colonel! I've got him!' he cried, with a voice of sudden exultation. He thought it was a man, and was at once relieved. But at the moment the voice burst forth again between us at our feet, more close to us than any separate being could be. He dropped off from me, and fell against the wall, his jaw dropping as if he were dying. I suppose, at the same moment, he saw that it was me whom he had clutched. I, for my part, had scarcely more command of myself. I snatched the light out of his hand and flashed it all about me wildly. Nothing, the juniper bush which I thought I had never seen before, the heavy growth of the glistening ivy, the brambles waving. It was close to my ears now, crying, crying, pleading as if for life. Either I heard the same words Roland had heard, or else, in my excitement, his imagination got possession of mine. The voice went on, growing into distinct articulation, but wavering about, now from one point, now from another, as if the owner of it were moving slowly back and forward. Mother! Mother! and then an outburst of wailing. As my mind steadied, getting accustomed, as one's mind gets accustomed to anything, it seemed to me as if some uneasy, miserable creature was pacing up and down before a closed door. Sometimes, but that must have been excitement, I thought I heard a sound like knocking, and then another burst, Oh, mother, mother! All this close, close to the space where I was standing with my lantern, now before me, now behind me, a creature restless, unhappy, moaning, crying before the vacant doorway, which no one could either shut or open more. Do you hear it, Bagley? Do you hear what it is saying? I cried, stepping in through the doorway. He was lying against the wall, his eyes glazed, half dead with terror. He made a motion of his lips as if to answer me, but no sounds came. Then lifted his hand with a curious imperative movement as if ordering me to be silent and listen. And how long I did so, I cannot tell. It began to have an interest, an exciting hold upon me, which I could not describe. It seemed to call up visibly a scene anyone could understand, a something shut out, restlessly wandering to and fro. Sometimes the voice dropped, as if throwing itself down sometimes wandered off a few paces, growing sharp and clear. Oh, mother, let me in. Oh, mother, mother, let me in. Oh, let me in. Every word was clear to me. No wonder the boy had gone wild with pity. I tried to steady my mind upon Roland, 
upon his conviction that I could do something. But my head swam with the excitement, even when I partially overcame the terror. At last the words died away, and there was a sound of sobs and moaning. I cried out, In the name of God, who are you? with a kind of feeling in my mind that to use the name of God was profane, seeing that I did not believe in ghosts or anything supernatural. But I did it all the same, and waited, my heart giving a leap of terror, lest there should be a reply. Why this should have been, I cannot tell. But I had a feeling that if there was an answer, it would be more than I could bear. But there was no answer. The moaning went on, and then, as if it had been real, the voice rose a little higher, the words recommenced. Oh, mother, let me in! Oh, mother, let me in! With an expression that was heartbreaking to hear. As if it had been real. What do I mean by that? I suppose I got less alarmed as the thing went on. I began to recover the use of my senses. I seemed to explain it all to myself by saying that this had once happened, that it was a recollection of a real scene. Why there should have seemed something quite satisfactory and composing in this explanation, I cannot tell, but so it was. I began to listen almost as if it had been a play, forgetting Bagley, who, I almost think, had fainted, leaning against the wall. I was started out of this strange spectatorship that had fallen upon me by the sudden rush of something which made my heart jump once more, a large black figure in the doorway waving its arms. Come in! Come in! Come in! It shouted out hoarsely at the top of a deep bass voice, and then poor Bagley fell down senseless across the threshold. He was less sophisticated than I. He had not been able to bear it any longer. I took him for something supernatural, as he took me, and it was some time before I awoke to the necessities of the moment. I remembered only after that from the time I began to give my attention to the man, I heard the other voice no more. It was some time before I brought him to. It must have been a strange scene, the lantern making a luminous spot in the darkness, the man's white face lying on the black earth, I over him, doing what I could for him. Probably I should have been thought to be murdering him had anyone seen us. When at last I succeeded in pouring a little brandy down his throat, he sat up and looked about him wildly. "'What's up?' he said. Then, recognizing me, tried to struggle to his feet with a faint. "'Beg your pardon, Colonel.' I got him home as best I could— making him lean upon my arm. The great fellow was as weak as a child. Fortunately, he did not for some time remember what had happened. From the time Bagley fell, the voice had stopped, and all was still. "'You've got an epidemic in your house, Colonel,' Simpson said to me next morning. "'What's the meaning of it all?' Here's your butler raving about a voice. This will never do, you know, and so far as I can make out, you are in it, too. Yes, I am in it, doctor. I thought I had better speak to you. Of course, you are treating Roland all right, but the boy is not raving. He is as sane as you or me. It is all true. As sane as I or you? I never thought the boy insane. He's got cerebral excitement, fever. I don't know what you've got. There's something very queer about the look of your eyes. Come, said I. 
You can't put us all to bed, you know. You had better listen and hear the symptoms in full. The doctor shrugged his shoulders, but he listened to me patiently. He did not believe a word of the story, that was clear, but he heard it all from beginning to end. My dear fellow, he said, the boy told me just the same. It's an epidemic. When one person falls a victim to this sort of thing, it's as safe as can be. There's always two or three. Then how do you account for it? I said. Oh, account for it? That's a different matter. There's no accounting for the freaks our brains are subject to. If it's delusion, if it's some trick of the echoes or the winds, some phonetic disturbance or another. Come with me tonight and judge for yourself, I said. Upon this, he laughed aloud, then said, That's not such a bad idea, but it would ruin me forever if it were known that John Simpson was ghost hunting. There it is, said I. You dart down on us, who are unlearned with your phonetic disturbances, but you daren't examine what the thing really is for fear of being laughed at. That's science. It's not science, it's common sense, said the doctor. The thing has delusion on the front of it. It is encouraging an unwholesome tendency even to examine. What good could come of it? Even if I am convinced, I shouldn't believe. I should have said so yesterday, and I don't want you to be convinced or to believe, said I. If you prove it to be a delusion, I shall be very much obliged to you for one. Come, somebody must go with me. You are cool, said the doctor. You've disabled this poor fellow of yours and made him, on that point, a lunatic for life. And now you want to disable me. But for once I'll do it, to save appearance. If you'll give me a bed, I'll come over after my last rounds. It was agreed that I should meet him at the gate, and that we should visit the scene of last night's occurrences before we came to the house so that nobody might be the wiser. It was scarcely possible to hope that the cause of Bagley's sudden illness should not somehow steal into the knowledge of the servants at least, and it was better that all should be done as quietly as possible. The day seemed to me a very long one. I had to spend a certain part of it with Roland, which was a terrible ordeal for me for what could I say to the boy? The improvement continued, but he was still in a very precarious state, and the trembling vehemence with which he turned to me when his mother left the room filled me with alarm. Father, he said quietly, yes, my boy, I am giving my best attention to it. All is being done that I can do. I have not come to any conclusion yet. I am neglecting nothing you said, I cried. What I could not do was to give his active mind any encouragement to dwell upon the mystery. It was a hard predicament, for some satisfaction had to be given him. He looked at me very wistfully, with the great blue eyes which shone so large and brilliant out of his white and worn face. You must trust me, I said. Yes, father. Father understands, he said to himself, as if to soothe some inward doubt. I left him as soon as I could. He was about the most precious thing I had on earth, and his health my first thought. But yet somehow, in the excitement of this other subject, I put that aside, and preferred not to dwell upon Roland, which was the most curious part of it all. That night at eleven, I met Simpson at the gate. He had come by train, and I let him in gently myself. 
I had been so much absorbed in the coming experiment that I passed the ruins in going to meet him almost without thought, if you can understand that. I had my lantern, and he showed me a coil of taper which he had ready for use. There is nothing like light, he said in his scoffing tone. It was a very still night, scarcely a sound, but not so dark. We could keep the path without difficulty as we went along. As we approached the spot, we could hear a low moaning, broken occasionally by a bitter cry. Perhaps that is your voice, said the doctor. I thought it must be something of the kind. That's a poor brute caught in some of these infernal traps of yours. You'll find it among the bushes somewhere. I said nothing. I felt no particular fear, but a triumphant satisfaction in what was to follow. I led him to the spot where Bagley and I had stood on the previous night. All was silent as a winter night could be, so silent that we heard far off the sound of the horses in the stables, the shutting of a window at the house. Simpson lighted his taper and went peering about, poking into all the corners. We looked like two conspirators lying in wait for some unfortunate traveler, but not a sound broke the quiet. The moaning had stopped before we came up. A star or two shone over us in the sky, looking down as if surprised at our strange proceedings. Dr. Simpson did nothing but utter subdued laughs under his breath. I thought as much, he said. It is just the same with tables and all other kinds of ghostly apparatus. A skeptic's presence stops everything. When I am present, nothing ever comes off. How long do you think it will be necessary to stay here? Oh, I don't complain. Only when you are satisfied, I am. Quite. I will not deny that I was disappointed beyond measure by this result. It made me look like a credulous fool. It gave the doctor such a pull over me as nothing else could. I should point all his morals for years to come, and his materialism, his skepticism, would be increased beyond endurance. It seems indeed, I said, that there is to be no manifestation, he said laughing. That is what all the mediums say, no manifestations, in consequence of the presence of an unbeliever. His laugh sounded very uncomfortable to me in the silence, and it was now near midnight. But that laugh seemed the signal. Before it died away, the moaning we had heard before was resumed. It started from some distance off and came towards us, nearer and nearer, like someone walking along and moaning to himself. There could be no idea now that it was a hare caught in a trap. The approach was slow, like that of a weak person, with little halts and pauses. We heard it coming along the grass straight towards the vacant doorway. Simpson had been a little startled by the first sound. He said hastily, That child has no business to be out so late. But he felt, as well as I, that this was no child's voice. As it came nearer, he grew silent, and going to the doorway with his taper, stood looking out towards the sound. The taper, being unprotected, blew about in the night air, though there was scarcely any wind. I threw the light of my lantern steady and white across the same space. It was in a blaze of light in the midst of the blackness. A little icy thrill had gone over me at the first sound, but as it came close I confess that my only feeling was satisfaction. The scoffer could scoff no more. The light touched his own face and showed a very perplexed countenance. 
If he was afraid, he concealed it with great success. But he was perplexed. And then all that had happened on the previous night was enacted once more. It fell strangely upon me with a sense of repetition. Every cry, every sob seemed the same as before. I listened almost without any emotion at all in my own person, thinking of its effect upon Simpson. He maintained a very bold front on the whole. All that coming and going of the voice was, if our ears could be trusted, exactly in front of the vacant blank doorway, blazing full of light, which caught and shone in the glistening leaves of the great hollies at a little distance. Not a rabbit could have crossed the turf without being seen, but there was nothing. After a time, Simpson, with a certain caution and bodily reluctance, as it seemed to me, went out with his roll of taper into the space. His figure showed against the holly in full outline. Just at this moment the voice sank, as was its custom, and seemed to fling itself down at the door. Simpson recoiled violently, as if someone had come up against him, then turned and held his taper low, as if examining something. Do you see anybody? I cried in a whisper, feeling the chill of nervous panic steal over me at this action. It's nothing but a confounded juniper bush, he said. This I knew very well to be nonsense, for the juniper bush was on the other side. He went about after this, round and round, poking his taper everywhere, then returned to me on the inner side of the wall. He scoffed no longer. His face was contracted and pale. How long does this go on? He whispered to me, like a man who does not wish to interrupt someone who is speaking. I had become too much perturbed myself to remark whether the successions and changes of the voice were the same as last night. It suddenly went out in the air, almost as he was speaking, with a soft reiterated sob dying away. If there had been anything to be seen, I should have said that the person was at that moment crouching on the ground close to that door. We walked home very silent afterwards. It was only when we were in sight of the house that I said, What do you think of it? I can't tell what to think of it, he said quickly. He took, though he was a very temperate man, not the claret I was going to offer him, but some brandy from the tray, and swallowed it almost undiluted. Mind you, I don't believe a word of it, he said, when he had lighted his candle. But I can't tell what to think, he turned round to add, when he was halfway upstairs. All of this, however, did me no good with the solution of my problem. I was to help this weeping, sobbing thing, which was already to me as distinct a personality as anything I knew. Or what should I say to Roland? It was on my heart that my boy would die if I could not find some way of helping this creature. You may be surprised that I should speak of it in this way. I did not know if it was a man or woman, but I no more doubted that it was a soul in pain than I doubted my own being. And it was my business to soothe this pain, to deliver it, if that was possible. Was ever such a task given to an anxious father trembling for his only boy? I felt it in my heart, fantastic as it may appear that I must fulfill this somehow, or part with my child. And you may conceive that rather than do that, I was ready to die. But even my dying would not have advanced me, unless by bringing me into the same world with that seeker at the door.
Next morning, Simpson was out before breakfast and came in with evident signs of the damp grass on his boots and a look of worry and weariness, which did not say much for the night he had passed. He improved a little after breakfast and visited his two patients, for Bagley was still an invalid. I went out with him on his way to the train to hear what he had to say about the boy. He is going on very well, he said. There are no complications as yet, but mind you, that's not a boy to be trifled with, Mortimer. Not a word to him about last night. I had to tell him then of my last interview with Roland, and of the impossible demand he had made upon me, by which, though he tried to laugh, he was much discomposed, as I could see. We must just perjure ourselves all round, he said, and swear you exercised it. But the man was too kind-hearted to be satisfied with that. It's frightfully serious for you, Mortimer. I can't laugh as I should like to. I wish I saw a way out of it for your sake. By the way, he added shortly, didn't you notice that juniper bush on the left-hand side? There was one on the right hand of the door. I noticed you made that mistake last night. Mistake, he cried, with a curious low laugh, pulling up the collar of his coat as though he felt the cold. There's no juniper there this morning, left or right. Just go and see. As he stepped into the train, a few minutes after, he looked back upon me and beckoned me for a parting word. I'm coming back tonight, he said. I don't think I had any feeling about this as I turned away from that common bustle of the railway which made my private preoccupations feel so strangely out of date. There had been a distinct satisfaction in my mind before that his skepticism had been so entirely defeated but the more serious part of the matter pressed upon me now. I went straight from the railway to the manse, which stood on a little plateau on the side of the river opposite to the woods of Brentwood. The minister was one of a class which is not so common in Scotland as it used to be. He was a man of good family, well educated in the Scotch way, strong in philosophy, not so strong in Greek, strongest of all in experience, a man who had come across in the course of his life, most people of note that had ever been in Scotland, and who was said to be very sound in doctrine, without infringing the toleration with which old men who are good men are generally endowed. He was old-fashioned, Perhaps he did not think so much about the troublous problems of theology as many of the young men, nor ask himself any hard questions about the confession of faith. But he understood human nature, which is perhaps better. He received me with a cordial welcome. Come away, Colonel Mortimer, he said. I'm all the more glad to see you that I feel it's a good sign for the boy. He's doing well. God be praised, and the Lord bless him and keep him. He has many a poor body's prayers, and that can do nobody harm. He will need them all, Dr. Moncrief, I said, and your counsel, too. And I told him the story, more than I had told Simpson. The old clergyman listened to me with many suppressed exclamations, and at the end the water stood in his eyes. That's just beautiful, he said. I do not mind to have heard anything like it. It's as fine as Burns when he wished deliverance to one. That is prayed for in no kirk. Ay, ay, so he would have you console the poor lost spirit. God bless the boy. 
There's something more than common in that, Colonel Mortimer, and also the faith of him in his father. I would like to put that into a sermon. Then the old gentleman gave me an alarmed look and said, No, no, I was not meaning a sermon, but I must write it down for the children's record. I saw the thought that passed through his mind. Either he thought, or he feared I would think, of a funeral sermon. You may believe this did not make me more cheerful. I can scarcely say that Dr. Moncrief gave me any advice. How could anyone advise on such a subject? But he said, I think I'll come too. I'm an old man. I'm less liable to be frightened than those that are further off the world unseen. It behooves me to think of my own journey there. I've no cut and dry beliefs on the subject. I'll come too, and maybe at the moment the Lord will put into our heads what to do. This gave me a little comfort, more than Simpson had given me. To be clear about the cause of it was not my grand desire. It was another thing that was in my mind, my boy. As for the poor soul at the open door, I had no more doubt, as I have said, of its existence than I had of my own. It was no ghost to me. I knew the creature, and it was in trouble. That was my feeling about it, as it was Roland's. To hear it first was a great shock to my nerves, but not now. A man will get accustomed to anything. But to do something for it was the great problem. How was I to be serviceable to a being that was invisible, that was mortal no longer? Maybe at the moment the Lord will put it into our heads. This is very old-fashioned phraseology, and a week before, most likely, I should have smiled, though always with kindness, at Dr. Moncrief's credulity. But there was a great comfort, whether rational or otherwise I cannot say, in the mere sound of the words. The road to the station and the village lay through the glen, not by the ruins. But though the sunshine and the fresh air, and the beauty of the trees and the sound of the water were all very soothing to the spirits, my mind was so full of my own subject that I could not refrain from turning to the right hand as I got to the top of the glen, and going straight to the place which I may call the scene of all my thoughts. It was lying full in the sunshine like all the rest of the world. The ruined gable looked due east, and in the present aspect of the sun the light streamed down through the doorway as our lantern had done, throwing a flood of light upon the damp grass beyond. There was a strange suggestion in the open door, so futile, a kind of emblem of vanity, all free around so that you could go where you pleased, and yet that semblance of an enclosure. That way of entrance, unnecessary, leading to nothing. And why any creature should pray and weep to get in to nothing, or be kept out by nothing. You could not dwell upon it, or it made your brain go round. I remembered, however, what Simpson said about the juniper, with a little smile on my own mind as to the inaccuracy of recollection which even a scientific man will be guilty of. I could see now the light of my lantern gleaming upon the wet, glistening surface of the spiky leaves at the right hand, and he was ready to go to the stake for it that it was the left. I went round to make sure, and then I saw— what he had said. Right or left, there was no juniper at all. I was confounded by this, 
though it was entirely a matter of detail. Nothing at all. A bush of brambles waving, the grass growing up to the very walls. But, after all, though it gave me a shock for a moment, what did that matter? There were marks as if a number of footsteps had been up and down in front of the door, but these might have been our own steps, and all was bright and peaceful and still. I poked about the other ruin, the larger ruins of the old house, for some time, as I had done before. There were marks upon the grass here and there. I could not call them footsteps all about. But that told for nothing, one way or another. I had examined the ruined rooms closely the first day. They were half filled up with soil and debris, withered brackens and bramble. No refuge for anyone there. It vexed me that Jarvis should see me coming from that spot when he came up to me for his orders. I don't know whether my nocturnal expeditions had got wind among the servants, but there was a significant look in his face. Something in it I felt was like my own sensation when Simpson in the midst of his skepticism was struck dumb. Jarvis felt satisfied that his veracity had been put beyond question. I never spoke to a servant of mine in such a peremptory tone before. I sent him away with a flea in his lug, as the man described it afterwards. Interference of any kind was intolerable to me at such a moment. But what was strangest of all was that I could not face Roland. I did not go up to his room as I would have naturally done at once. This the girls could not understand. They saw there was some mystery in it. Mother is gone to lie down, Agatha said. He has had such a good night. But he wants you so, Papa, cried little Jeanie, always with her two arms embracing mine in a pretty way she had. I was obliged to go at last, but what could I say? I could only kiss him and tell him to keep still, that I was doing all I could. There is something mystical about the patience of a child. It will come out all right, won't it, father? he said. God grant it may. I hope so, Roland. Oh, yes, it will come all right. Perhaps he understood that in the midst of my anxiety I could not stay with him as I should have done otherwise. But the girls were more surprised than it is possible to describe. They looked at me with wondering eyes. If I were ill, Papa, and you only stayed with me a moment, it should break my heart, said Agatha. But the boy had a sympathetic feeling— he knew that of my own will I would not have done it. I shut myself up in the library where I could not rest, but kept pacing up and down like a caged beast. What could I do? And if I could do nothing, what would become of my boy? These were the questions that, without ceasing, pursued each other through my mind. Simpson came out to dinner, and when the house was all still, and most of the servants in bed, we went out and met Dr. Moncrief, as we had appointed, at the head of the glen. Simpson, for his part, was disposed to scoff at the doctor. "'If there are to be any spells, you know, I'll cut the whole concern,' he said. I did not make him any reply. I had not invited him. He could go or come as he pleased. He was very talkative, far more so than suited my humor as we went on. One thing is certain, you know, there must be some human agency, he said. It is all bosh about apparitions. 
I have never investigated the laws of sound to any great extent, and there's a great deal in ventriloquism that we don't know much about. If it's the same to you, I said, I wish you'd keep all that to yourself, Simpson. It doesn't suit my state of mind. Oh, I hope I know how to respect idiosyncrasy, he said. The very tone of his voice irritated me beyond measure. These scientific fellows, I wonder people put up with them as they do, when you have no mind for their cold-blooded confidence. Dr. Moncrief met us about eleven o'clock, the same time as on the previous night. He was a large man, with a venerable countenance and white hair, old but in full vigor, and thinking less of a cold night walk than many a younger man. He had his lantern, as I had. We were fully provided with means of lighting the place, and we were all of us resolute men. We had a rapid consultation as we went up, and the result was that we divided to different posts. Dr. Moncrief remained inside the wall, if you can call that inside, where there was no wall but one. Simpson placed himself on the side next the ruins, so as to intercept any communication with the old house, which was what his mind was fixed upon. I was posted on the other side. To say that nothing could come near without being seen was self-evident. It had been so also on the previous night. Now, with our three lights in the midst of the darkness, the whole place seemed illuminated. Dr. Moncrief's lantern, which was a large one, without any means of shutting up, an old-fashioned lantern with a pierced and ornamental top, shone steadily, the rays shooting out of it upward into the gloom. He placed it on the grass, where the middle of the room, if this had been a room, would have been. The usual effect of the light streaming out of the doorway was prevented by the illumination which Simpson and I on either side supplied. With these differences, everything seemed as on the previous night. And what occurred was exactly the same with the same air of repetition, point for point, as I had formerly remarked. I declare that it seemed to me as if I were pushed against, put aside, by the owner of the voice, as he paced up and down in his trouble. Though these are perfectly futile words, seeing that the stream of light from my lantern, and that from Simpson's taper, lay broad and clear without a shadow, without the smallest break, across the entire breadth of the grass. But just as it threw itself sobbing at the door, I cannot use other words, there suddenly came something which sent the blood coursing through my veins and my heart into my mouth. It was a voice inside the wall, my minister's well-known voice. I would have been prepared for it in any kind of adjuration, but I was not prepared for what I heard. It came out with a sort of stammering, as if too much moved for utterance. Willie, Willie, oh, God preserve us! Is it you? I made a dash round to the other side of the wall. The old minister was standing where I had left him, his shadow thrown vague and large upon the grass by the lantern which stood at his feet. I lifted my own light to see his face. He was very pale, his eyes wet and glistening, his mouth quivering with parted lips. He neither saw nor heard me. His whole being seemed absorbed in anxiety and tenderness. He held out his hands, which trembled, but it seemed to me with eagerness, not fear. He went on speaking all the time. Willie, 
if it is you, and it's you, if it is not a delusion of Satan, Willie lad, why come ye here frightening them that know you not? Why came ye not to me? Your mother's gone with your name on her lips. Do you think she would ever close her door on her own lad? Do you think the Lord will close the door? Ye faint-hearted creature, no, I forbid ye, I forbid ye, cried the old man. The sobbing voice had begun to resume its cries. He made a step forward, calling out the last words in a voice of command. I forbid ye, cry out no more to man. Go home, ye wandering spirit. Go home. Do ye hear me? Me that christened ye, that have struggled with ye, that have wrestled for ye with the Lord? Here the loud tones of his voice sank into tenderness. And her too, poor woman, poor woman. Her you are calling upon. She's no here. You'll find her with the Lord. Go there and seek her, not here. Do you hear me, lad? Go after her there. He'll let you in, though it's late. Man, take heart, if you will lie and sob and greet. Let it be at heaven's gate, and know your poor mother's ruined door. He stopped to get his breath, and the voice had stopped, not as it had done before, when its time was exhausted and all its repetitions said, but with a sobbing catch in the breath as if overruled. Then the minister spoke again. Are you hearing me, Will? Oh, laddie, you've liked the beggarly elements all your days. Be done with them now. Go home to the Father. The Father, are you hearing me? Here the old man sank down upon his knees, his face raised upwards, his hands held up with a tremble in them all white in the light in the midst of the darkness. I resisted as long as I could, though I cannot tell why. Then I, too, dropped upon my knees. Simpson, all the time, stood in the doorway, with an expression in his face such as words could not tell. His under lip dropped, his eyes wild, staring. It seemed to be to him, that image of blank ignorance and wonder, that we were praying. All the time the voice, with a low, arrested sobbing, lay just where he was standing, as I thought. Lord, the minister said, Lord, take him into thy everlasting habitations. The mother he cries to is with thee. Who can open to him but thee? Lord, when is it too late for thee? Or what is too hard for thee? Lord, let that woman there draw him in hour. Let her draw him in hour. I sprang forward to catch something in my arms, that flung itself wildly within the door. The illusion was so strong that I never paused till I felt my forehead graze against the wall and my hands clutch the ground, for there was nobody there to save from falling, as in my foolishness I thought. Simpson held out his hand to me to help me up. He was trembling and cold, his lower lip hanging, his speech almost inarticulate. It's gone, 
he said, stammering. It's gone. As long as I live, I will never forget the shining of the strange lights, the blackness all round, the kneeling figure with all the whiteness of the light concentrated on its white, venerable head and uplifted hands. I never knew how long we stood, like sentinels guarding him at his prayers, but at last the old minister rose from his knees, and standing up at his full height, raised his arms, as the Scotch manner is at the end of a religious service, and solemnly gave the apostolical benediction. To what? To the silent earth, the dark woods, the wide-breathing atmosphere, for we were but spectators gasping an amen. It seemed to me that it must be the middle of the night as we all walked back. It was in reality very late. Dr. Moncrief himself was the first to speak. I must be going, he said. I will go down the glen as I came. But not alone. I am going with you, doctor. Well, I will not oppose it. I am an old man, and agitation wearies more than work. Yes, I'll be thankful of your arm. Tonight, Colonel, you've done me more good turns than one. I pressed his hand on my arm, not feeling able to speak. But Simpson, who turned with us, and who had gone along all this time with his taper flaring in entire unconsciousness, became himself skeptical and cynical. I should like to ask you a question, he said. Do you believe in purgatory, doctor? It's not in the tenets of the church, so far as I know. Sir, said Dr. Moncrief, an old man like me, is sometimes not very sure what he believes. There is just one thing I am certain of, and that is the loving kindness of God. But I thought that was in this life. I am no theologian. Sir, said the old man again, with a tremor in him which I could feel going over all his frame. If I saw a friend of mine within the gates of hell, I would not despair, but his father would take him by the hand still if he cried like you. I allow it is very strange, very strange. I cannot see through it. That there must be human agency, I feel sure. Doctor. What made you decide upon the person and the name? The minister put out his hand with the impatience which a man might show if he were asked how he recognized his brother. Tuts, he said in familiar speech. Then more solemnly, how should I not recognize a person that I know better, far better? Then I know you. Then you saw the man? Dr. Moncrief made no reply. He moved his hand again with a little impatient movement and walked on, leaning heavily on my arm. We parted with him at his own door, where his old housekeeper appeared in great perturbation waiting for him. Hey, me minister! The young gentleman will be worse, she cried. Far from that. Better. God bless him, Dr. Moncrief said. I think if Simpson had begun again to me with his questions, I should have pitched him over the rocks as we returned up the glen. But he was silent by a good inspiration, and the sky was clearer than it had been for many nights shining high over the trees 
with here and there a star faintly gleaming through the wilderness of dark and bare branches. We went up to the boy's room when we went in. There we found the complete hush of rest. My wife looked up out of a doze and gave me a smile. I think he is a great deal better, but you are very late, she said in a whisper, shading the light with her hand that the doctor might see his patient. The boy had got back something like his own color. He woke as we stood all around his bed. His eyes had the happy, half-awakened look of childhood, glad to shut again, yet pleased with the interruption and glimmer of the light. I stooped over him and kissed his forehead, which was moist and cool. All is well, Roland, I said. He looked up at me with a glance of pleasure, and took my hand and laid his cheek upon it, and so went to sleep. For some nights after, I watched among the ruins, spending all the dark hours up to midnight patrolling about the bit of wall which was associated with so many emotions, but I heard nothing and saw nothing beyond the quiet course of nature. Nor, so far as I am aware, has anything been heard again. Dr. Moncrief gave me the history of the youth, whom he never hesitated to name. I did not ask, as Simpson did, how he recognized him. He had been a prodigal, weak, foolish, easily imposed upon, and led away, as people say. All that we had heard had passed actually in life, the doctor said. The young man had come home thus a day or two after his mother died, who was no more than housekeeper in the old house, and distracted with the news had thrown himself down at the door and called upon her to let him in. The old man could scarcely speak of it for tears. He was not terrified, as I had been myself and all the rest of us. It was no ghost, as I fear we all vulgarly considered it to him, but a poor creature whom he knew under these conditions, just as he had known him in the flesh, having no doubt of his identity. And to Roland it was the same. This spirit in pain, if it was a spirit, this voice out of the unseen was a poor fellow creature in misery to be succored and helped out of his trouble to my boy. He spoke to me quite frankly about it when he got better. I knew father would find out some way, he said. And this was when he was strong and well, and all idea that he would turn hysterical or become a seer of visions, had happily passed away. I must add one curious fact, which does not seem to me to have any relation to the above, but which Simpson made great use of, as the human agency which he was determined to find somehow. One Sunday afternoon, Simpson found a little hole, for it was more a hole than a room, entirely hidden under the ivy and ruins, in which there was a quantity of straw laid in a corner, as if someone had made a bed there, and some remains of crusts about the floor. Someone had lodged there, and not very long before he made out. And that this unknown being was the author of all the mysterious sounds we heard, he is convinced. I was puzzled myself. I could not make it out. But I always felt convinced human agency was at the bottom of it. And here it is. And a clever fellow he must have been, the doctor says. There is no argument with men of this kind. Bagley left my service as soon as he got well. He assured me it was no want of respect, but he could not stand 
them kind of things, and the man was so shaken and ghastly that I was glad to give him a present and let him go. For my own part, I made a point of staying out the time, two years, for which I had taken Brentwood, but I did not renew my tenancy. By that time, we had settled and found for ourselves a pleasant home of our own. I must add that when the doctor defies me, I can always bring back gravity to his countenance and a pause in his railing when I remind him of the juniper bush. To me, that was a matter of little importance. I could believe I was mistaken. I did not care about it, one way or other. But on his mind, the effect was different. The miserable voice, the spirit in pain, he could think of as the result of ventriloquism, or reverberation, or anything you please, an elaborate prolonged hoax, executed somehow by the tramp that had found a lodging in the old tower. But the juniper bush staggered him. Things have effects so different on the minds of different men. By Ernest Theodore Amadeus Hoffman, The Deserted House, you know already that I spent the greater part of last summer in X, began Theodore. The many old friends and acquaintances I found there, the free, jovial life, the manifold artistic and intellectual interests, all these combined to keep me in that city. I was happy as never before, and found rich nourishment for my old fondness for wandering alone through the streets, stopping to enjoy every picture in the shop windows, every placard on the walls, or watching the passers-by and choosing some one or the other of them to cast his horoscope secretly to myself. There is one broad avenue leading to the blank gate, and lined with handsome buildings of all descriptions, which is the meeting place of the rich and fashionable world. The shops which occupy the ground floor of the tall palaces are devoted to the trade in articles of luxury, and the apartments above are the dwellings of people of wealth and position. The aristocratic hotels are to be found in this avenue. The palaces of the foreign ambassadors are there, and you can easily imagine that such a street would be the center of the city's life and gaiety. I had wandered through the avenue several times, when one day my attention was caught by a house which contrasted strangely with the others surrounding it. Picture to yourselves a low building, but four windows broad, crowded in between two tall, handsome structures. Its one upper story was a little higher than the tops of the ground floor windows of its neighbors. Its roof was dilapidated, its windows patched with paper, its discolored walls spoke of years of neglect. You can imagine how strange such a house must have looked in this street of wealth and fashion. Looking at it more attentively, I perceived that the windows of the upper story were tightly closed and curtained, and that a wall had been built to hide the windows of the ground floor. The entrance gate, a little to one side, served also as a doorway for the building but I could find no sign of latch, lock, nor even a bell on this gate. I was convinced that the house must be unoccupied, for at whatever hour of the day I happened to be passing, I had never seen the faintest signs of life about it. You all, the good comrades of my youth, know that I have been prone to consider myself a sort of clairvoyant, claiming to have glimpses of a strange world of wonders, a world which you, with your hard common sense, would attempt to deny or laugh away. 
I confess that I have often lost myself in mysteries which after all turned out to be no mysteries at all. And it looked at first as if this was to happen to me in the matter of the deserted house, that strange house which drew my steps and my thoughts to itself with a power that surprised me. But the point of my story will prove to you that I am right in asserting that I know more than you do. Listen now to what I'm about to tell you. One day, at the hour in which the fashionable world is accustomed to promenade up and down the avenue, I stood as usual before the deserted house, lost in thought. Suddenly I felt, without looking up, that someone had stopped beside me, fixing his eyes on me. It was Count P., who told me that the old house contained nothing more mysterious than a cake bakery belonging to the pastry cook, whose handsome shop adjoined the old structure. The windows of the ground floor were walled up to give protection to the ovens and the heavy curtains of the upper story were to keep the sunlight from the wares laid out there. When the Count informed me of this, I felt as if a bucket of cold water had been suddenly thrown over me. But I could not believe in this story of the cake and candy factory. Through some strange freak of the imagination, I felt as a child feels when some fairy tale has been told it to conceal the truth it suspects. I scolded myself for a silly fool, the house remained unaltered in its appearance, and the visions faded in my brain, until one day a chance incident woke them to life again. I was wandering through the avenue as usual, and as I passed the deserted house, I could not resist a hasty glance at its close-curtained upper windows. But as I looked at it, the curtain on the last window near the pastry shop began to move. A hand, an arm, came out from between its folds. I took my opera glass from my pocket and saw a beautifully formed woman's hand on the little finger of which a large diamond sparkled in unusual brilliancy. A rich bracelet glittered on the white rounded arm. The hand set a tall, oddly formed crystal bottle on the window ledge and disappeared again behind the curtain. I stopped as if frozen to stone. A weirdly pleasurable sensation mingled with awe, streamed through my being with the warmth of an electric current. I stared up at the mysterious window, and a sigh of longing arose from the very depths of my heart. When I came to myself again, I was angered to find that I was surrounded by a crowd which stood gazing up at the window with curious faces. I stole away inconspicuously, and the demon of all things prosaic whispered to me that what I had just seen was the rich pastry cook's wife, in her Sunday adornment, placing an empty bottle, used for rose water or the like, on the window sill. Nothing very weird about this. Suddenly a most sensible thought came to me. I turned and entered the shining mirror-walled shop of the pastry cook. Blowing the steaming foam from my cup of chocolate, I remarked, You have a very useful addition to your establishment next door. The man leaned over his counter and looked at me with a questioning smile, as if he did not understand me. I repeated that, in my opinion, he had been very clever to set his bakery in the neighboring house, although the deserted appearance of the building was a strange sight in its contrasting surroundings. Why, sir, began the pastry cook, who told you that the house next door belongs to us? Unfortunately, 
Every attempt on our part to acquire it has been in vain, and I fancy it is all the better so, for there is something queer about the place. You can imagine, dear friends, how interested I became upon hearing these words, and that I begged the man to tell me more about the house. I do not know anything very definite, sir, he said. All that we know for a certainty is that the house belongs to the Countess S., who lives on her estates and has not been to the city for years. This house, so they tell me, stood in its present shape before any of the handsome buildings were raised, which are now the pride of our avenue, and in all these years there has been nothing done to it except to keep it from actual decay. Two living creatures alone dwell there, an aged misanthrope of a steward and his melancholy dog, which occasionally howls at the moon from the back courtyard. According to the general story, the deserted house is haunted. In very truth, my brother, who is the owner of this shop, and myself have often, when our business kept us awake during the silence of the night, heard strange sounds from the other side of the walls. There was a rumbling and a scraping that frightened us both. And not very long ago, we heard one night a strange singing, which I could not describe to you. It was evidently the voice of an old woman but the tones were so sharp and clear, and ran up to the top of the scale in cadences and long trills, the like of which I have never heard before, although I have heard many singers in many lands. It seemed to be a French song, but I am not quite sure of that, for I could not listen long to the mad ghostly singing. It made the hair stand erect on my head and at times, after the street noises are quiet, we can hear deep sighs, sometimes a mad laugh, which seem to come out of the earth. But if you lay your ear to the wall in our back room, you can hear that the noises come from the house next door. He led me into the back room and pointed through the window. And do you see that iron chimney coming out of the wall there? It smokes so heavily sometimes, even in summer, when there are no fires used, that my brother has often quarreled with the old steward about it, fearing danger. But the old man excuses himself by saying that he was cooking his food. Heaven knows what the queer creature may eat, for often, when the pipe is smoking heavily, a strange and queer smell can be smelled all over the house. The glass doors of the shop creaked in opening. The pastry cook hurried into the front room, and when he had nodded to the figure now entering, he threw a meaning glance at me. I understood him perfectly. Who else could this strange guest be but the steward who had charge of the mysterious house. Imagine a thin little man with a face the color of a mummy, with a sharp nose, tight-set lips, green cat's eyes, and a crazy smile. His hair dressed in the old-fashioned style, with a high toupee and a bag at the back, and heavily powdered. He wore a faded old brown coat, which was carefully brushed, gray stockings, and broad, flat-toed shoes with buckles. And imagine further that in spite of his meagerness, this little person is robustly built with huge fists and long, strong fingers, and that he walks into the shop counter with a strong, firm step, smiling his imbecile smile and whining out, A couple of candied oranges, a couple of macaroons, a couple of sugared chestnuts. 
The pastry cook smiled at me and then spoke to the old man. You do not seem to be quite well. Yes, yes, old age, old age, it takes the strength from our limbs. The old man's expression did not change, but his voice went up. Old age? Old age? Lose strength? Grow weak? Oh, ho! And with this he clapped his hands together until the joints cracked and sprang high up into the air until the entire shop trembled and the glass vessels on the walls and counters rattled and shook. But in the same moment, a hideous screaming was heard. The old man had stepped on his black dog, which, creeping in behind him, had laid itself at his feet on the floor. Devilish beast, dog of hell, groaned the old man in his former miserable tone, opening his bag and giving the dog a large macaroon. The dog, which had burst out into a cry of distress that was truly human, was quiet at once, sat down on its haunches, and gnawed at the macaroon like a squirrel. When it had finished its tidbit, the old man had also finished the packing up and putting away of his purchases. Good night, honored neighbor, he spoke taking the hand of the pastry cook and pressing it until the latter cried aloud in pain. The weak old man wishes you a good night, most honorable sir neighbor, he repeated, and then walked from the shop, followed closely by his black dog. The old man did not seem to have noticed me at all. I was quite dumbfounded in my astonishment. There, you see, began the pastry cook. This is the way he acts when he comes in here, two or three times a month it is. But I can get nothing out of him except the fact that he was the former valet of Count S., that he is now in charge of this house here, and that every day, for many years now, he expects the arrival of his master's family. The hour was now come when fashion demanded that the elegant world of the city should assemble in this attractive shop. The doors opened incessantly, the place was thronged, and I could ask no further questions. This much I knew, that Count P.'s information about the ownership and the use of the house were not correct. Also, that the old steward, in spite of his denial, was not living alone there, and that some mystery was hidden behind its discolored walls. How should I combine the story of the strange and gruesome singing with the appearance of the beautiful arm at the window? That arm could not be part of the wrinkled body of an old woman. The singing, according to the pastry cook's story, could not come from the throat of a blooming and youthful maiden. I decided in favor of the arm, as it was easy to explain to myself that some trick of acoustics had made the voice sound sharp and old or that it had appeared so only in the pastry cook's fear-distorted imagination. Then I thought of the smoke, the strange odors, the oddly formed crystal bottle that I had seen, and soon the vision of a beautiful creature held enthralled by fatal magic stood as if alive before my mental vision. The old man became a wizard, who, perhaps quite independently of the family he served, had set up his devil's kitchen in the deserted house. My imagination had begun to work, and in my dreams that night I saw clearly the hand with the sparkling diamond on its finger, the arm with the shining bracelet. 
from out thin gray mists there appeared a sweet face with sadly imploring blue eyes, then the entire exquisite figure of a beautiful girl. And I saw that what I had thought was mist was the fine steam flowing out in circles from a crystal bottle held in the hands of the vision. Oh, fairest creature of my dreams, I cried in rapture. Reveal to me where thou art, what it is that enthralls thee. Ah, I know it. It is black magic that holds thee captive. Thou art the unhappy slave of that malicious devil who wanders about brown-clad and bewigged in pastry shops, scattering their wares with his unholy springing and feeding his demon dog on macaroons, after they have howled out a satanic measure in five-eighth time. Oh, I know it all, thou fair and charming vision. The diamond is the reflection of the fire of thy heart. But that bracelet about thine arm is a link of the chain which the brown-clad one says is a magnetic chain. Do not believe it, O oh glorious one, See how it shines in the blue fire from the retort. One moment more, and thou art free. And now, O oh maiden, open thy rosebud mouth and tell me. In this moment, a gnarled fist leaped over my shoulder and clutched at the crystal bottle, which sprang into a thousand pieces in the air. With a faint, sad moan, the charming vision faded into the blackness of the night. When morning came to put an end to my dreaming, I hurried through the avenue, seeking the deserted house as usual, and I saw something glistening in the last window of the upper story. Coming nearer, I noticed that the outer blind had been drawn quite up and the inner curtain slightly opened. The sparkle of a diamond met my eye. Oh, kind heaven, the face of my dream looked at me, gently imploring from above the rounded arm on which her head was resting. But how was it possible to stand still in the moving crowd without attracting attention? Suddenly I caught sight of the benches placed in the gravel walk in the center of the avenue and I saw that one of them was directly opposite the house. I sprang over to it, and leaning over its back, I could stare up at the mysterious window undisturbed. Yes, it was she, the charming maiden of my dream. But her eye did not seem to seek me, as I had at first thought. Her glance was cold and unfocused and had it not been for an occasional motion of the hand and arm, I might have thought that I was looking at a cleverly painted picture. I was so lost in my adoration of the mysterious being in the window, so aroused and excited throughout all my nerve centers, that I did not hear the shrill voice of an Italian street hawker who had been offering me his wares for some time. Finally, he touched me on the arm. I turned hastily and commanded him to let me alone. But he did not cease his entreaties, asserting that he had earned nothing today and begging me to buy some small trifle from him. Full of impatience to get rid of him, I put my hand in my pocket, with the words, I have more beautiful things here. He opened the under drawer of his box and held out to me a little round pocket mirror. In it, as he held it up before my face, I could see the deserted house behind me, the window, and the sweet face of my vision there. I bought the little mirror at once, for I saw that it would make it possible for me to sit comfortable 
and inconspicuously, and yet watch the window. The longer I looked at the reflection in the glass, the more I fell captive to a weird and quite indescribable sensation, which I might almost call a waking dream. It was as if a lethargy had lamed my eyes, holding them fastened on the glass beyond my power to loosen them. And now at last the beautiful eyes of the fair vision looked at me, her glance sought mine and shone deep down into my heart. You have a pretty little mirror there, said a voice beside me. I awoke from my dream and was not a little confused when I saw smiling faces looking at me from either side. Several persons had sat down upon the bench, and it was quite certain that my staring into the window and probably my strange expression had afforded them great cause for amusement. "'You have a pretty little mirror there,' repeated the man, as I did not answer him. His glance said more, and asked without words the reason of my staring so oddly into the little glass. He was an elderly man, neatly dressed, and his voice and eyes were so full of good nature that I could not refuse him my confidence. I told him that I had been looking in the mirror at the picture of a beautiful maiden who was sitting at a window of the deserted house. I went even farther. I asked the old man if he had not seen the fair face himself. Over there? In the old house? In the last window? He repeated my questions in a tone of surprise. Yes, yes, I exclaimed. The old man smiled and answered, Well, well, that was a strange delusion. My old eyes. Thank heaven for my old eyes. Yes, yes, sir. I saw a pretty face in the window there, with my own eyes, but it seemed to me to be an excellently well-painted oil portrait. I turned quickly and looked toward the window. There was no one there, and the blind had been pulled down. Yes, continued the old man. Yes, sir. Now it is too late to make sure of the matter, for just now the servant, who, as I know, lives there alone in the house of the Countess S., took the picture away from the window after he had dusted it and let down the blinds. Was it then surely a picture? I asked again in bewilderment. You can trust my eyes replied the old man. The optical delusion was strengthened by your seeing only the reflection in the mirror. And when I was in your years, it was easy enough for my fancy to call up the picture of a beautiful maiden. But the hand and arm moved, I exclaimed. Oh, yes, they moved, indeed, they moved said the old man, smiling, as he patted me on the shoulder. Then he arose to go, and bowing politely, closed his remarks with the words, Beware of mirrors which can lie so vividly. Your obedient servant, sir. You can imagine how I felt when I saw that he looked upon me as a foolish fantast. I hurried home full of anger and disgust, and promised myself that I would not think of the mysterious house. But I placed the mirror on my dressing table, that I might bind my cravat before it. And thus it happened one day, when I was about to utilize it for this important business, that its glass seemed dull, and that I took it up and breathed on it to rub it bright again. My heart seemed to stand still, every fiber in me trembled in delightful awe. Yes, that is all the name I can find for the feeling that came over me when, as my breath clouded the little mirror, 
I saw the beautiful face of my dreams arise and smile at me through blue mists. You laugh at me? You look upon me as an incorrigible dreamer? Think what you will about it. The fair face looked at me from out of the mirror. But as soon as the clouding vanished, the face vanished in the brightened glass. I will not weary you with a detailed recital of my sensations the next few days. I will only say that I repeated again the experiments with the mirror, sometimes with success, sometimes without. When I had not been able to call up the vision, I would run to the deserted house and stare up at the windows, but I saw no human being anywhere about the building. I lived only in thoughts of my vision. Everything else seemed indifferent to me. I neglected my friends and my studies. The tortures in my soul passed over into, or rather mingled with, physical sensations which frightened me, and which at last made me fear for my reason. One day, after an unusually severe attack, I put my little mirror in my pocket and hurried to the home of Dr. K., who was noted for his treatment of those diseases of the mind out of which physical diseases so often grow. I told him my story, I did not conceal the slightest incident from him, and I implored him to save me from the terrible fate which seemed to threaten me. He listened to me quietly but I read astonishment in his glance. Then he said, The danger is not as near as you believe, and I think that I may say that it can be easily prevented. You are undergoing an unusual psychical disturbance, beyond a doubt. But the fact that you understand that some evil principle seems to be trying to influence you gives you a weapon by which you can combat it. Leave your little mirror here with me and force yourself to take up with some work which will afford scope for all your mental energy. Do not go to the avenue, work all day from early to late. Then take a long walk and spend your evenings in the company of your friends. Eat heartily and drink heavy, nourishing wines. You see, I am endeavoring to combat your fixed idea of the face in the window of the deserted house and in the mirror by diverting your mind to other things and by strengthening your body. You yourself must help me in this. I was very reluctant to part with my mirror. The physician, who had already taken it, seemed to notice my hesitation. He breathed upon the glass, and holding it up to me, he asked, Do you see anything? Nothing at all, I answered, for so it was. Now, breathe on the glass yourself said the physician, laying the mirror in my hands. I did as he requested. There was the vision even more clearly than ever before. There she is, I cried aloud. The physician looked into the glass and then said, I cannot see anything. That I will confess to you that when I looked into this glass, a queer shiver overcame me passing away almost at once. Now, do it once more. I breathed upon the glass again, and the physician laid his hand upon the back of my neck. The face appeared again, and the physician, looking into the mirror over my shoulder, turned pale. Then he took the little glass from my hands, looked at it attentively, and locked it into his desk, returning to me after a few minutes' silent thought. Follow my instructions strictly, he said. I must confess to you that I do not yet understand those moments of your vision, but I hope 
to be able to tell you more about it very soon. Difficult as it was to me, I forced myself to live absolutely according to the doctor's orders. I soon felt the benefit of the steady work and the nourishing diet, and yet I was not free from those terrible attacks, which would come either at noon or, more intensely still, at midnight. Even in the midst of a merry company, in the enjoyment of wine and song, glowing daggers seemed to pierce my heart, and all the strength of my intellect was powerless to resist their might over me. I was obliged to retire and could not return to my friends until I had recovered from my condition of lethargy. It was in one of these attacks, an unusually strong one, that such an irresistible, mad longing for the picture of my dreams came over me, that I hurried out into the street and ran toward the mysterious house. While still at a distance from it, I seemed to see lights shining out through the fast-closed blinds, but when I came nearer, I saw that all was dark. Crazy with my desire, I rushed to the door. It fell back before the pressure of my hand. I stood in the dimly lighted vestibule, enveloped in a heavy, close atmosphere. My heart beat in strange fear and impatience. Then suddenly a long, sharp tone, as from a woman's throat, shrilled through the house. I know not how it happened that I found myself suddenly in a great hall, brilliantly lighted and furnished in old-fashioned magnificence of golden chairs and strange Japanese ornaments. Strongly perfumed incense arose in blue clouds about me. Welcome, welcome, sweet bridegroom. The hour has come, our bridal hour. I heard these words in a woman's voice, and as little as I can tell how I came into the room, just so little do I know how it happened that suddenly a tall, youthful figure, richly dressed, seemed to arise from the blue mists. With a repeated shrill cry, Welcome, sweet bridegroom, she came toward me with outstretched arms and a yellow face, distorted with age and madness, stared into mine. I fell back in terror, but the fiery, piercing glance of her eyes, like the eyes of a snake, seemed to hold me spellbound. I did not seem able to turn my eyes from this terrible old woman. I could not move another step. She came nearer still, and it seemed to me suddenly as if her hideous face were only a thin mask, beneath which I saw the features of the beautiful maiden of my vision. Already I felt the touch of her hands, when suddenly she fell at my feet with a loud scream, and a voice behind me cried, Oh, ho, is the devil playing his tricks with your grace again. To bed, to bed your grace, else there will be blows, mighty blows. I turned quickly and saw the old steward in his nightclothes, swinging a whip above his head. He was about to strike the screaming figure at my feet when I caught at his arm. But he shook me from him, exclaiming, The devil, sir, that old Satan would have murdered you if I had not come to your aid. Get away from here at once. I rushed from the hall and sought in vain in the darkness for the door of the house. Behind me I heard the hissing blows of the whip and the old woman's screams. I drew breath to call aloud for help when suddenly the ground gave way under my feet. I fell down a short flight of stairs, bringing up with such force against a door at the bottom that it sprang open, 
and I measured my length on the floor of a small room. From the hastily vacated bed, and from the familiar brown coat hanging over a chair, I saw that I was in the bedchamber of the old steward. There was a trampling on the stair, and the old man himself entered hastily, throwing himself at my feet. "'By all the saints, sir,' he entreated with folded hands, "'whoever you may be, and however her grace, that old Satan of a witch, has managed to entice you to this house, do not speak to anyone of what has happened here. It will cost me my position. Her crazy excellency has been punished.' and is bound fast in her bed. Sleep well, good sir, sleep softly and sweetly. It is a warm and beautiful July night. There is no moon, but the stars shine brightly. A quiet good night to you. While talking, the old man had taken up a lamp, had led me out of the basement, pushed me out of the house door, and locked it behind me. I hurried home quite bewildered, and you can imagine that I was too much confused by the gruesome secret to be able to form any explanation of it in my own mind for the first few days. Only this much was certain, that I was now free from the evil spell that had held me captive so long. All my longing for the magic vision in the mirror had disappeared, and the memory of the scene in the deserted house was like the recollection of an unexpected visit to a madhouse. It was evident beyond a doubt that the steward was the tyrannical guardian of a crazy woman of noble birth whose condition was to be hidden from the world. But the mirror? and all the other magic? Listen, and I will tell you more about it. Some few days later, I came upon Count P. at an evening entertainment. He drew me to one side and said with a smile, Do you know that the secrets of our deserted house are beginning to be revealed? I listened with interest, but... Before the Count could say any more, the doors of the dining-room were thrown open, and the company proceeded to the table. Quite lost in thought at the words I had just heard, I had given a young lady my arm, and had taken my place mechanically in the ceremonious procession. I led my companion to the seats arranged for us, and then turned to look at her for the first time. The vision of my mirror stood before me, feature for feature. There was no deception possible. I trembled to my innermost heart, as you can imagine. But I discovered that there was not the slightest echo even in my heart of the mad desire which had ruled me so entirely when my breath drew out the magic picture from the glass. My astonishment, or rather my terror, must have been apparent in my eyes. The girl looked at me in such surprise that I endeavored to control myself sufficiently to remark that I must have met her somewhere before. Her short answer, to the effect that this could hardly be possible, as she had come to the city only yesterday for the first time in her life, bewildered me still more and threw me into an awkward silence. The sweet glance from her gentle eyes brought back my courage, and I began a tentative exploring of this new companion's mind. I found that I had before me a sweet and delicate being, suffering from some psychic trouble. At a particularly merry turn of the conversation, when I would throw in a daring word like a dash of pepper, she would smile, but her smile was pained, as if a wound had been touched. "'You are not very merry tonight, Countess. Was it the visit this morning?' 
An officer sitting near us had spoken these words to my companion, but before he could finish his remarks, his neighbor had grasped him by the arm and whispered something in his ear, while the lady at the other side of the table, with glowing cheeks and angry eyes, began to talk loudly of the opera she had heard last evening. Tears came to the eyes of the girl sitting beside me. Am I not foolish? She turned to me. A few moments before, she had complained of headache. Merely the usual evidences of a nervous headache, I answered, in an easy tone. And there is nothing better for it than the merry spirit which bubbles in the foam of this poet's nectar. With these words, I filled her champagne glass, and she sipped at it as she threw me a look of gratitude. Her mood brightened, and all would have been well had I not touched a glass before me with unexpected strength, arousing from it a shrill, high tone. My companion grew deadly pale, and I myself felt a sudden shiver for the sound had exactly the tone of the mad woman's voice in the deserted house. While we were drinking coffee, I made an opportunity to get to the side of Count P. He understood the reason for my movement. Do you know that your neighbor is Countess Edwina S.? And do you know also that it is her mother's sister who lives in the deserted house, incurably mad for many years? This morning both mother and daughter went to see the unfortunate woman. The old steward, the only person who is able to control the countess in her outbreaks, is seriously ill and they say that the sister has finally revealed the secret to Dr. K. Dr. K. was the physician to whom I had turned in my own anxiety, and you can well imagine that I hurried to him as soon as I was free, and told him all that had happened to me in the last days. I asked him to tell me as much as he could about the mad woman for my own peace of mind, and this is what I learned from him under promise of secrecy. Angelica, Countess Z, thus the doctor began, had already passed her thirtieth year, but was still in full possession of great beauty, when Count S., although much younger than she, became so fascinated by her charm that he wooed her with ardent devotion and followed her to her father's home to try his luck there. But scarcely had the Count entered the house, scarcely had he caught sight of Angelica's younger sister, Gabrielle, when he awoke as from a dream. The elder sister appeared faded and colorless beside Gabrielle, whose beauty and charm so enthralled the Count that he begged her hand of her father. Count Z gave his consent easily, as there was no doubt of Gabriel's feelings towards her suitor. Angelica did not show the slightest anger at her lover's faithlessness. He believes that he has forsaken me, the foolish boy, he does not perceive that he was but my toy, a toy of which I had tired. Thus she spoke in proud scorn, and not a look or an action on her part belied her words. But after the ceremonious betrothal of Gabrielle to Count S., Angelica was seldom seen by the members of her family. She did not appear at the dinner table and it was said that she spent most of her time walking alone in the neighboring wood. A strange occurrence disturbed the monotonous quiet of life in the castle. The hunters of Count Z, assisted by peasants from the village, had captured a band of gypsies 
who were accused of several robberies and murders which had happened recently in the neighborhood. The men were brought to the castle courtyard, fettered together on a long chain, while the women and children were packed on a cart. Noticeable among the last was a tall, haggard old woman of terrifying aspect, wrapped from head to foot in a red shawl. She stood upright in the cart, and in an imperious tone demanded that she should be allowed to descend. The guards were so awed by her manner and appearance that they obeyed her at once. Count Z came down to the courtyard and commanded that the gang should be placed in the prisons under the castle. Suddenly, Countess Angelica rushed out of the door, her hair all loose, fear and anxiety in her pale face. Throwing herself on her knees, she cried in a piercing voice, Let these people go! Let these people go! They're innocent! Father, let these people go! If you shed one drop of their blood, I will pierce my heart with this knife. The countess swung a shining knife in the air and then sank swooning to the ground. Yes, my beautiful darling, my golden child, I knew you would not let them hurt us, shrilled the old woman in red. She cowered beside the countess and pressed disgusting kisses to her face and breast, murmuring crazy words. She took from out the recesses of her shawl a little vial in which a tiny goldfish seemed to swim in some silver-clear liquid. She held the vial to the countess's heart. The latter regained consciousness immediately. When her eyes fell on the gypsy woman, she sprang up, clasped the old creature ardently in her arms, and hurried with her into the castle. Count Z, Gabrielle, and her lover, who had come out during this scene, watched it in astonished awe. The gypsies appeared quite indifferent. They were loosed from their chains and taken separately to the prisons. Next morning, Count Z called the villagers together. The gypsies were led before them, and the Count announced that he had found them to be innocent of the crimes of which they were accused, and that he would grant them free passage through his domains. To the astonishment of all present, their fetters were struck off, and they were set at liberty. The red-shawled woman was not among them. It was whispered that the gypsy captain— recognizable from the golden chain about his neck and the red feather in his high Spanish hat, had paid a secret visit to the Count's room the night before. But it was discovered, a short time after the release of the gypsies, that they were indeed guiltless of the robberies and murders that had disturbed the district. The date set for Gabrielle's wedding approached. One day, to her great astonishment, she saw several large wagons in the courtyard being packed high with furniture, clothing, linen, with everything necessary for a complete household outfit. The wagons were driven away, and the following day Count Z explained that, for many reasons, he had thought it best to grant Angelica's odd request that she be allowed to set up her own establishment in his house in X. He had given the house to her and had promised her that no member of the family, not even he himself, should enter it without her express permission. He added also that, at her urgent request, he had permitted his own valet to accompany her, to take charge of her household. When the wedding festivities were over, Count S. and his bride departed for their home, where they spent a year in cloudless happiness. Then the Count's health failed mysteriously, 
It was as if some secret sorrow gnawed at his vitals, robbing him of joy and strength. All efforts of his young wife to discover the source of his trouble were fruitless. At last, when the constantly recurring fainting spells threatened to endanger his very life, he yielded to the entreaties of his physicians and left his home, ostensibly for Pisa. His young wife was prevented from accompanying him by the delicate condition of her own health. And now, said the doctor, the information given me by Countess S. became, from this point on, so rhapsodical that a keen observer only could guess at the true coherence of the story. Her baby, a daughter, born during her husband's absence, was spirited away from the house, and all search for it was fruitless. Her grief at this loss deepened to despair when she received a message from her father stating that her husband, whom all believed to be in Pisa, had been found dying of heart trouble in Angelica's home in X, and that Angelica herself had become a dangerous maniac. The old count added that all this horror had so shaken his own nerves that he feared he would not long survive it. As soon as Gabrielle was able to leave her bed, she hurried to her father's castle. One night, prevented from sleeping by visions of the loved ones she had lost, she seemed to hear a faint crying, like that of an infant, before the door of her chamber. Lighting her candle, she opened the door. Great heaven! There cowered the old gypsy woman, wrapped in her red shawl, staring up at her with eyes that seemed already glazing in death. In her arms she held a little child, whose crying had aroused the countess. Gabrielle's heart beat high with joy. It was her child, her lost daughter. She snatched the infant from the gypsy's arms, just as the woman fell at her feet, lifeless. The countess's screams awoke the house, but the gypsy was quite dead, and no effort to revive her met with success. The old count hurried to X to endeavor to discover something that would throw light upon the mysterious disappearance and reappearance of the child. Angelica's madness had frightened away all her female servants. The valet alone remained with her. She appeared at first to have become quite calm and sensible, but when the Count told her the story of Gabrielle's child, she clapped her hands and laughed aloud, crying, Did the little darling arrive? You buried her, you say? How the feathers of the gold pheasant shine in the sun. Have you seen the green lion with the fiery blue eyes? Horrified, the Count perceived that Angelica's mind was gone beyond a doubt, and he resolved to take her back with him to his estates, in spite of the warnings of his old valet. At the mere suggestion of removing her from the house, Angelica's ravings increased to such an extent as to endanger her own life and that of the others. When a lucid interval came again, Angelica entreated her father, with many tears, to let her live and die in the house she had chosen. Touched by her terrible trouble, he granted her request. Although he believed the confession which slipped from her lips during this scene to be a fantasy of her madness, she told him that Count S. had returned to her arms, and that the child which the gypsy had taken to her father's house was the fruit of their love. The rumor went abroad in the city that Count Z. had taken the unfortunate woman to his home but the truth was that she remained hidden in the deserted house under the care of the valet. 
Count Z died a short time ago, and Countess Gabrielle came here with her daughter Edwina to arrange some family affairs. It was not possible for her to avoid seeing her unfortunate sister. Strange things must have happened during this visit. But the countess has not confided anything to me, saying merely that she had found it necessary to take the mad woman away from the old valet. It had been discovered that he had controlled her outbreaks by means of force and physical cruelty, and that also, allured by Angelica's assertions that she could make gold. He had allowed himself to assist her in her weird operations. It would be quite unnecessary, thus the physician ended his story, to say anything more to you about the deeper inward relationship of all these strange things. It is clear to my mind that it was you who brought about the catastrophe. A catastrophe which will mean recovery or speedy death for the sick woman. And now I will confess to you that I was not a little alarmed, horrified even, to discover that, when I had set myself in magnetic communication with you by placing my hand on your neck, I could see the picture in the mirror with my own eyes. We both know now. That the reflection in the glass was the face of Countess Edwina. I repeat Doctor K's words in saying that, to my mind also, there is no further comment that can be made on all these facts. I consider it equally unnecessary to discuss at any further length with you now the mysterious relationship between Angelica, Edwina. The old valet and myself, a relationship which seemed the work of a malicious demon who was playing his tricks with us. I will add only that I left the city soon after all these events, driven from the place by an oppression I could not shake off. The uncanny sensation left me suddenly a month or so later. Giving way to a feeling of intense relief that flowed through all my veins with the warmth of an electric current, I am convinced that this change within me came about in the moment when the mad woman died. By Erkman Shatrain, the, the mysterious, mysterious sketch. sketch. Opposite the chapel of Saint Sabal in Nuremberg. At the corner of Trabus Street, there stands a little tavern, tall and narrow, with a toothed gable and dusty windows, whose roof is surmounted by a plaster virgin. It was there that I spent the unhappiest days of my life. I had gone to Nuremberg to study the old German masters, but in default of ready money, I had to paint portraits and such. Portraits, fat old women with their cats on their laps, big wigged aldermen, burgomasters in three-cornered hats, all horribly bright with ochre and vermilion. From portraits, I descended to sketches, and from sketches to silhouettes. Nothing is more annoying than to have your landlord come to you every day with pinched lips, shrill voice, and impudent manner to say, "Well, sir, how soon are you going to pay me? Do you know how much your bill is? No, that doesn't worry you. You eat, drink, and sleep calmly enough. God feeds the sparrows." Your bill now amounts to two hundred florins and ten kreutzers. It is not worth talking about. Those who have not heard anyone talk in this way can form no idea of it. Love of art, imagination, and the sacred enthusiasm for the beautiful are blasted by the breath of such an attack. You become awkward and timid. 
All your energy evaporates as well as your feeling of personal dignity, and you bow respectfully at a distance to the burgomaster Schneegans. One night, not having a sou as usual, and threatened with imprisonment by this worthy Mr. Rapp, I determined to make him a bankrupt by cutting my throat. Seated on my narrow bed, opposite the window, in this agreeable mood, I gave myself up to a thousand philosophical reflections more or less comforting. What is man? I asked myself. An omnivorous animal, his jaws provided with canines and sizers and molars prove it. The canines are made to tear meat, the incisors to bite fruits, and the molars to masticate, grind, and triturate animal and vegetable substances that are pleasant to smell and to taste. But when he has nothing to masticate, this being is an absurdity in nature, a superfluity, a fifth wheel to the coach. Such were my reflections. I dared not open my razor for fear that the invincible force of my logic would inspire me with the courage to make an end of it all. After having argued so finely, I blew out my candle, postponing the sequel till the morrow. That abominable rap had completely stupefied me. I could do nothing but silhouettes and my sole desire was to have some money to rid myself of his odious presence. But on this night a singular change came over my mind. I awoke about one o'clock, I lit my lamp, and enveloping myself in my gray gabardine, I drew upon the paper a rapid sketch after the Dutch school, something strange and bizarre, which had not the slightest resemblance to my ordinary conceptions. Imagine a dreary courtyard enclosed by high, dilapidated walls. These walls are furnished with hooks, seven or eight feet from the ground. You see, at a glance, that it is a butchery. On the left, there extends a lattice structure. You perceive through it a quartered beef suspended from the roof by enormous pulleys. Great pools of blood run over the flagstones and unite in a ditch full of refuse. The light falls from above, between the chimneys where the weathercocks stand out from a bit of the sky the size of your hand, and the roofs of the neighboring houses throw bold shadows from story to story. At the back of this place is a shed. Beneath the shed, a pile of wood, and upon the pile of wood, some ladders, a few bundles of straw, some coils of rope, a chicken coop, and an old dilapidated rabbit hutch. How did these heterogeneous details suggest themselves to my imagination? I don't know. I had no reminiscences and yet every stroke of the pencil seemed the result of observation, and strange because it was all so true. Nothing was lacking. But on the right, one corner of the sketch remained a blank. I did not know what to put there. Something suddenly seemed to writhe there, to move. Then I saw a foot, the sole of a foot. Notwithstanding this improbable position, I followed my inspiration without reference to my own criticism. This foot was joined to a leg. Over this leg, stretched out with effort, there soon floated the skirt of a dress. In short, there appeared by degrees an old woman, pale, disheveled, and wasted, thrown down at the side of a well, and struggling to free herself from a hand that clutched her throat. It was a murder scene that I was drawing. The pencil fell from my hand. This woman, 
in the boldest attitude, with her thighs bent on the curb of the well, her face contracted by terror, and her two hands grasping the murderer's arm frightened me. I could not look at her, but the man, he, the person to whom that arm belonged, I could not see him. It was impossible for me to finish the sketch. I am tired, I said, my forehead dripping with perspiration. There is only this figure to do. I will finish it tomorrow. It'll be easy then. And again I went to bed, thoroughly frightened by my vision. The next morning I got up very early. I was dressing in order to resume my interrupted work when two little knocks were heard on my door. Come in. The door opened. An old man, tall, thin, and dressed in black, appeared on the threshold. This man's face, his eyes set close together, and his large nose like the beak of an eagle, surmounted by a high bony forehead, had something severe about it. He bowed to me gravely. Mr. Christian Venius, the painter, said he. That is my name, sir. He bowed again, adding, The Baron Frederick van Sprechtal. The appearance of the rich amateur, Van Sprechtal, judge of the criminal court, in my poor lodging greatly disturbed me. I could not help throwing a stealthy glance at my old worm-eaten furniture, my damp hangings, and my dusty floor. I felt humiliated by such dilapidation. But Van Sprechtal did not seem to take any account of these details, and sitting down at my little table, Mr. Venius, he resumed, I come. But at this instance, his glance fell upon the unfinished sketch. He did not finish his phrase. I was sitting on the edge of my little bed, and the sudden attention that this personage bestowed upon one of my productions made my heart beat with an indefinable apprehension. At the end of a minute, Van Sprechtal lifted his head. Are you the author of that sketch? he asked me with an intent look. Yes, sir. What is the price of it? I never sell my sketches. It is the plan for a picture. Ah, said he, picking up the paper with the tips of his long yellow fingers. He took a lens from his waistcoat pocket and began to study the design in silence. The sun was now shining obliquely into the garret. Van Sprechtal never said a word. The hook of his immense nose increased, his heavy eyebrows contracted, and his long pointed chin took a turn upward, making a thousand little wrinkles in his long thin cheeks. The silence was so profound that I could distinctly hear the plaintive buzzing of a fly that had been caught in a spider's web. And the dimensions of this picture, Mr. Venius, he said, without looking at me. Three feet by four. The price? Fifty ducats. Van Sprechtal laid the sketch on the table and drew from his pocket a large purse of green silk shaped like a pear. He drew the rings of it. Fifty. De ducats, said he. Here they are. I was simply dazzled. The baron rose and bowed to me, and I heard his big ivory-headed cane resounding on each step until he reached the bottom of the stairs. Then, recovering from my stupor, I suddenly remembered that I had not thanked him, and I flew down the five flights like lightning. But when I reached the bottom, I looked to the right, 
and left. The street was deserted. Well, I said, this is strange. And I went upstairs again, all out of breath. The surprising way in which Van Sprechdal had appeared to me threw me into deep wonderment. Yesterday, I said to myself, as I contemplated the pile of ducats glittering in the sun, yesterday I formed the wicked intention of cutting my throat, all for the want of a few miserable florins, and now today fortune has showered them from the clouds. Indeed, it was fortunate that I did not open my razor, and, if the same temptation ever comes to me again, I will take care to wait until the morrow. After making these judicious reflections, I sat down to finish the sketch. Four strokes of the pencil, and it would be finished. But here an incomprehensible difficulty awaited me. It was impossible for me to take those four sweeps of the pencil. I had lost the thread of my inspiration, and the mysterious personage no longer stood out in my brain. I tried in vain to evoke him, to sketch him, and to recover him. He no more accorded with the surroundings than with a figure by Raphael in a ten years in kitchen. I broke out into a profuse perspiration. At this moment, Rapp opened the door without knocking, according to his praiseworthy custom. His eyes fell upon my pile of ducats, and in a shrill voice he cried, Hey, hey, so I catch you. Will you still persist in telling me, Mr. Painter, that you have no money? and his hooked fingers advanced with that nervous trembling that the sight of gold always produces in a miser. For a few seconds I was stupefied. The memory of all the indignities that this individual had inflicted upon me, his covetous look, and his impudent smile exasperated me. With a single bound I caught hold of him and pushed him out of the room, slamming the door in his face. This was done with the crack and rapidity of a spring snuff-box. But from outside, the old usurer screamed like an eagle. My money, you thief! My money! The lodgers came out of their rooms, asking, What is the matter? What has happened? I opened the door suddenly and quickly gave Mr. Rapp a kick in the spine that sent him rolling down more than twenty steps. That's what's the matter, I cried quite beside myself. Then I shut the door and bolted it, while bursts of laughter from the neighbors greeted Mr. Rapp in the passage. I was satisfied with myself. I rubbed my hands together. This adventure had put new life into me. I resumed my work and was about to finish the sketch when I heard an unusual noise. Butts of muskets were grounded on the pavement. I looked out of my window and saw three soldiers in full uniform with grounded arms in front of my door. I said to myself in my terror, can it be that that scoundrel of a rap has had any bones broken? And here is the strange peculiarity of the human mind. I, who the night before had wanted to cut my own throat, shook from head to foot, thinking that I might well be hanged if rap were dead. The stairway was filled with confused noises. It was an ascending flood of heavy footsteps, clanking arms, and short syllables. Suddenly, somebody tried to open my door. It was shut. Then there was a general clamor. In the name of the law, open! I arose, trembling and weak in the knees. Open! The same voice repeated. 
I thought to escape over the roofs, but I had hardly put my head out of the little snuff-box window when I drew back, seized with vertigo. I saw in a flash all the windows below with their shining panes, their flower-pots, their bird-cages, and their gratings. Lower, the balcony. Still lower, the street lamp. Still lower again, the sign of the red cask framed in ironwork. And finally, three glittering bayonets, only awaiting my fall to run me through the body from the sole of my foot to the crown of my head. On the roof of the opposite house, a tortoise-shell cat was crouching behind a chimney, watching a band of sparrows fighting and scolding in the gutter. One cannot imagine to what clearness, intensity, and rapidity the human eye acquires when stimulated by fear. At the third summons I heard, Open, or we shall force it! Seeing that flight was impossible, I staggered to the door and drew the bolt. Two hands immediately fell upon my collar. A dumpy little man, smelling of wine, said, I arrest you. He wore a bottle-green redingote, buttoned to the chin, and a stovepipe hat. He had large brown whiskers, rings on every finger, and was named Passoff. He was the chief of police. Five bulldogs with flat caps, noses like pistols, and lower jaws turning upward observed me from outside. "'What do you want?' I asked Passoff. "'Come downstairs,' he cried roughly, as he gave a sign to one of his men to seize me. This man took hold of me, more dead than alive, while several other men turned my room upside down. I went downstairs, supported by the arms like a person in the last stages of consumption, with hair disheveled and stumbling at every step. They thrust me into a cab between two strong fellows, who charitably let me see the ends of their clubs, held to their wrists by a leather string, and then the carriage started off. I heard behind us the feet of all the urchins of the town. "'What have I done?' I asked one of my keepers. He looked at the other one with a strange smile and said, "'Hans, he asks what he has done.' That smile froze my blood. Soon a deep shadow enveloped the carriage. The horse's hooves resounded under an archway. We were entering the Raspal house. Of this place, one might say, Dans cet an, je vois phobia comme l'une entrée, et ne vois point comme une en saut. All is not rose-colored in this world, from the claws of rap, I fell into a dungeon, from which very few poor devils have a chance to escape. Large dark courtyards and rows of windows like a hospital, and furnished with gratings, not a spring of verdure, not a festoon of ivy, not even a weathercock in perspective. Such was my new lodging. It was enough to make one tear his hair out by the roots. The police officers, accompanied by the jailer, took me temporarily to a lock-up. The jailer, if I remember rightly, was named Kasper Schlussel. With his grey woolen cap, his pipe between his teeth, and his bunch of keys at his belt, he reminded me of the owl god of the Caribs. He had the same golden-yellow eyes that see in the dark a nose like a comma, and a neck that was sunk between the shoulders. Schlussel shut me up as calmly as one locks up his socks in a cupboard, while thinking of something else. 
As for me, I stood for more than ten minutes with my hands behind my back and my head bowed. At the end of that time, I made the following reflection. When falling, Rapp cried out, I am assassinated. But he did not say by whom. I will say it was my neighbor, the old merchant with the spectacles. He will be hanged in my place. This idea comforted my heart, and I drew a long breath. Then I looked about my prison. It seemed to have been newly whitewashed, and the walls were bare of designs, except in one corner, where a gallows had been crudely sketched by my predecessor. The light was admitted through a bull's-eye, about nine or ten feet from the floor. The furniture consisted of a bundle of straw and a tub. I sat down upon the straw, with my hands around my knees, in deep despondency. It was with great difficulty that I could think clearly. But suddenly imagining that Rap, before dying, had denounced me, my legs began to tingle, and I jumped up coughing, as if the hemp and cord were already tightening around my neck. At the same moment, I heard Schlussel walking down the corridor. He opened the lock-up and told me to follow him. He was still accompanied by the two officers, so I fell into step resolutely. We walked down long galleries, lighted at intervals by small windows from within. Behind a grating, I saw the famous Jick-Jack, who was going to be executed on the morrow. He had on a straight jacket, and sang out in a raucous voice, Je suis le roi du ces montagnes. Seeing me, he called out, Hey, comrade, I'll keep a place for you at my right. The two police officers and the owl god looked at each other and smiled, while I felt the goose flesh creep down the whole length of my back. Schlussel shoved me into a large and very dreary hall, with benches arranged in a semicircle. The appearance of this deserted hall, with its two high grated windows and its Christ carved in old brown oak with his arms extended and his head sorrowfully inclined upon his shoulder, inspired me with I do not know what kind of religious fear that accorded with my actual situation. All my ideas of false accusation disappeared, and my lips tremblingly murmured a prayer. I had not prayed for a long time, but misfortune always brings us to thoughts of submission. Man is so little in himself. Opposite me, on an elevated seat, two men were sitting, with their backs to the light, and consequently their faces were in shadow. However, I recognized von Sprechdahl by his aquiline profile, illuminated by an oblique reflection from the window. The other person was fat, he had round chubby cheeks and short hands, and he wore a robe like von Sprechdahl. Below was the clerk of the court, Conrad. He was writing at a low table, and was tickling the tip of his ear with the feather end of his pen. When I entered, he stopped to look at me curiously. They made me sit down, and von Sprechdahl, raising his voice, said to me, Christian Vanius, where did you get this sketch? He showed me the nocturnal sketch, which was then in his possession. It was handed to me. After having examined it, I replied, I am the author of it. A long silence followed. The clerk of the court, Conrad, wrote down my reply. I heard his pen scratch over the paper, and I thought, Why did they ask me that question? That has nothing to do with the kick I gave rap in the back. You are the author of it? asked Van Sprechdahl. What is the subject? 
It is a subject of pure fancy. You have not copied the details from some spot? No, sir. I imagined it all. Accused Christian, said the judge in a severe tone, I ask you to reflect. Do not lie. I have spoken the truth. Write that down, clerk, said Van Sprechdal. The pen scratched again. And this woman, continued the judge, this woman who is being murdered at the side of the well, did you imagine her also? Certainly. You have never seen her? Never. Van Sprechdal rose indignantly. Then, sitting down again, he seemed to consult his companion in a low voice. These two dark profiles silhouetted against the brightness of the window, and the three men standing behind me, the silence in the hall, everything made me shiver. What do you want with me? What have I done? I murmured. Suddenly Van Sprechdal said to my guardians, You can take the prisoner back to the carriage. We will go to Metzerstrasse. Then, addressing me, Christian Venius, he cried, you are in a deplorable situation. Collect your thoughts and remember that if the law of man is inflexible, there still remains for you the mercy of God. This you can merit by confessing your crime. These words stunned me like a blow from a hammer. I fell back with extended arms, crying, Ah, oh, what a terrible dream! And I fainted. When I regained consciousness, the carriage was rolling slowly down the street. Another one preceded us. The two officers were always with me. One of them, on the way, offered a pinch of snuff to his companion. Mechanically, I reached out my hand toward the snuff-box, but he withdrew it quickly. My cheeks reddened with shame, and I turned away my head to conceal my emotion. If you look outside, said the man with the snuff-box, we shall be obliged to put handcuffs on you. May the devil strangle you, you infernal scoundrel, I said to myself. And as the carriage now stopped, one of them got out, while the other held me by the collar. Then, seeing that his comrade was ready to receive me, he pushed me rudely to him. These infinite precautions to hold possession of my person boded no good, but I was far from predicting the seriousness of the accusation that hung over my head until an alarming circumstance opened my eyes and threw me into despair. They pushed me along a low alley, the pavement of which was unequal and broken. Along the wall there ran a yellowish ooze, exhaling a fetid odor. I walked down this dark place with the two men behind me. A little further there appeared the chiaroscuro of an interior courtyard. I grew more and more terror-stricken as I advanced. It was no natural feeling. It was a poignant anxiety, outside of nature, like a nightmare. I recoiled instinctively at each step. Go on, cried one of the policemen, laying his hand on my shoulder. Go on. But what was my astonishment when, at the end of the passage, I saw the courtyard that I had drawn the night before, with its walls furnished with hooks, its rubbish heap of old iron, its chicken coops, and its rabbit hutch. Not a dormer window, high or low, not a broken pane, not the slightest detail had been omitted. I was thunderstruck by this strange revelation. Near the well were the two judges, Van Sprechdal and Richter. At their feet 
lay the old woman extended on her back, her long, thin gray hair, her blue face, her eyes wide open, and her tongue between her teeth. It was a horrible spectacle. Well, said von Sprechdahl with solemn accents, what do you have to say? I did not reply. Do you remember having thrown this woman, Teresa Becker, into this well, after having strangled her to rob her of her money? No, I cried. No, I do not know this woman. I never saw her before. May God help me. That will do, he replied in a dry voice and without saying another word he went out with his companion. The officers now believed that they had best put handcuffs on me. They took me back to the Raspel house in a state of profound stupidity. I did not know what to think. My conscience itself troubled me. I even asked myself if I really had murdered the old woman. In the eyes of the officers... I was condemned. I will not tell you of my emotions that night in the Raspel house when, seated on my straw bed with the window opposite me and the gallows in perspective, I heard the watchman cry in the silence of the night, Sleep, people of Nuremberg, the Lord watches over you. One o'clock. Two o'clock, three o'clock. Everyone may form his own idea of such a night. There is a fine saying that it is better to be hanged innocent than guilty. For the soul, yes, but for the body it makes no difference. On the contrary, it kicks, it curses its lot, it tries to escape, knowing well enough that its role ends with the rope. Add to this that it repents not having sufficiently enjoyed life and at having listened to the soul when it preached abstinence. Ah, if I had only known, it cried, you would not have led me around by a string with your big words, your beautiful phrases, and your magnificent sentences. You would not have allured me with your fine promises. I should have had many happy moments that are now lost forever. Everything is over. You said to me, control your passions. Very well, I did control them. Here I am now. They are going to hang me, and you. Later they will speak of you as a sublime soul, a stoical soul, a martyr to the errors of justice. They will never think about me. Such were the sad reflections of my poor body. Day broke. At first dull and undecided, it threw an uncertain light on my bull's-eye window with its crossbars. Then it blazed against the wall at the back. Outside the street became lively. This was a market day. It was Friday. I heard the vegetable wagons pass, and also the country people with their baskets. Some chickens cackled in their coops in passing, and some butter sellers chattered together. The market opposite opened, and they began to arrange the stalls. Finally, it was broad daylight, and the vast murmur of the increasing crowd, housekeepers who assembled with baskets on their arms, coming and going, discussing and marketing, told me that it was eight o'clock. With the light, my heart gained a little courage. Some of my black thoughts disappeared. I desired to see what was going on outside. Other prisoners before me had managed to climb up to the bull's-eye. They had dug some holes in the wall to mount more easily. I climbed in my turn and when seated in the oval edge of the window, with my legs bent and my head bowed, I could see the crowd and all the life and movement. Tears ran freely down my cheeks. I thought no longer of suicide. 
I experienced a need to live and breathe, which was really extraordinary. Ah, I said, to live what happiness. Let them harness me to a wheelbarrow. Let them put a ball and chain around my leg. Nothing matters if I may only live. The old market, with its roof shaped like an extinguisher, supported on heavy pillars, made a superb picture. Old women seated before their panniers of vegetables, their cages of poultry, and their baskets of eggs. Behind them the Jews, dealers in old clothes, their faces the color of old boxwood, butchers with bare arms cutting up meat on their stalls. Countrymen with large hats on the backs of their heads, calm and grave with their hands behind their backs and resting on their sticks of Hollywood, and tranquilly smoking their pipes. When the tumult and noise of the crowd, those screaming shrill, grave, high and short words, those expressive gestures, those sudden attitudes that show from a distance the progress of a discussion and depict so well the character of the individual. In short, all this captivated my mind, and notwithstanding my sad condition, I felt happy to be still of the world. Now, while I looked about in this manner, a man, a butcher, passed, inclining forward and carrying an enormous quarter of beef on his shoulders. His arms were bare, his elbows were raised upward, and his head was bent under them. His long hair, like that of Salvatore's Sicambrian, hid his face from me, and yet, at the first glance, I trembled. It is he, I said. All the blood in my body rushed to my heart. I got down from the window, trembling to the ends of my fingers, feeling my cheeks quiver, and the pallor spread over my face, stammering in a choked voice, It is he! He is there! There! And I, I have to die to expiate his crime. Oh, God! What shall I do? What shall I do? A sudden idea, an inspiration from heaven flashed across my mind. I put my hand in the pocket of my coat. My box of crayons was there. Then, rushing to the wall, I began to trace the scene of the murder with superhuman energy. No uncertainty, no hesitation. I knew the man. I had seen him. He was there before me. At ten o'clock, the jailer came to my cell. His owl-like impassibility gave place to admiration. Is it possible? he cried, standing at the threshold. Go, bring me my judges, I said to him, pursuing my work with an increasing exultation. Schlussel answered, They are waiting for you in the trial room. I wish to make a revelation, I cried, as I put the finishing touches to the mysterious personage. He lived. He was frightful to see. His full-faced figure, foreshortened upon the wall, stood out from the white background with an astonishing vitality. The jailer went away. A few minutes afterward, the two judges appeared. They were stupefied. I, trembling, with extended hand, said to them, There is the murderer. After a few minutes of silence, Van Sprechdal asked me, What is his name? I don't know, but he is at this moment in the market. He is cutting up meat in the third stall to the left as you enter from Traba Street. What? Do you think, said he, leaning toward his colleague, send for the man, he replied in a grave tone. Several officers retained in the corridor obeyed this order. The judges stood examining the sketch. 
As for me, I had dropped on my bed of straw, my head between my knees, perfectly exhausted. Soon steps were heard echoing under the archway. Those who have never awaited the hour of deliverance and counted the minutes, which seem like centuries, those who have never experienced the sharp emotions of outrage, terror, hope, and doubt, can have no conception of the inward chills that I experienced at that moment. I should have distinguished the step of the murderer, walking between the guards among a thousand others. They approached. The judges themselves seemed moved. I raised up my head, my heart feeling as if an iron hand had clutched it, and I fixed my eyes upon the closed door. It opened. The man entered. His cheeks were red and swollen. The muscles in his large contracted jaws twitched as far as his ears, and his little restless eyes, yellow like a wolf's, gleamed beneath his heavy yellowish-red eyebrows. Van Sprechtal showed him the sketch in silence. Then that murderous man, with the large shoulders, having looked, grew pale. Then, giving a roar which thrilled us all with terror, he waved his enormous arms and jumped backward to overthrow the guards. There was a terrible struggle in the corridor. You could hear nothing but the panting breath of the butcher, his muttered imprecations, and the short words and the shuffling feet of the guard upon the flagstones. It lasted only a minute. Finally the assassin re-entered, with his head hanging down, his eyes bloodshot, and his hands fastened behind his back. He looked again at the picture of the murderer. He seemed to reflect, and then, in a low voice, as if talking to himself, Who could have seen me, he said, at midnight? I was saved. Many years have passed since that terrible adventure. Thank heaven. I make silhouettes no longer, nor portraits of burgomasters. Through hard work and perseverance, I have conquered my place in the world, and I earn my living honorably by painting works of art, the sole end, in my opinion, to which a true artist should aspire. But the memory of that nocturnal sketch has always remained in my mind. Sometimes, in the midst of work, the thought of it recurs and I lay down my palette and dream for hours. How could a crime committed by a man that I did not know, at a place that I had never seen, have been reproduced by my pencil in all its smallest details? Was it chance? No. And moreover, what is chance but the effect of a cause of which we are ignorant? Was Schiller right when he said, The immortal soul does not participate in the weaknesses of matter. During the sleep of the body, it spreads its radiant wings and travels God knows where. What it then does, no one can say, but inspiration sometimes betrays the secret of its nocturnal wanderings. Who knows? Nature is more audacious in her realities than man in his most fantastic imagining. By Fiona MacLeod Green Branches In the year that followed the death of Manus Macadron, James Achena saw nothing of his brother Gloom. He might have thought himself alone in the world of all his people but for a letter that came to him out of the West. True, he had never accepted the common opinion that his brothers had both been drowned on the night when Annie Gillespie left Islandmore with Manus. In the first place, he had nothing of that inner conviction concerning the fate of Gloom which he had concerning that of Marcus. In the next, 
had he not heard the sound of the Fadden, which no one that he knew played except Gloom, and, for further token, was not the tune that which he hated above all others, the Dance of the Dead, for who but Gloom would be playing that, he hating it so, and the hour being late and no one else on Islandmore. It was no sure thing that the dead had not come back, but the more he thought of it, the more Achana believed that his sixth brother was still alive. Of this, however, he said nothing to anyone. It was as a man set free that, at last, after long waiting and patient trouble, with the disposal of all that was left of the Achana heritage, he left the island. It was a grey memory for him, the bleak moorland of it, the blight that had lain so long and so often upon the crops, the rains that had swept the isle for grey days and grey weeks and grey months, the sobbing of the sea by day and its dark moan by night, its dim relinquishing sigh in the calm of dreary ebbs, its hollow, baffling roar when the storm shadow swept up out of the sea. One and all oppressed him, even in memory. He had never loved the island, even when it lay green and fragrant in the green and white seas under white and blue skies, fresh and sweet as an Eden of the sea. He had ever been lonely and weary, tired of the mysterious shadow that lay upon his folk, caring little for any of his brothers except the eldest, long since mysteriously gone out of the ken of man, and almost hating Gloom, who had ever borne him a grudge because of his beauty, and because of his likeness to and reverent heed for Alison. Moreover, ever since he had come to love Katrine MacArthur, the daughter of Donald MacArthur, who lived in Sleet of Sky, he had been eager to live near her, the more eager as he knew that Gloom loved the girl also, and wished for success not only for his sake, but so as to put a slight upon his younger brother. So, when at last he left the island, he sailed southward gladly. He was leaving Islandmore, he was bound to a new home in Sky, and perhaps he was going to his long-delayed, long-dreamed-of happiness. True, Katrine was not pledged to him. He did not even know for sure if she loved him. He thought, hoped, dreamed, almost believed that she did. But then there was her cousin Ian who had long wooed her, and to whom old Donald MacArthur had given his blessing. Nevertheless, his heart would have been lighter than it had been for long, but for two things. First, there was the letter. Some weeks earlier he had received it, not recognizing the writing, because of the few letters he had ever seen, and, moreover, as it was in a feigned hand. With difficulty he had deciphered the manuscript, plain printed though it was. It ran thus. Well, Seamus, my brother, it is wondering if I am dead you will be. Maybe I, and maybe no. But I send you this writing to let you know that I know all you do and think of. So, you are going to leave Island Moor without an Achana upon it? And you will be going to Sleet in Sky? Well, let me be telling you this thing. Do not go. I see blood there, and there is this too. Neither you nor any man shall take Katrine away from me. You know that, and Ian MacArthur knows it and Katrine knows it, and that holds whether I am alive or dead. I say to you, do not go. It will be better for you and for all. Ian MacArthur is away in the North Sea with the whaler captain who came to us at Islandmore, 
and will not be back for three months yet. It will be better for him not to come back, but if he comes back, he will have to reckon with the man who says that Katrine MacArthur is his. I would rather not have two men to speak to, and one my brother. It does not matter to you where I am. I want no money just now. But put aside my portion for me. Have it ready for me against the day I call for it. I will not be patient that day, so have it ready for me. In the place that I am, I am content. You will be saying, Why is my brother away in a remote place? I will say this to you, that it is not further north than St. Kilda, nor further south than the Mull of Cantyre. And for what reason? That is between me and silence. But perhaps you think of Anne sometimes. Do you know that she lies under the green grass? And of Manus Macadrum? They say that he swam out into the sea and was drowned, and they whisper of the seal blood, though the minister is wrath with them for that. He calls it a madness. Well, I was there at that madness, and I played to it on my fodden. And now, Seamus, can you be thinking of what the tune was that I played? Your brother, who waits his own day, Gloom. Do not be forgetting this thing. I would rather not be playing the Dam San Amire. It was an ill hour for Manus when he heard the Dan Anron. It was the song of his soul that, and yours is the Dav San Amerv. This letter was ever in his mind, this and what happened in the gloaming when he sailed away for Skye in the herring smack of two men who lived at Armandale in Sleet. For, as the boat moved slowly out of the haven, one of the men asked him if he was sure that no one was left upon the island, for he thought he had seen a figure on the rocks waving a black scarf. Akana shook his head, but just then his companion cried that at that moment he had seen the same thing. So the smack was put about, and when she was moving slowly through the haven again, Akana sculled ashore and the little cogly punt. In vain he searched here and there, calling loudly again and again. Both men could hardly have been mistaken, he thought. If there were no human creature on the island, and if their eyes had not played them false, who could it be? The wraith of Marcus, mayhap. Or might it be the old man himself, his father, risen to bid farewell to his youngest son, or to warn him? It was no use to wait longer, so looking often behind him, he made his way to the boat again and rowed slowly out toward the smack. Jerk, 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 across the water came, low but only too loud for him, the opening motif of the Damsa Namira. A horror came upon him, and he drove the boat through the water so that the sea splashed over the bows. When he came on deck, he cried in a hoarse voice to the man next to him to put up the helm and let the smack swing to the wind. There is no one there, Callum Campbell, he whispered. And who is it that will be making that strange music? What music? Sure, it has stopped now, but I heard it clear, and so did Andre McEwen. It was like the sound of a reed pipe, and the tune was an eerie one at that. It was the dance of the dead. And who will be playing that? asked the man, with fear in his eyes. No living man. No living man? No. I'm thinking it will be one of my brothers who was drowned there, 
and by the same token that it is gloom, for he played upon the fodden. But if not, then, then... The two men waited in breathless silence, each trembling with superstitious fear. But at last the elder made a sign to Akana to finish. Then it will be the Kelpie. Is there, is there one of the cave women here? It is said, and you know of old that the Kelpie sings or plays a strange tune to wild seamen to their death. At that moment the fantastic jerking music came loud and clear across the bay. There was a horrible suggestion in it, as if dead bodies were moving along the ground with long jerks and crying and laughing wild. It was enough. The men— Campbell and McEwen would not now have waited longer if Akana had offered them all he had in the world. Nor were they, or he, out of their panic haste till the smack stood well out at sea, and not a sound could be heard from Islandmore. They stood watching silent. Out of the dusky mass that lay in the seaward way to the north came a red gleam. It was like an eye staring after them with blood-red glances. What is that, Akana? It looks as though a fire had been lighted in the house up in the island. The door and the window must be open. The fire must be fed with wood, for no peats would give that flame. And there were none lighted when I left. To my knowing, there was no wood for burning except the wood of the shelves and the bed. And who would be doing that? I know of that no more than you do, Callum Campbell. No more was said, and it was a relief to all when the last glimmer of the light was absorbed in the darkness. At the end of the voyage, Campbell and McEwen were well pleased to be quit of their companion not so much because he was moody and distraught, as because they feared that a spell was upon him, a fate in the working of which they might become involved. It needed no vow of the one to the other for them to come to the conclusion that they would never land on Islandmore, or, if need be, only in broad daylight, and never alone. The days went well for James Akana where he made his home at Ranza Beg, on Ranza Water in the Sleet of Sky. The farm was small but good, and he hoped that with help and care he would soon have the place as good a farm as there was in all sky. Donald MacArthur did not let him see much of Katrine, but the old man was no longer opposed to him. Seamus must wait till Ian MacArthur came back again, which might be any day now. For sure, James Akina of Ranza Beg was a very different person from the youngest of the Akina folk, who held by on lonely island moor. Moreover, the old man could not but think with pleasure that it would be well to see Katrine able to walk over the whole land of Ranza from the cairn at the north of his own Ranza Moor to the burn at the south of Ranza Beg, and know it for her own. But Akana was ready to wait. Even before he had the secret word of Katrine, he knew from her beautiful dark eyes that she loved him. As the weeks went by, they managed to meet often, and at last Katrine told him that she loved him too and would have none but him, but that they must wait till Ian came back because of the pledge given to him by her father. They were days of joy for him, though many a hot noontide hour, through many a gloaming he went as one in a dream. Whenever he saw a birch swaying in the wind, or a wave leaping upon Loch Lath that was near his home, or passed a bush covered with wild roses, or saw the moonbeams 
lying white on the boles of the pines, he thought of Katrine. His fawn for grace, and so lithe and tall, with sun-brown face and wavy dark mass of hair, and shadowy eyes and rowan red lips. It is said that there is a god clothed in shadow who goes to and fro among the humankind, putting silence between lovers with his waving hands, and breathing a chill out of his cold breath, and leaving a gulf of deep water flowing between them because of the passing of his feet. That shadow never came their way. Their love grew as a flower, fed by rains and warmed by sunlight. When midsummer came, and there was no sign of Ian MacArthur, it was already too late. Katrine had been won. During the summer months, it was the custom for Katrine and two of the farm girls to go up Mwil Ranza to reside at the shealing of Kanak an Fruk, and this because of the hill pasture for the sheep. Kanak an Fruk is a round, boulder-studded hill covered with heather, which has a precipitous quarry on each side and in front slopes down to Lachen Fruk, a lochlet surrounded by dark woods. Behind the hill, or great hillock rather, lay the shealing. At each weekend, Katrine went down to Ramza Moor, and on every Monday morning at sunrise returned to her heather girt Erie. It was on one of these visits that she endured a cruel shock. Her father told her that she must marry someone else than Seamus Akana. He had heard words about him which made a union impossible, and indeed he hoped that the man would leave Ranza Beg. In the end he admitted that what he had heard was to the effect that Akana was under a doom of some kind, that he was involved in a blood feud, and moreover that he was fey. The old man would not be explicit as to the person from whom his information came, but hinted that he was a stranger of rank, probably a laird of the Isles. Besides this, there was word of Ian MacArthur. He was a Thurso in the far north, and would be in Sky before long, and he, her father, had written to him that he might wed Katrine as soon as was practicable. "'Do you see that linty yonder, father?' was her response to this. "'Aye, lass, and what about the birdine?' "'Well, when she mates with a hawk, so will I be mating with Ian MacArthur, but not till then.' With that she turned and left the house and went back to knock on Fruk. On the way she met Akana. It was that night that for the first time he swam across Lachen Fruk to meet Katrine. The quickest way to reach the shealing was to row across the lochlet, and then ascend by a sheep path that wound through the hazel copses at the base of the hill. Fully half an hour was thus saved, because of the steepness of the precipitous quarries to the right and left. A boat was kept for this purpose, but it was fastened to a shore boulder by a padlocked iron chain, the key of which was kept by Donald MacArthur. Latterly he had refused to let this key out of his possession, for one thing, no doubt he believed he could thus restrain Akana from visiting his daughter. The young man could not approach the shealing from either side without being seen. But that night, soon after the moon was whitening slow in the dark, Katrine stole down to the hazel copse and awaited the coming of her lover. The Lucken was visible from almost any point on Kanakan Fruk as well as from the south side. To cross it in a boat unseen, if any watcher were near, would be impossible, nor could even a swimmer hope to escape notice, unless in the gloom of night, or mayhap in the dusk. 
When, however, she saw, halfway across the water, a spray of green branches slowly moving athwart the surface, she knew that Seamus was keeping his tryst. If, perchance, anyone else saw, he or she would never guess that those derelict rowan branches shrouded Seamus Achina. It was not until the estray had drifted close to the hedge, where, hid among the bracken and hazel undergrowth, she awaited him, that Katrine descried the face of her lover, as with one hand he parted the green sprays, and stared longingly and lovingly at the figure he could just discern in the dim, fragrant obscurity. And as it was this night, so was it many of the nights that followed. Katrine spent the days as in a dream. Not even the news of her cousin Ian's return disturbed her much. One day, the inevitable meeting came. She was at Ranzamore, and when a shadow came into the dairy where she was standing, she looked up and saw Ian before her. She thought he appeared taller and stronger than ever, though still not so tall as Seamus, who would appear slim beside the Herculean skyman. But as she looked at his close curling black hair, and thick bull neck and the sullen eyes and the dark wind-red face, she wondered that she had ever tolerated him at all. He broke the ice at once. Tell me, Katrine, are you glad to see me back again? I am glad that you are home once more, safe and sound. And will you make it my home for me by coming to live with me? as I've asked you again and again. No, as I've told you again and again. He gloomed at her angrily for a few moments before he resumed. I will be asking you this one thing, Katrine, daughter of my father's brother. Do you love that man Akana who lives at Ranzabeg? You may ask the wind why it is from the east or the west, but it won't tell you. You're not the wind's master. If you think I will let this man take you away from me, you are thinking a foolish thing. And you saying a foolisher. I? Ah, sure. What could you do, Ian McKeon, at the worst? You could do no more than kill James Achena. What then? I too would die. You cannot separate us. I would not marry you now, though you were the last man in the world and I the last woman. You are a fool, Katrine MacArthur. Your father has promised you to me, and I tell you this. If you love Achena, you'll save his life only by letting him go away from here. I promise you, he will not be here long. Ah, you promise me. But you will not say that thing to James Achena's face. You are a coward. With a muttered oath, the man turned on his heel. Let him beware of me, and you too, Katrine Moniendon. I swear it by my mother's grave and by St. Martin's cross that you will be mine by hook or by crook. The girl smiled scornfully. Slowly she lifted a milk pail. It would be a pity to waste the good milk, Ian Gora, but if you don't go, it is I that will be emptying the pail on you, and then you will be as white without as your heart is within. So you call me witless, do you, Ian Gora? Well, we shall be seeing as to that, and as for the milk, there will be more than milk spilt because of you, Katrine Doan. From that day, though neither Seamus nor Katrine knew of it, a watch was set upon Achena. It could not be long before their secret was discovered, and it was with a savage joy overmastering his sullen rage that Ian MacArthur knew himself the discoverer, 
and conceived his double vengeance. He dreamed gloatingly on both the black thoughts that roamed like ravenous beasts through the solitudes of his heart. But he did not dream that another man was filled with hate because of Katrine's lover, another man who had sworn to make her his own, the man who, disguised, was known in Armandale as Donald McLean, and in the North Isles would have been hailed as Gloom Achena. There had been steady rain for three days, with a cold, raw wind. On the fourth, the sun shone and set in peace. An evening of quiet beauty followed, warm, fragrant, dusky from the absence of moon or star, though the thin veils of mist promised to disperse as the night grew. There were two men that eve in the undergrowth on the south side of the locklet. Seamus had come earlier than his wont. Impatient for the dusk, he could scarce await the waning of the afterglow. Surely, he thought, he might venture. Suddenly his ears caught the sound of cautious footsteps. Could it be old Donald? perhaps with some inkling of the way in which his daughter saw her lover in despite of all? Or mayhap, might it be Ian MacArthur, tracking him as a hunter stalking a stag by the water pools? He crouched and waited. In a few minutes he saw Ian carefully picking his way. The man stopped as he described the green branches, smiled as, with a low rustling, he raised them from the ground. Meanwhile, yet another man watched and waited, though on the farther side of the lochan, where the hazel copses were. Gloom Achena half hoped, half feared the approach of Katrine. It would be sweet to see her again, sweet to slay her lover before her eyes, brother to him though he was. But there was chance that she might descry him, and whether recognizingly or not, warn the swimmer. So it was that he had come there before sundown, and now lay crouched among the bracken underneath a projecting mossy ledge close upon the water where it could scarce be that she or any should see him. As the gloaming deepened, a great stillness reigned. There was no breath of wind. A scarce audible sigh prevailed among the spires of the heather. The cheering of a nightjar throbbed through the darkness. Somewhere a corncrake called its monotonous crick-crack, the dull, harsh sound emphasizing the utter stillness, the pinging of the gnats hovering over and among the sedges made an incessant murmur through the warm, sultry air. There was a splash once as of a fish, then silence, then a lower but more continuous splash, or rather wash of water, a slow susurrus rustled through the dark. Where he lay among the fern, Gloom Achena slowly raised his head, stared through the shadows, and listened intently. If Katrine were waiting there, she was not near. Noiselessly he slid into the water. When he rose, it was under a clump of green branches. These he had cut and secured three hours before. With his left hand he swam slowly, or kept his equipoise in the water. With his right he guided the heavy rowan bow. In his mouth were two objects, one long and thin and dark, the other with an occasional glitter as of a dead fish. His motion was scarcely perceptible. Nonetheless, he was near the middle of the lock, almost as soon as another clump of green branches. Doubtless the swimmer beneath it was confident that he was now safe from observation. The two clumps of green branches drew nearer. 
the smaller seemed a mere estray, a spray blown down by the recent gale. But all at once the larger clump jerked awkwardly and stopped. Simultaneously a strange low strain of music came from the other. The strain ceased. The two clumps of green branches remained motionless. Slowly, at last, the larger moved forward. It was too dark for the swimmer to see if any one lay hid behind the smaller. When he reached it, he thrust aside the leaves. It was as though a great salmon leaped. There was a splash, and a narrow dark body shot through the gloom. At the end of it something gleamed. Then suddenly there was a savage struggle. The inanimate green branches tore this way and that, and surged and swirled. Gasping cries came from the leaves. Again and again the gleaming thing leaped. At the third leap an Awful scream shrilled through the silence. The echo of it wailed thrice, with horrible distinctness, in the quarry beyond Kanakanfruk. Then, after a faint splashing, there was silence once more. One clump of green branches drifted slowly up the locklet. The other moved steadily toward the place whence, a brief while before, it had stirred. Only one thing lived in the heart of Gloom Akana, the joy of his exultation. He had killed his brother Seamus. He had always hated him because of his beauty. Of late he had hated him because he had stood between him, Gloom, and Katrine MacArthur, because he had become her lover. They were all dead now except himself, all the Akanas. He was Akana. When the day came that he would go back to Galloway, there would be a magpie on the first burke, and a screaming jay on the first rowan, and a croaking raven on the first fir. Aye, he would be there suffering, though they knew nothing of him meanwhile. He would be Akana of Akana again. Let those who would stand in his way beware. As for Katrine, perhaps he would take her there, perhaps not. He smiled. These thoughts were the wandering fires in his brain while he slowly swam shoreward under the floating green branches, and as he disengaged himself from them and crawled upward through the bracken. It was at this moment that a third man entered the water from the further shore prepared as he was to come suddenly upon Katrine, Gloom was startled when, in a place of dense shadow, a hand touched his shoulder, and her voice whispered, Seamus! Seamus! The next moment she was in his arms. He could feel her heart beating against his. What is it, Seamus? What was that awful cry? she whispered. For an answer, he put his lips to hers and kissed her again and again. The girl drew back. Some vague instinct warned her. What is it, Seamus? Why don't you speak? He drew her close again. Pulse of my heart, it is I who love you. I who love you best of all. It is I, Gloom Akana. With a cry, she struck him full in the face. He staggered, and in that moment she freed herself. You coward! Katrine, I come no nearer. If you do, it will be the death of you. The death of me? Ah, bonny fool that you are. And is it you that will be the death of me? Thy gloomachina, for I have but to scream, and Seamus will be here and he would kill you like a dog if he knew you did me any harm. Ah, but if there were no Seamus, or any man to come between me and my will, then there would be a woman, 
I, if you overbore me, I would strangle you with my hair or fix my teeth in your false throat. I was not for knowing you were such a wild cat, but I'll tame you yet, my lass. Aha, wild cat. And as he spoke, he laughed low. It is a true word, Gloom, of the black heart. I am a wild cat. And like a wild cat, I am not to be seized by a fox, and that you will be finding to your cost by the holy Saint Bridget. But now off with you, brother of my man. Your man, ha! Why do you laugh? Sure, I am laughing at a warm white lass like yourself, having a dead man as your lover. A dead man? No answer came. The girl shook with a new fear. Slowly she drew closer till her breath fell warm against the face of the other. He spoke at last. I, a dead man. It is a lie. Where would you be that you were not hearing his goodbye? I'm thinking it was loud enough. It is a lie. It is a lie. No, it is no lie. Seamus is cold enough now. He is low among the weeds by now. Aye, by now, down there in the lochan. What? You, you devil! Is it for killing your own brother you would be? I killed no one. He died his own way. Maybe the cramp took him. Maybe, maybe a kelpie gripped him. I watched. I saw him beneath the green branches. He was dead before he died. I saw it in the white face of him. Then he sank. He's dead. Seamus is dead. Look here, girl, I've always loved you. I swore the oath upon you. You're mine. Sure, you're mine now, Katrine. It is loving you, I am. It will be a south wind for you from this day, Mornir Mokre. See here, I'll show you how I... Back! Back! Murderer! Be stopping that foolishness now, Katrine MacArthur. By the book I am tired of it. I am loving you, and it's having you for mine I am. And if you won't come to me like the dove to its mate... I'll come to you like the hawk to the dove. With a spring he was upon her. In vain she strove to beat him back. His arms held her as a stout grips a rabbit. He pulled her head back and kissed her throat till the strangulating breath sobbed against his ear. With a last despairing effort she screamed the name of the dead man. Seamus! 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 The man who struggled with her laughed. I call away. The heron will be coming through the bracken as soon as Seamus comes to your call. Aye, it is mine you are now, Katrine. He's dead and cold, and you'd best have a living man, and— She fell back, her balance lost in the sudden releasing. What did it mean? Gloom still stood there, but as one frozen. Through the darkness she saw at last that a hand gripped his shoulder. Behind him a black mass vaguely obtruded. For some moments there was absolute silence. Then a hoarse voice came out of the dark. You will be knowing now who it is, Gloom Akana. The voice was that of Seamus, who lay dead in the lochan. The murderer shook as in a palsy. With a great effort, slowly he turned his head. He saw a white splatch, the face of the corpse. In this white splatch flamed two burning eyes, the eyes of the soul of the brother whom he had slain. He reeled, staggered as a blind man, and free now of that awful clasp, swayed to and fro as one drunken. Slowly Seamus raised an arm and pointed downward through the wood toward the lochan. 
Still pointing, he moved swiftly forward. With a cry like a beast, Gloom Akana swung to one side, stumbled, rose, and leaped into the darkness. For some minutes, Seamus and Katrine stood, silent, apart, listening to the crashing sound of his flight, the race of the murderer against the pursuing shadow of the grave. By Amelia B. Edwards, The 415 Express The events which I am about to relate took place between nine and ten years ago. Sebastopol had fallen in the early spring, the peace of Paris had been concluded since March, our commercial relations with the Russian Empire were but recently renewed, and I, returning home after my first northward journey since the war, was well pleased with the prospect of spending the month of December under the hospitable and thoroughly English roof of my excellent friend Jonathan Jelf Esquire of Dumbleton Manor, Clayborough, East Anglia. My way lay by the great East Anglian line as far as Clayborough Station, where I was to be met by one of the Dumbleton carriages and conveyed across the remaining nine miles of country. Having arrived some seven minutes before the starting of the train, and by the connivance of the guard, taken sole possession of an empty compartment, I lighted my traveling lamp, made myself particularly snug, and settled down to the undisturbed enjoyment of a book and a cigar. Great, therefore, was my disappointment when, at the last moment, a gentleman came hurrying along the platform, glanced into my carriage, opened the locked door with a private key, and stepped in. It struck me at the first glance that I had seen him before, a tall, spare man, thin-lipped, light-eyed, with an ungraceful stoop in the shoulders and scant gray hair worn somewhat long upon the collar. He carried a light waterproof coat, an umbrella, and a large brown japanned deed box, which last he placed under the seat. I now recognized my companion. I had met him, as I distinctly remembered, some three years before, at the very house for which, in all probability, he was now bound like myself. His name was Dwerry House. He was a lawyer by profession, and if I was not greatly mistaken, was first cousin to the wife of my host. I thought— observing him by the vague mixture of lamplight and twilight, that Mrs. Jelf's cousin looked all the worse for the three years' wear and tear which had gone over his head since our last meeting. He was very pale, and had a restless light in his eye that I did not remember to have observed before. The anxious lines, too, about his mouth were deepened and there was a cavernous, hollow look about his cheeks and temples which seemed to speak of sickness or sorrow. When he had glanced at me for the third or fourth time, I ventured to address him. Mr. John Dwerry House, I think? That is my name, he replied. I had the pleasure of meeting you at Dumbleton about three years ago. Mr. Dwerry House bowed. I thought I knew your face, he said, but your name, I regret to say, Langford, William Langford. I have known Jonathan Jelf since we were boys together at Merchant Taylor's, and I generally spend a few weeks at Dumbleton in the shooting season. I suppose we are bound for the same destination? Not if you are on your way to the manor, he replied. I am travelling upon business. You have heard, perhaps, that we are about to construct a branch line from Blackwater to Stockbridge. You are an East Anglian director, I presume? My interest in the company, replied Mr. Dwerryhouse, is threefold. I am a director, 
I am a considerable shareholder, and as the head of the firm of Dwerry House, Dwerry House and Crake, I am the company's principal solicitor. Loquacious, self-important, full of his pet project, and apparently unable to talk on any other subject, Mr. Dwerry House then went on to tell of the opposition he had encountered and the obstacles he had overcome in the cause of the Stockbridge branch. I was entertained with a multitude of local details and local grievances. The rapacity of one squire, the impracticability of another, the indignation of the rector whose glebe was threatened, and so on and on and on, till my head ached and my attention flagged, and my eyes kept closing in spite of every effort that I made to keep them open. At length I was roused by these three words. Seventy-five thousand pounds cash down. Seventy-five thousand pounds cash down, I repeated, in the liveliest tone I could assume. That is a heavy sum. A heavy sum to carry here, replied Mr. Dwerry House, pointing significantly to his breast pocket. But a mere fraction of what we shall ultimately have to pay. You do not mean to say that you have seventy-five thousand pounds at this moment upon your person? I exclaimed. My good sir, have I not? "'Been telling you so for the last half hour?' said Mr. Dwerry House testily. "'That money has to be paid over at half-past eight o'clock this evening "'at the office of Sir Thomas's solicitors on completion of the deed of sale. "'But how will you get across by night from Blackwater to Stockbridge "'with seventy-five thousand pounds in your pocket?' To Stockbridge, echoed the lawyer. I find I have made myself very imperfectly understood. I thought I had explained how this sum only carries us as far as Mallingford, the first stage, as it were, of our journey, and how our route from Blackwater to Mallingford lies entirely through St. Thomas Liddell's property. I beg your pardon, I stammered. I fear my thoughts were wandering. So you only go as far as Mallingford tonight? Precisely. I shall get a conveyance from the Blackwater Arms. And you? Oh, Jeff sends a trap to meet me at Clayborough. Can I be the bearer of any message from you? You may say, if you please, Mr. Langford, that I wished I could have been your companion all the way, and that I will come over, if possible, before Christmas. Nothing more? Mr. Dwerry House smiled grimly. Well, he said, you may tell my cousin that she need not burn the hall down in my honor this time, and that I shall be obliged if she will order the blue room chimney to be swept before I arrive. That sounds tragic. Had you a conflagration on the occasion of your last visit to Dumbleton? Something like it. There had been no fire lighted in my bedroom since the spring. The flue was foul, and the rocks had built in it. So, when I went up to dress for dinner, I found the room full of smoke and the chimney on fire. Are we all ready at Blackwater? The train had gradually come to a pause while Mr. Dwerry House was speaking, and putting my head out of the window, I could see the station some few hundred yards ahead. There was another train before us blocking the way, and the guard was making use of the delay to collect the Blackwater tickets. I had scarcely ascertained our position when the ruddy-faced official appeared at our carriage door. "'Tickets, sir,' said he. "'I am for Clayborough,' I replied, holding out the tiny pink card. He took it, 
glanced at it by the light of his little lantern, gave it back, looked, as I fancied, somewhat sharply at my fellow traveler, and disappeared. He did not ask for yours, I said with some surprise. They never do, replied Mr. Dwerry House. They all know me, and of course I travel free. Black water, black water, cried the porter, running along the platform beside us as we glided into the station. Mr. Dwerry House pulled out his deed box, put his traveling cap in his pocket, resumed his hat, took down his umbrella, and prepared to be gone. Many thanks, Mr. Langford, for your society, he said, with old-fashioned courtesy. I wish you a good evening. Good evening, I replied, putting out my hand. But he either did not see it, or did not choose to see it, and slightly lifting his hat, stepped out upon the platform. Having done this, he moved slowly away and mingled with the departing crowd. Leaning forward to watch him out of sight, I trod upon something which proved to be a cigar case. It had fallen, no doubt, from the pocket of his waterproof coat, and was made of dark Morocco leather, with a silver monogram upon the side. I sprang out of the carriage just as the guard came to lock me in. Is there one minute to spare? I asked eagerly. The gentleman who traveled down with me from town has dropped his cigar case. He is not yet out of the station. Just a minute and a half, sir, replied the guard. You must be quick. I dashed along the platform as fast as my feet could carry me. It was a large station, and Mr. Dwerry House had by this time got more than halfway to the farther end. I, however, saw him distinctly, moving slowly with the stream. Then, as I drew nearer, I saw that he had met some friend, that they were talking as they walked, that they presently fell back somewhat from the crowd and stood aside in earnest conversation. I made straight for the spot where they were waiting. There was a vivid gas jet just above their heads, and the light fell full upon their faces. I saw both distinctly, the face of Mr. Dwerry House and the face of his companion. Running, breathless, eager as I was, getting in the way of porters and passengers, and fearful every instant lest I should see the train going on without me, I yet observed that the newcomer was considerably younger and shorter than the director, and that he was sandy-haired, mustachioed, small-featured, and dressed in a close-cut suit of scotch tweed. I was now within a few yards of them. I ran against a stout gentleman. I was nearly knocked down by a luggage truck. I stumbled over a carpet bag. I gained the spot just as the driver's whistle warned me to return. To my utter stupefaction, they were no longer there. I had seen them but two seconds before, and they were gone. I stood still. I looked to right and left. I saw no sign of them in any direction. It was as if the platform had gaped and swallowed them. There were two gentlemen standing here a moment ago, I said to a porter at my elbow. Which way can they have gone? I saw no gentleman, sir, replied the guard. The whistle shrilled out again. The guard, far up on the platform, held up his arm and shouted to me to, Come on! If you are going on this train, sir, said the porter, you must run for it. I did run for it, just gained the carriage as the train began to move, was shoved in by the guard and left breathless and bewildered with Mr. Dwerry House's cigar case still in my hand. It was the strangest disappearance in the world. It was like a transformation trick in a pantomime. They were there one moment, palpably there talking, 
with the gaslight full upon their faces, and the next moment they were gone. There was no door near, no window, no staircase. It was a mere slip of barren platform, tapestried with big advertisements. Could anything be more mysterious? It was not worth thinking about, and yet for my life I could not help pondering upon it. Pondering, wondering, conjecturing, turning it over and over in my mind, and beating my brains for a solution of the enigma. I thought of it all the way from Blackwater to Clayborough. I thought of it all the way from Clayborough to Dumbleton, as I rattled along the smooth highway in a trim dog cart, drawn by a splendid black mare and driven by the silentest and dapperest of East Anglian grooms. We did the nine miles in something less than an hour, and pulled up before the lodge gates just as the church clock was striking half-past seven. A couple of minutes more, and the warm glow of the lighted hall was flooding out upon the gravel. A hearty grasp was on my hand, and a clear, jovial voice was bidding me welcome to Dumbleton. I am not going to describe either the guests or the dinner that night. All provincial parties bear the strictest family resemblance, and I am not aware that an East Anglian banquet offers any exception to the rule. There was the usual country baronet and his wife, there were the usual country parsons and their wives. There was the sempiternal turkey and haunch of venison. Vanitus vanitatum. There is nothing new under the sun. At length there came a pause. The entrees had just been removed, and the turkey had come upon the scene. The conversation had all along been of the languidest, but at this moment it happened to have stagnated altogether. Moved by an unlucky impulse, I thought I would relate my adventure. By the way, Jelf, I began, I came down part of the way today with a friend of yours. Indeed, said the master of the feast, slicing scientifically into the breast of the turkey. With whom, pray? It was no less a person than your wife's cousin, Mr. John Dwerry House. Jonathan Jelf laid down his knife and fork. Mrs. Jelf looked at me in a strange, startled way and never said a word. And he desired me to tell you, my dear madame, that you need not take the trouble to burn the hall down in his honor this time, but only to have the chimney of the blue room swept before his arrival. Before I had reached the end of my sentence, I became aware of something ominous in the faces of the guests. I felt I had said something which I had better have left unsaid, and that for some unexplained reason my words had evoked a general consternation. I sat confounded, not daring to utter another syllable, and for at least two whole minutes there was dead silence round the table. The guests hitherto had been simply dull, but now they were evidently uncomfortable and embarrassed. The dessert had scarcely been placed upon the table when the ladies left the room. I seized the opportunity to select a vacant chair next a certain Captain Prendergast. In heaven's name, I whispered, what was the matter just now? What had I said? You mentioned the name of John Dwerry House. What of that? I had seen him not two hours before. It is a most astounding circumstance that you should have seen him, said Captain Prendergast. Are you sure it was he? As sure as my own identity. We were talking all the way between London and Blackwater, but why does that surprise you? Because, replied Captain Prendergast, dropping his voice to the lowest whisper, because John Dwerryhouse absconded 
three months ago with seventy five thousand pounds of the company's money and has never been heard of since. John Jewery House had absconded three months ago, and I had seen him only a few hours back. John Dwerry House had embezzled seventy five thousand pounds of the company's money, yet told me that he carried that sum upon his person. Were ever facts so strangely incongruous, so difficult to reconcile? How should he have ventured again into the light of day? How dared he show himself along the line? Above all, what had he been doing throughout those mysterious three months of disappearance? Perplexing questions, these, questions which at once suggested themselves to the minds of all concerned, but which admitted of no easy solution. I could find no reply to them. Captain Prendergast had not even a suggestion to offer. Jonathan Jelf, who seized the first opportunity of drawing me aside and learning all that I had to tell, was more amazed and bewildered than either of us. He came to my room that night, when all the guests were gone, and we talked the thing over from every point of view, without, it must be confessed, arriving at any kind of conclusion. I do not ask you, he said, whether you can have mistaken your man. That is impossible. As impossible as that I should mistake some stranger for yourself. It is not a question of looks or voice, but of facts. That he should have alluded to the fire in the blue room is proof enough of John Dwerry House's identity. How did he look? Older, I thought, considerably older, paler, and more anxious. He has had enough to make him look anxious anyhow, said my friend gloomily. Be he innocent or guilty. I am inclined to believe that he is innocent, I replied. He showed no embarrassment when I addressed him, and no uneasiness when the guard came round. His conversation was open to a fault. I might almost say that he talked too freely of the business which he had in hand. That again is strange, for I know no one more reticent on such subjects. He actually told you that he had the seventy-five thousand pounds in his pocket? He did. Huh. My wife has an idea about it, and she may be right. What idea? Well, she fancies. Women are so clever, you know, at putting themselves inside people's motives. She fancies that he was tempted, that he did actually take the money, and that he has been concealing himself these three months in some wild part of the country, struggling possibly with his conscience all the time, and daring neither to abscond with his booty nor to come back and restore it. But now that he has come back? That is the point. She conceives that he has probably thrown himself upon the company's mercy, made restitution of the money, and, being forgiven, is permitted to carry the business through as if nothing whatever had happened. The last, I replied, is an impossible case. Mrs. Jelf thinks like a generous and delicate-minded woman, but not in the least like a board of railway directors. They would never carry forgiveness so far. I fear not, and yet it is the only conjecture that bears a semblance of likelihood. However, we can run over to Clayborough tomorrow, see if anything's to be learned. By the way, Prendergast tells me you picked up his cigar case. I did so. Here it is. Jelf took the cigar case, examined it by the light of the lamp, and said at once that it was beyond doubt Mr. Dwerry House's property, and that he remembered to have seen him use it. 
Here, too, is his monogram on the side, he added, a big J transfixing a capital D. He used to carry the same on his note paper. It offers, at all events, a proof that I was not dreaming. Ay, but it is time you were asleep and dreaming now. I am ashamed to have kept you up so long. Good night. Good night, and remember that I am more than ready to go with you to Clayborough, or Blackwater, or London, or anywhere, if I can be of the least service. Thanks. I know you mean it, old friend, and it may be that I shall put you to the test. Once more, good night. So we parted for that night, and met again in the breakfast room at half past eight the next morning. It was a hurried, silent, uncomfortable meal. None of us had slept well, and all were thinking of the same subject. Within twenty minutes after we had left the breakfast table, the dog cart was brought round, and my friend and I were on the road to Clayborough. Tell you what it is, Langford, he said, as we sped along between the wintry hedges. I do not much fancy to bring up Dwerry House's name at Clayborough. All the officials know that he is my wife's relation, and the subject just now is hardly a pleasant one. If you don't much mind, we'll take the 1110 to Blackwater. It's an important station, and we shall stand a far better chance of picking up information there than at Clayborough. So we took the 1110, which happened to be an express, and, arriving at Blackwater about a quarter before twelve, proceeded at once to prosecute our inquiry. We began by asking for the station master, a big, blunt, business-like person, who at once averred that he knew Mr. John Dwerry House perfectly well, and that there was no director on the line whom he had seen and spoken to so frequently. He is not known to have been down the line any time yesterday, for instance. The station master shook his head. The East Anglian, sir, said he, is about the last place where he would dare to show himself. Why, there isn't a station master, there isn't a guard, there isn't a porter who doesn't know Mr. Dwerry House by sight as well as he knows his own face in the looking-glass, or who wouldn't telegraph for the police as soon as he had set eyes on him at any point along the line. Bless you, sir, there's been a standing order out against him ever since the 25th of September last. Can you tell me who took the Blackwater tickets of that train? I can, sir. It was the guard, Benjamin Summers. And where can I find him? You can find him, sir, by staying here, if you please, till one o'clock. He will be coming through with the Up Express from Crampton, which stays at Blackwater for ten minutes. We waited for the Up Express, beguiling the time as best we could by strolling along the Blackwater Road till we came almost to the outskirts of the town, from which the station was distant nearly a couple of miles. By one o'clock we were back again upon the platform and waiting for the train. It came punctually, and I at once recognized the ruddy-faced guard who had gone down with my train the evening before. The gentlemen want to ask you something about Mr. Dwerry House, Summers, said the station master, by way of introduction. The guard flashed a keen glance from my face to Jelf's and back again to mine. Mr. John Dwerry House, the late director, said he interrogatively. The same, replied my friend. Should you know him if you saw him? Anywhere, sir. Do you know if he was in the 415 Express yesterday afternoon? 
He was not, sir. How can you answer so positively? Because I looked into every carriage and saw every face in that train, and I could take my oath that Mr. Dwerry House was not in it. This gentleman was, he added, turning sharply upon me. I don't know that I ever saw him before in my life, but I remember his face perfectly. You nearly missed taking your seat in time at this station, sir, and you got out at Clayborough. Quite true, guard, I replied. But do you not also remember the face of the gentleman who traveled down in the same carriage with me as far as here? It was my impression, sir, that you traveled down alone, said Summers, with a look of some surprise. By no means. I had a fellow traveler as far as Blackwater and it was in trying to restore him the cigar case which he had dropped in the carriage that I so nearly let you go on without me. I remember your saying something about a cigar case, certainly, replied the guard, but you asked for my ticket just before we entered the station. I did, sir. Then you must have seen him. He sat in the corner, next to the very door to which you came. No, indeed, I saw no one. I looked at Jelf. I began to think the guard was in the ex-director's confidence and paid for his silence. If I had seen another traveler, I should have asked for his ticket, added Summers. Did you see me ask for his ticket, sir? I observed that you did not ask for it, but he explained that by saying— I hesitated. I feared I might be telling too much, and so broke off abruptly. The guard and station master exchanged glances. The former looked impatiently at his watch. I am obliged to go on in four minutes more, sir, he said. One last question, then, interposed Jelf with a sort of desperation. If this gentleman's fellow traveler had been Mr. John Dwerry House, and he had been sitting in the corner next to the door by which you took the tickets, could you have failed to see and recognize him? No, sir, it would have been quite impossible. And you are certain you did not see him? As I said before, sir, I could take my oath I did not see him, and if it wasn't that I don't like to contradict a gentleman, I would say that I could also take my oath that this gentleman was quite alone in the carriage the whole way from London to Clayborough. Why, sir, he added, dropping his voice so as to be inaudible to the station master, who had been called away to speak to some person close by. You expressly asked me to give you a compartment to yourself, and I did so. I locked you in, and you were so good as to give me something for myself. Yes, but Mr. Dwerry House had a key of his own. I never saw him, sir. I saw no one in that compartment but yourself— "'Beg pardon, sir. My time's up.' And with this the ruddy guard touched his cap and was gone. In another minute the heavy panting of the engine began afresh, and the train glided slowly out of the station. We looked at each other for some moments in silence. I was the first to speak. "'Mr. Benjamin Summers knows more than he chooses to tell.' I said. Hm. Do you think so? It must be. He could not have come to the door without seeing him. It's impossible. There is one thing not impossible, my dear fellow. What is that? You may have fallen asleep, dreamed the whole thing. Could I dream of a branch line that I had never heard of? Could I dream of a hundred and one business details that had no kind of interest for me? 
Could I dream of the seventy-five thousand pounds? Perhaps you might have seen or heard some vague account of the affair while you were abroad. It might have made no impression upon you at the time, and might have come back to you in your dreams, recalled perhaps by the mere names of the stations on the line. What about the fire in the chimney of the blue room? Should I have heard of that during my journey? Well, no. I admit there is a difficulty about that point. And what about the cigar case? Aye, by Jove, there is the cigar case. That is a stubborn fact. Well, it's a mysterious affair, and it will need a better detective than myself, I fancy, to clear it up. I suppose we may as well go home. A week had not gone by when I received a letter from the secretary of the East Anglian Railway Company requesting the favor of my attendance at a special board meeting not then many days distant. No reasons were alleged and no apologies offered for this demand upon my time, but they had heard it was clear of my inquiries anent the missing director, and had a mind to put me through some sort of official examination upon the subject. Being still a guest at Dumbleton Hall, I had to go up to London for the purpose, and Jonathan Jelf accompanied me. I found the direction of the Great East Anglian Line represented by a party of some twelve or fourteen gentlemen seated in solemn conclave round a huge green baize table in a gloomy boardroom adjoining the London terminus. Being courteously received by the chairman, who at once began by saying that certain statements of mine respecting Mr. John Dwerry House had come to the knowledge of the direction, and that they, in consequence, desired to confer with me on those points. We were placed at the table, and the inquiry proceeded in due form. I was first asked if I knew Mr. John Dwerry House how long I had been acquainted with him, and whether I could identify him at sight. I was then asked when I had seen him last, to which I replied, on the fourth of this present month, December 1856. Then came the inquiry of where I had seen him on the fourth day of December to which I replied that I met him in a first-class compartment of the 415 Down Express, that he got in just as the train was leaving the London terminus, and that he alighted at Blackwater Station. The chairman then inquired whether I had held any communication with my fellow traveller, whereupon I related, as nearly as I could remember it, the whole bulk and substance of Mr. John Dwerryhouse's diffuse information respecting the new branch line. To all this the board listened with profound attention, while the chairman presided and the secretary took notes. I then produced the cigar case. It was passed from hand to hand and recognized by all. There was not a man present who did not remember that plain cigar case with its silver monogram, or to whom it seemed anything less than entirely corroborative of my evidence. When at length I had told all that I had to tell, the chairman whispered something to the secretary. The secretary touched a silver handbell, and the guard, Benjamin Summers, was ushered into the room. He was then examined as carefully as myself. He declared that he knew Mr. John Dwerry House perfectly well, that he could not be mistaken in him, that he remembered going down with the 415 on the afternoon in question, that he remembered me, and that, there being one or two empty first-class compartments on that special afternoon, he had in compliance with my request, placed me in a carriage by myself. He was positive that I remained alone in that compartment all the way from London to Clayborough. 
He was ready to take his oath that Mr. Dwerry House was neither in that carriage with me, nor in any compartment of that train. He remembered distinctly to have examined my ticket at Blackwater, was certain that there was no one else at that time in the carriage, could not have failed to observe a second person if there had been one. Had that second person been Mr. John Dwerry House, should have quietly double-locked the door of the carriage and have at once given information to the Blackwater station master. So clear, so decisive, so ready was Summers with this testimony that the board looked fairly puzzled. "'You hear this person's statement, Mr. Langford,' said the chairman. "'It contradicts yours in every particular. What have you to say in reply?' I can only repeat what I said before. I am quite as positive of the truth of my own assertions as Mr. Summers can be of the truth of his. You say that Mr. Dwerry House alighted at Blackwater, and that he was in possession of a private key. Are you sure that he had not alighted by means of that key before the guard came round for the tickets? I am quite positive that he did not leave the carriage till the train had fairly entered the station, and the other Blackwater passengers alighted. I even saw that he was met there by a friend. Indeed. Did you see that person distinctly? Quite distinctly. Can you describe his appearance? I think so. He was short and very slight, sandy-haired, with a bushy mustache and beard, and he wore a loosely fitting suit of grey tweed. His age I should take to be about thirty-eight or forty. Did Mr. Dwerry House leave the station in this person's company? I, I cannot tell. I saw them walking together down the platform, and then I saw them standing aside under a gas jet, talking earnestly. After that I lost sight of them quite suddenly, and just then my train went on and I with it. The chairman and secretary conferred together in an undertone. The directors whispered to one another. One or two looked suspiciously at the guard. I could see that my evidence remained unshaken, and that, like myself, they suspected some complicity between the guard and the defaulter. How far did you conduct that 415 Express on the day in question, Summers? asked the chairman. All through, sir, replied the guard. From London to Crampton. How was it that you were not relieved at Clayborough? I thought there was always a change of guards at Clayborough. There used to be, sir, till the new regulations came in force last midsummer, since when the guards in charge of express trains go the whole way through. The chairman turned to the secretary. I think it would be as well, he said, if we had the day book to refer to upon this point. Again the secretary touched the silver handbell and desired the porter in attendance to summon Mr. Rakes. From a word or two dropped by another of the directors, I gathered that Mr. Rakes was one of the under-secretaries. He came, a small, slight, sandy-haired, keen-eyed man, with an eager, nervous manner, and a forest of light beard and mustache. He just showed himself at the door of the boardroom, and being requested to bring a certain day-book from a certain shelf in a certain room, bowed and vanished. He was there such a moment, and the surprise of seeing him was so great and sudden, that it was not till the door had closed upon him that I found voice to speak. He was no sooner gone, however, than I sprang to my feet. That person, I said, 
is the same who met Mr. Dwerry House upon the platform at Blackwater. There was a general movement of surprise. The chairman looked grave and somewhat agitated. Take care, Mr. Langford, he said. Take care what you say. I am as positive of his identity as of my own. Do you consider the consequences of your words? Do you consider that you are bringing a charge of the gravest character against one of the company's servants? I am willing to be put upon my oath if necessary. The man who came to that door a minute since is the same whom I saw talking with Mr. Dwerry House on the Blackwater platform. Were he twenty times the company's servant, I could say neither more nor less. The chairman turned again to the guard. Did you see Mr. Rakes in the train or on the platform? he asked. Summers shook his head. I am confident Mr. Rakes was not in the train, he said, and I certainly did not see him on the platform. The chairman turned next to the secretary. Mr. Rakes is in your office, Mr. Hunter, he said. Can you remember if he was absent on the fourth instant? I do not think he was, replied the secretary, but I am not prepared to speak positively. I have been away most afternoons myself lately, and Mr. Rakes might easily have absented himself if he had been disposed. At this moment, the under-secretary returned with the day-book under his arm. Be pleased to refer, Mr. Rakes said the chairman, to the entries of the fourth instant, and see what Benjamin Summers' duties were on that day. Mr. Rakes threw open the cumbrous volume, and ran a practiced eye and finger down some three or four successive columns of entries. Stopping suddenly at the foot of a page, he then read aloud that Benjamin Summers had on that day conducted the 4.15 Express from London to Crampton. The chairman leaned forward in his seat, looked the undersecretary full in the face, and said quite sharply and suddenly, And where were you, Mr. Rakes, on the same afternoon? I, sir? You, Mr. Rakes. Where were you on the afternoon and evening of the fourth of the present month? Here, sir, in Mr. Hunter's office. Where else should I be? There was a dash of trepidation in the under-secretary's voice as he said this, but his look of surprise was natural enough. We have some reason for believing, Mr. Rakes, that you were absent that afternoon without leave. Was this the case? Certainly not, sir. I have not had a day's holiday since September. Mr. Hunter will bear me out in this. Mr. Hunter repeated what he had previously said on the subject, but added that the clerks in the adjoining office would be certain to know. Whereupon the senior clerk, a grave, middle-aged person in green glasses, was summoned and interrogated. His testimony cleared the undersecretary at once. He declared that Mr. Rakes had in no instance, to his knowledge, been absent during office hours since his return from his annual holiday in September. I was confounded. The chairman turned to me with a smile, in which a shade of covert annoyance was scarcely apparent. You hear, Mr. Langford? he said. I hear, sir, but my conviction remains unshaken. I fear, Mr. Langford, that your convictions are very insufficiently based, replied the chairman with a doubtful cough. 
I fear that you dream dreams and mistake them for actual occurrences. It is a dangerous habit of mind and might lead to dangerous results. Mr. Rakes here would have found himself in an unpleasant position had he not proved so satisfactory an alibi. I was about to reply, but he gave me no time. I think, gentlemen, he went on to say, addressing the board, that we should be wasting time to push this inquiry further. Mr. Lankford's evidence would seem to be of an equal value throughout. The testimony of Benjamin Summers disproves his first statement, and the testimony of the last witness disproves the second. I think we may conclude that Mr. Lankford fell asleep in the train on the occasion of his journey to Clayborough and dreamed an unusually vivid and circumstantial dream of which, however, we have now heard quite enough. There are few things more annoying than to find one's positive convictions met with incredulity. I could not help feeling impatient at the turn that affairs had taken. I was not proof against the civil sarcasm of the chairman's manner. Most intolerable of all, however, was the quiet smile lurking about the corners of Benjamin Summers' mouth, and the half-triumphant, half-malicious gleam in the eyes of the undersecretary. The man was evidently puzzled and somewhat alarmed. His look seemed furtively to interrogate me. Who was I? What did I want? Why had I come there to do him an ill turn with his employers? What was it to me whether or no he was absent without leave? Seeing all this, and perhaps irritated by it more than the thing deserved, I begged leave to detain the attention of the board for a moment longer. Jelf plucked me impatiently by the sleeve. Better let the thing drop, he whispered. The chairman's right enough. You dreamed it, and the less said now the better. I was not to be silenced, however, in this fashion. I had yet something to say, and I would say it. It was to this effect that dreams were not usually productive of tangible results, and that I requested to know in what way the chairman conceived I had evolved from my dream so substantial and well made a delusion as the cigar case, which I had had the honor to place before him at the commencement of our interview. The cigar case, I admit, Mr. Langford, the chairman replied is a very strong point in your evidence. It is your only strong point, however, and there is just a possibility that we may all be misled by a mere accidental resemblance. Will you permit me to see the case again? It is unlikely, I said, as I handed it to him, any other should bear precisely this monogram, and yet be in all other particulars exactly similar. The chairman examined it for a moment in silence, and then passed it on to Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter turned it over and over and shook his head. This is no mere resemblance, he said. It is John Dwerryhouse's cigar case to a certainty. I remember it perfectly. I have seen it a hundred times. I believe I may say the same, added the chairman. Yet, how account for the way in which Mr. Langford asserts that it came into his possession? I can only repeat, I replied that I found it on the floor of the carriage after Mr. Dwerry House had alighted. It was in leaning out to look after him that I trod upon it, 
and it was in running after him for the purpose of restoring it that I saw, or believed I saw, Mr. Rakes standing beside with him in earnest conversation. Again I felt Jonathan Jelf plucking at my sleeve. Look at Rakes, he whispered. Look at Rakes. I turned to where the undersecretary had been standing a moment before, and saw him, white as death, with lips trembling and livid, stealing toward the door. To conceive a sudden, strange, and indefinite suspicion, to fling myself in his way, to take him by the shoulders as if he were a child, and turn his craven face perforce toward the board, were with me the work of an instant. Look at him, I exclaimed. Look at his face. I ask no better witness to the truth of my words. The chairman's brow darkened. Mr. Rakes, he said sternly, if you know anything, you had better speak. Vainly trying to wrench himself from my grasp, the undersecretary stammered out in incoherent denial. Let me go, he said. I, I know nothing. You have no right to detain me. Let me go. Did you or did you not meet Mr. John Dwerry House at Blackwater Station? The charge brought against you is either true or false. If true, you will do well to throw yourself upon the mercy of the board and make full confession of all that you know. The undersecretary wrung his hands in an agony of helpless terror. I was away, he cried. I was two hundred miles away at the time. I know nothing about it. I have nothing to confess. I am innocent. I call God to witness. I am innocent. Two hundred miles away, echoed the chairman. What do you mean? I was in Devonshire. I had three weeks' leave of absence. I appealed to Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter knows I had three weeks' leave of absence. I was in Devonshire all the time. I can prove I was in Devonshire. Seeing him so abject, so incoherent, so wild with apprehension, the directors began to whisper gravely among themselves, while one got quietly up and called the porter to guard the door. "'What has your being in Devonshire to do with the matter?' said the chairman. "'When were you in Devonshire?' Mr. Rakes took his leave in September, said the secretary, about the time when Mr. Dwerry House disappeared. I never even heard that he had disappeared till I came back. That must remain to be proved, said the chairman. I shall at once put this matter in the hands of the police. In the meanwhile, Mr. Rakes... Being myself a magistrate, and used to deal with these cases, I advise you to offer no resistance, but to confess while confession may yet do you service. As for your accomplice, the frightened wretch fell upon his knees. I had no accomplice, he cried. Only have mercy upon me. Only spare my life, and I will confess all. I didn't mean to harm him. I didn't mean to hurt a hair on his head. Only have mercy on me and let me go. The chairman rose in his place, pale and agitated. Good heavens, he exclaimed. What horrible mystery is this? What does it mean? As sure as there is a God in heaven, said Jonathan Jelf, it means that murder has been done. No, 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 shrieked Rakes, still upon his knees and cowering like a beaten hound. Not murder, 
No jury that ever sat could bring it in murder. I thought I had only stunned him. I never meant to do more than stun him. Manslaughter, manslaughter, not murder. Overcome by the horror of this unexpected revelation, the chairman covered his face with his hand and for a moment or two remained silent. Miserable man, he said at length, you have betrayed yourself. You bade me confess. You urged me to throw myself upon the mercy of the board. You have confessed to a crime which no one suspected you of having committed, replied the chairman, and which this board has no power either to punish or forgive. All that I can do for you is to advise you to submit to the law, to plead guilty, and to conceal nothing. When did you do this deed? The guilty man rose to his feet and leaned heavily against the table. His answer came reluctantly, like the speech of one dreaming. On the 22nd of September. On the 22nd of September. I looked in Jonathan Jelf's face and he in mine. I felt my own paling with a strange sense of wonder and dread. I saw him blanch suddenly, even to the lips. Merciful heaven, he whispered. What was it, then, that you saw in the train? What was it that I saw in the train? That question remains unanswered to this day. I have never been able to reply to it. I only know that it bore the living likeness of the murdered man whose body had then been lying some ten weeks under a rough pile of branches and brambles and rotting leaves at the bottom of a deserted chalk pit about halfway between Blackwater and Mallingford. I know that it spoke and moved and looked as that man spoke and moved and looked in life, that I heard, or seemed to hear, things related which I could never otherwise have learned, that I was guided, as it were, by that vision on the platform to the identification of the murderer, and that, a passive instrument myself, I was destined, by means of these mysterious teachings, to bring about the ends of justice. For these things I have never been able to account. As for that matter of the cigar case, it proved on inquiry that the carriage in which I traveled down that afternoon to Clayborough had not been in use for several weeks, and was, in point of fact, the same in which poor John Dwerryhouse had performed his last journey. The case had doubtless been dropped by him, and had lain unnoticed till I found it. Upon the details of the murder I have no need to dwell. Those who desire more ample particulars may find them, and the written confession of Augustus Rakes, in the files of the Times for 1856. Enough that the Undersecretary, knowing the history of the new line, and following the negotiation step by step through all its stages, determined to waylay Mr. Dwerry House, rob him of the seventy-five thousand pounds, and escape to America with his booty. In order to effect these ends, he obtained leave of absence a few days before the time appointed for the payment of the money, secured his passage across the Atlantic in a steamer advertised to start on the 23rd, provided himself with a heavily loaded life preserver, and went down to Blackwater to await the arrival of his victim. How he met him on the platform with a pretended message from the board, how he offered to conduct him by a shortcut across the fields to Mallingford, how, having brought him to a lonely place, he struck him down with the life preserver and so killed him, 
and how, finding what he had done, he dragged the body to the verge of an out-of-the-way chalk pit, and there flung it in and piled it over with branches and brambles, the facts still fresh in the memories of those who, like the connoisseurs in De Quincey's famous essay, regard murder as a fine art. Strangely enough, the murderer, having done his work, was afraid to leave the country. He declared that he had not intended to take the director's life, but only to stun and rob him, and that, finding the blow had killed, he dared not fly for fear of drawing down suspicion upon his own head. As a mere robber, he would have been safe in the States, but as a murderer, he would inevitably have been pursued and given up to justice. So he forfeited his passage, returned to the office as usual at the end of his leave, and locked up his ill-gotten thousands till a more convenient opportunity. In the meanwhile, he had the satisfaction of finding that Mr. Dwerry House was universally believed to have absconded with the money, no one knew how or whither. Whether he meant murder or not, however, Mr. Augustus Rakes paid the full penalty of his crime and was hanged at the Old Bailey in the second week of January, 1857. Those who desire to make his further acquaintance may see him any day, admirably done in wax, in the Chamber of Horrors, at Madame Tussaud's exhibition in Baker Street. He is there to be found in the midst of a select society of ladies and gentlemen of atrocious memory, dressed in the close-cut tweed suit which he wore on the evening of the murder, and holding in his hand the identical life-preserver with which he committed it. By H. B. Marriott the, the werewolf. werewolf. My father was not born, or originally a resident, in the Hartz Mountains. He was the serf of an Hungarian nobleman, of great possessions in Transylvania. But although a serf, he was not by any means a poor or illiterate man. In fact, he was rich and his intelligence and respectability were such that he had been raised by his lord to the stewardship. But whoever may happen to be born a serf, a serf he must remain, even though he become a wealthy man. Such was the condition of my father. My father had been married for about five years, and by his marriage had three children. My eldest brother, Caesar, myself, Herman, and a sister named Marcella. Latin is still the language spoken in that country, and that will account for our high-sounding names. My mother was a very beautiful woman, unfortunately more beautiful than virtuous. She was seen and admired by the lord of the soil. My father was sent away upon some mission, and during his absence, my mother, flattered by the attentions and won by the assiduities of this nobleman, yielded to his wishes. It so happened that my father returned very unexpectedly and discovered the intrigue. The evidence of my mother's shame was positive. He surprised her in the company of her seducer. Carried away by the impetuosity of his feelings, he watched the opportunity of a meeting taking place between them and murdered both his wife and her seducer. Conscious that, as a serf, not even the provocation which he had received would be allowed as a justification of his conduct, he hastily collected together what money he could lay his hands upon and, as we were then in the depth of winter, he put his horses to the sleigh, and taking his children with him, he set off in the middle of the night, 
and was far away before the tragical circumstance had transpired. Aware that he would be pursued, and that he had no chance of escape if he remained in any portion of his native country, in which the authorities could lay hold of him, he continued his flight without intermission until he had buried himself in the intricacies and seclusion of the Hartz Mountains. Of course, all that I have now told you I learned afterwards. My oldest recollections are knit to a rude yet comfortable cottage in which I lived with my father, brother, and sister. It was on the confines of one of those vast forests which cover the northern part of Germany. Around it were a few acres of ground, which during the summer months my father cultivated, and which, though they yielded a doubtful harvest, were sufficient for our support. In the winter we remained much indoors, for as my father followed the chase we were left alone, and the wolves, during that season, incessantly prowled about. My father had purchased the cottage and land about it of one of the rude foresters, who gain their livelihood partly by hunting and partly by burning charcoal, for the purpose of smelting the ore from the neighboring mines. It was distant about two miles from any other habitation. I can call to mind the whole landscape now, the tall pines which rose up on the mountain above us, and the wide expanse of forest beneath, on the topmost boughs and heads of whose trees we looked down from our cottage, as the mountain below us rapidly descended into the distant valley. In summertime the prospect was beautiful, but during the severe winter a more desolate scene could not well be imagined. I said that, in the winter, my father occupied himself with the chase. Every day he left us, and often would he lock the door, that we might not leave the cottage. He had no one to assist him or to take care of us. Indeed, it was not easy to find a female servant who would live in such a solitude. But could he have found one, my father would not have received her, for he had imbibed a horror of the sex, as a difference of his conduct toward us, his two boys, and my poor little sister, Marcella, evidently proved. You may suppose we were sadly neglected. Indeed, we suffered much, for my father, fearful that we might come to some harm, would not allow us fuel when he left the cottage, and we were obliged, therefore, to creep under the heaps of bearskins, and there to keep ourselves as warm as we could until he returned in the evening when a blazing fire was our delight. That my father chose this restless sort of life may appear strange, but the fact was that he could not remain quiet, whether from remorse for having committed murder or from the misery consequent on his change of situation, or from both combined, he was never happy unless he was in a state of activity. Children, however, when left to themselves, acquire a thoughtfulness not common to their age. So it was with us, and during the short cold days of winter we would sit silent, longing for the happy hours when the snow would melt and the leaves burst out and the birds begin their songs and when we should again be set at liberty. Such was our peculiar and savage sort of life until my brother Caesar was nine, myself seven, and my sister five years old, when the circumstances occurred on which is based the extraordinary narrative which I am about to relate. One evening my father returned home rather later than usual. He had been unsuccessful, and as the weather was very severe, and many feet of snow were upon the ground, he was not only very cold, but in a very bad humor. 
He had brought in wood, and we were all three of us gladly assisting each other in blowing on the embers to create the blaze when he caught poor little Marcella by the arm and threw her aside. The child fell, struck her mouth, and bled very much. My brother ran to raise her up. Accustomed to ill usage and afraid of my father, she did not dare to cry, but looked up in his face very piteously. My father drew his stool nearer to the hearth, muttered something in abuse of women, and busied himself with the fire, which both my brother and I had deserted when our sister was so unkindly treated. A cheerful blaze was soon the result of his exertions, but we did not, as usual, crowd round it. Marcella, still bleeding, retired to a corner, and my brother and I took our seats beside her, while my father hung over the fire gloomily and alone. Such had been our position for about half an hour, when the howl of a wolf close under the window of the cottage fell on our ears. My father started up and seized his gun. The howl was repeated. He examined the priming, and then hastily left the cottage, shutting the door after him. We all waited, anxiously listening, for we thought that if he succeeded in shooting the wolf, he would return in a better humor, and although he was harsh to all of us, and particularly so to our little sister, still we loved our father, and loved to see him cheerful and happy, for what else had we to look up to? And I may here observe that perhaps there never were three children who were fonder of each other. We did not, like other children, fight and dispute together, and if by chance any disagreement did arise between my elder brother and me, little Marcella would run to us and, kissing us both, seal through her entreaties the peace between us. Marcella was a lovely, amiable child. I can recall her beautiful features even now. Alas, poor little Marcella. We waited for some time, but the report of the gun did not reach us, and my elder brother then said, Our father has followed the wolf and will not be back for some time. Marcella, let us wash the blood from your mouth, and then we will leave this corner and go to the fire and warm ourselves. We did so, and remained there until near midnight, every minute wondering, as it grew later, why our father did not return. We had no idea that he was in any danger, but we thought that he must have chased the wolf for a very long time. I will look out and see if father is coming, said my brother Caesar, going to the door. Take care, said Marcella. The wolves must be about now, and we cannot kill them, brother. My brother opened the door very cautiously, and but a few inches he peeped out. I see nothing, said he after a time, and once more he joined us at the fire. We have had no supper, said I, for my father usually cooked the meat as soon as he came home, and during his absence we had nothing but the fragments of the preceding day. And if our father comes home after his hunt, Caesar, said Marcella, he will be pleased to have some supper. Let us cook it for him and for ourselves. Caesar climbed upon the stool and reached down some meat. I forget now whether it was venison or bear's meat, but we cut off the usual quantity and proceeded to dress it as we used to do under our father's superintendence. We were all busied putting it into the platters before the fire to await his coming when we heard the sound of a horn. We listened. 
There was a noise outside, and a minute afterwards my father entered, ushering in a young female and a large dark man in a hunter's dress. Perhaps I had better now relate what was only known to me many years afterwards. When my father had left the cottage, he perceived a large white wolf about thirty yards from him. As soon as the animal saw my father, it retreated slowly, growling and snarling. My father followed. The animal did not run, but always kept at some distance, and my father did not like to fire until he was pretty certain that his ball would take effect. Thus they went on for some time, the wolf now leaving my father far behind, and then stopping and snarling defiance at him, and then again, on his approach, setting off at speed. Anxious to shoot the animal, for the white wolf is very rare, my father continued the pursuit for several hours, during which he continually ascended the mountain. You must know that there are peculiar spots on those mountains which are supposed, and as my story will prove, truly supposed, to be inhabited by the evil influences. They are well known to the huntsmen who invariably avoid them. Now, one of these spots, an open space in the pine forests above us, had been pointed out to my father as dangerous on that account. But whether he disbelieved these wild stories, or whether in his eager pursuit of the chase he disregarded them, I know not. Certain, however, it is that he was decoyed by the white wolf to this open space, when the animal appeared to slacken her speed. My father approached, came close up to her, raised his gun to his shoulder, and was about to fire when the wolf suddenly disappeared. He thought that the snow on the ground must have dazzled his sight, and he let down his gun to look for the beast, but she was gone. How she could have escaped over the clearance without his seeing her was beyond his comprehension. Mortified at the ill success of his chase, he was about to retrace his steps when he heard the distant sound of a horn. Astonishment at such a sound, at such an hour, in such a wilderness, made him forget for the moment his disappointment, and he remained riveted to the spot. In a minute the horn was blown a second time, and at no great distance. My father stood still and listened. A third time it was blown. I forget the term used to express it, but it was the signal which, my father well knew, implied that the party was lost in the woods. In a few minutes more my father beheld a man on horseback, with a female seated on the crupper, enter the cleared space and ride up to him. At first my father called to mind the strange stories which he had heard of the supernatural beings who were said to frequent these mountains, but the nearer approach of the parties satisfied him that they were mortals like himself. As soon as they came up to him, the man who guided the horse accosted him. Friend Hunter, you are out late. The better fortune for us. We have ridden far, and are in fear of our lives, which are eagerly sought after. These mountains have enabled us to elude our pursuers, but if we find not shelter and refreshment, that will avail us little as we must perish from hunger and the inclemency of the night. My daughter, who rides behind me, is now more dead than alive. Say, can you assist us in our difficulty? My cottage is some few miles distant, replied my father, but I have little to offer you besides a shelter from the weather. To the little I have you are welcome. May I ask whence you come? Yes, friend, it is no secret now. 
We have escaped from Transylvania, where my daughter's honor and my life were equally in jeopardy. This information was quite enough to raise an interest in my father's heart. He remembered his own escape. He remembered the loss of his wife's honor and the tragedy by which it was wound up. He immediately and warmly offered all the assistance which he could afford them. There is no time to be lost then, good sir, observed the horseman. My daughter is chilled with the frost and cannot hold out much longer against the severity of the weather. Follow me, replied my father, leading the way towards his home. I was lured away in pursuit of a large white wolf, observed my father. It came to the very window of my hut, or I should not have been out at this time of night. The creature passed by us just as we came out of the wood, said the female in a silvery tone. I was nearly discharging my piece at it, observed the hunter. But since it did us such good service, I am glad that I allowed it to escape. In about an hour and a half, during which my father walked at a rapid pace, the party arrived at the cottage, and as I said before, came in. We are in good time, apparently, observed the dark hunter, catching the smell of the roasted meat as he walked to the fire and surveyed my brother and sister and myself. You have young cooks here, mine here. I am glad that we shall not have to wait, replied my father. Come, mistress, seat yourself by the fire. You require warmth after your cold ride. And where can I put up my horse, mine hare? observed the huntsman. I will take care of him, replied my father, going out the cottage door. The female must, however, be particularly described. She was young and apparently twenty years of age. She was dressed in a traveling dress, deeply bordered with white fur, and wore a cap of white ermine on her head. Her features were very beautiful, at least I thought so, and so my father has since declared. Her hair was flaxen, glossy and shining, and bright as a mirror, and her mouth, although somewhat large when it was open, showed the most brilliant teeth I have ever beheld. But there was something about her eyes, bright as they were, which made us children afraid. They were so restless, so furtive. I could not at that time tell why, but I felt as if there was cruelty in her eye, and when she beckoned us to come to her, we approached her with fear and trembling. Still, she was beautiful, very beautiful. She spoke kindly to my brother and myself, patted our heads, and caressed us. But Marcella would not come near her. On the contrary, she slunk away, and hid herself in the bed, and would not wait for the supper which half an hour before she had been so anxious for. My father, having put the horse into a close shed, soon returned, and supper was placed upon the table. When it was over, my father requested that the young lady would take possession of his bed, and he would remain at the fire and sit up with her father. After some hesitation on her part, this arrangement was agreed to, and I and my brother crept into the other bed with Marcella, for we had as yet always slept together. But we could not sleep. There was something so unusual, not only in seeing strange people, but in having those people sleep at the cottage, that we were bewildered. As for poor little Marcella, she was quiet, but I perceived that she trembled during the whole night, and sometimes I thought that she was checking a sob. My father had brought out some spirits, which he rarely used, 
and he and the strange hunter remained drinking and talking before the fire. Our ears were ready to catch the slightest whisper. So much was our curiosity excited. You said you came from Transylvania, observed my father. Even so, mynheer, replied the hunter. I was a serf to the noble house of blank. My master would insist upon my surrendering up my fair girl to his wishes. It ended in my giving him a few inches of my hunting knife. We are countrymen and brothers in misfortune, replied my father, taking the huntsman's hand and pressing it warmly. Indeed! Are you, then, from that country? Yes, and I, too, have fled for my life, but mine is a melancholy tale. Your name? inquired the hunter. Krantz. What? Krantz of— I have heard your tale. You need not renew your grief by repeating it now. Welcome, most welcome, mine here. And, I may say, my worthy kinsman, I am your second cousin, Wilfred of Barnsdorf, cried the hunter, rising up and embracing my father. They filled their horn mugs to the brim and drank to one another after the German fashion. The conversation was then carried on in a low tone. All that we could collect from it was— that our new relative and his daughter were to take up their abode in our cottage, at least for the present. In about an hour they both fell back in their chairs and appeared to sleep. Marcella, dear, did you hear? said my brother in a low tone. Yes, replied Marcella in a whisper. I heard all. Oh, brother— I cannot bear to look upon that woman. I feel so frightened. My brother made no reply, and shortly afterwards we were all three fast asleep. When we awoke the next morning, we found that the hunter's daughter had risen before us. I thought she looked more beautiful than ever. She came up to little Marcella and caressed her. The child burst into tears and sobbed as if her heart would break. But not to detain you with too long a story, the huntsman and his daughter were accommodated in the cottage. My father and he went out hunting daily, leaving Christina with us. She performed all the household duties, was very kind to us children, and gradually the dislike even of little Marcella wore away. But a great change took place in my father. He appeared to have conquered his aversion to the sex, and was most attentive to Christina. Often, after her father and we were in bed, would he sit up with her, conversing in a low tone by the fire. I ought to have mentioned that my father and the huntsman Wilfred slept in another portion of the cottage, and that the bed which he formerly occupied, and which was in the same room as ours, had been given up to the use of Christina. These visitors had been about three weeks at the cottage, when one night, after we children had been sent to bed, a consultation was held. My father had asked Christina in marriage, and had obtained both her own consent and that of Wilfred. After this, a conversation took place which was, as nearly as I can recollect, as follows. You may take my child, Mynheer Kranz, and my blessing with her, and I shall then leave you and seek some other habitation. It matters little where. Why not remain here, Wilfred? No, no, I am called elsewhere. Let that suffice and ask no more questions. You have my child. I thank you for her and will duly value her, but there is one difficulty. 
I know what you would say, that there is no priest here in this wild country. True, neither is there any law to bind, still must some ceremony pass between you to satisfy a father. Will you consent to marry her after my fashion? If so, I will marry you directly. I will, replied my father. Then take her by the hand. Now, mine here, swear. I swear, repeated my father, by all the spirits of the heart's mountains. Nay, why not by heaven, interrupted my father. Because it is not my humor, rejoined Wilfred. If I prefer that oath, less binding perhaps than another, surely you will not thwart me. Well, be it so then, have your humor. Will you make me swear by that in which I do not believe? Yet many do so, who in outward appearance are Christians, rejoined Wilfred. Say, will you be married? or shall I take my daughter away with me? Proceed, replied my father impatiently. I swear by all the spirits of the heart's mountains, by all their power for good or for evil, that I take Christina for my wedded wife, that I will ever protect her, cherish her, and love her that my hand shall never be raised against her to harm her. My father repeated the words after Wilfred. And if I fail in this, my vow, may all the vengeance of the spirits fall upon me and upon my children. May they perish by the vulture, by the wolf, or other beasts of the forest. May their flesh be torn from their limbs and their bones blanch in the wilderness. All this I swear. My father hesitated as he repeated the last words. Little Marcella could not restrain herself, and as my father repeated the last sentence, she burst into tears. This sudden interruption appeared to discompose the party, particularly my father. He spoke harshly to the child, who controlled her sobs, burying her face under the bedclothes. Such was the second marriage of my father. The next morning the hunter Wilfred mounted his horse and rode away. My father resumed his bed, which was in the same room as ours, and things went on much as before the marriage, except that our new mother-in-law did not show any kindness towards us. Indeed, during my father's absence, she would often beat us, particularly little Marcella, and her eyes would flash fire as she looked eagerly upon the fair and lovely child. One night, my sister awoke me and my brother. What is the matter? asked Caesar. She has gone out, whispered Marcella. Gone out? Yes, gone out at the door, in her night clothes, replied the child. I saw her get out of bed, look at my father to see if he slept, and then she went out the door. What could induce her to leave her bed and all undressed to go out in such bitter wintry weather, with the snow deep on the ground, was to us incomprehensible. We lay awake, and in about an hour we heard the growl of a wolf close under the window. There is a wolf, said Caesar. She will be torn to pieces. Oh, no, cried Marcella. In a few minutes afterwards, our mother-in-law appeared. She was in her nightdress, as Marcella had stated. She let down the latch of the door, so as to make no noise, went to a pail of water, and washed her face and hands, and then slipped into the bed where my father lay. 
We all three trembled. We hardly knew why, but we resolved to watch the next night. We did so, and not only on the ensuing night, but on many others, and always at about the same hour would our mother-in-law rise from her bed and leave the cottage. And after she was gone, we invariably heard the growl of a wolf under our window, and always saw her, on her return, wash herself before she retired to bed. We observed also that she seldom sat down to meals, and that when she did, she appeared to eat with dislike. But when the meat was taken down to be prepared for dinner, she would often furtively put a raw piece into her mouth. My brother Caesar was a courageous boy. He did not like to speak to my father until he knew more. He resolved that he would follow her out and ascertain what she did. Marcella and I endeavored to dissuade him from his project, but he could not be controlled. And the very next night he lay down in his clothes, and as soon as our mother-in-law had left the cottage, he jumped up, took down my father's gun, and followed her. You may imagine in what a state of suspense Marcella and I remained during his absence. After a few minutes, we heard the report of a gun. It did not awaken my father, and we lay trembling with anxiety. In a minute afterwards, we saw our mother-in-law enter the cottage. Her dress was bloody. I put my hand to Marcella's mouth to prevent her crying out, although I was myself in great alarm. Our mother-in-law approached my father's bed, looked to see if he was asleep, and then went to the chimney and blew up the embers into a blaze. "'Who is there?' said my father, waking up. "'Lie still, dearest,' replied my mother-in-law. "'It is only me. I have lighted the fire to warm some water. I am not quite well.' My father turned round and was soon asleep but we watched our mother-in-law. She changed her linen and threw the garments she had worn into the fire, and we then perceived that her right leg was bleeding profusely, as if from a gunshot wound. She bandaged it up, and then dressing herself, remained before the fire until the break of day. Poor little Marcella! Her heart beat quick as she pressed me to her side, so indeed did mine. Where was our brother Caesar? How did my mother-in-law receive the wound unless from his gun? At last my father rose, and then for the first time I spoke, saying, Father, where is my brother Caesar? Your brother? exclaimed he. Why, where can he be? Merciful heaven! I thought as I lay very restless last night, observed our mother-in-law, that I heard somebody open the latch of the door. And, dear me, husband, what has become of your gun? My father cast his eyes up above the chimney and perceived that his gun was missing. For a moment he looked perplexed. Then, seizing a broad axe, he went out of the cottage without saying another word. He did not remain away from us long. In a few minutes he returned, bearing in his arms the mangled body of my poor brother. He laid it down and covered up his face. My mother-in-law rose up and looked at the body while Marcella and I threw ourselves by its side, wailing and sobbing bitterly. "'Go to bed again, children,' she said sharply. "'Husband,' continued she, "'your boy must have taken the gun down to shoot a wolf, and the animal has been too powerful for him. Poor boy, he has paid dearly for his rashness.' 
My father made no reply. I wished to speak, to tell all, but Marcella, who perceived my intention, held me by the arm and looked at me so imploringly that I desisted. My father, therefore, was left in his error. But Marcella and I, although we could not comprehend it, were conscious that our mother-in-law was in some way connected with my brother's death. That day my father went out and dug a grave, and when he laid the body in the earth he piled up stones over it, so that the wolves should not be able to dig it up. The shock of this catastrophe was to my poor father very severe. For several days he never went to the chase, although at times he would utter bitter anathemas and vengeance against the wolves. But during this time of mourning on his part, my mother-in-law's nocturnal wanderings continued with the same regularity as before. At last my father took down his gun to repair to the forest, but he soon returned and appeared much annoyed. Would you believe it, Christina, that the wolves, perdition to the whole race, have actually contrived to dig up the body of my poor boy, and now there is nothing left of him but his bones? Indeed replied my mother-in-law. Marcella looked at me, and I saw in her intelligent eye all she would have uttered. A wolf growls under our window every night, father, said I. Ay, indeed. Why did you not tell me, boy? Wake me the next time you hear it. I saw my mother-in-law turn away, her eyes flashed fire, and she gnashed her teeth. My father went out again, and covered up with a larger pile of stones the little remnants of my poor brother which the wolves had spared. Such was the first act of the tragedy. The spring now came on, the snow disappeared, and we were permitted to leave the cottage but never would I quit for one moment my dear little sister, to whom, since the death of my brother, I was more ardently attached than ever. Indeed, I was afraid to leave her alone with my mother-in-law, who appeared to have a particular pleasure in ill-treating the child. My father was now employed upon his little farm, and I was able to render him some assistance. Marcella used to sit by us while we were at work, leaving my mother-in-law alone in the cottage. I ought to observe that, as the spring advanced, so did my mother decrease her nocturnal rambles, and that we never heard the growl of the wolf under the window after I had spoken of it to my father. One day, when my father and I were in the field, Marcella being with us, my mother-in-law came out, saying that she was going into the forest to collect some herbs my father wanted, and that Marcella must go to the cottage and watch the dinner. Marcella went, and my mother-in-law soon disappeared in the forest, taking a direction quite contrary to that in which the cottage stood and leaving my father and I, as it were, between her and Marcella. About an hour afterwards, we were startled by shrieks from the cottage, evidently the shrieks of little Marcella. Marcella has burned herself, father, said I, throwing down my spade. My father threw down his, and we both hastened to the cottage. Before we could gain the door, out started a large white wolf, which fled with the utmost celerity. My father had no weapon. He rushed into the cottage, and there saw poor little Marcella expiring. Her body was dreadfully mangled, and the blood pouring from it had formed a large pool on the cottage floor. 
My father's first intention had been to seize his gun and pursue, but he was checked by this horrid spectacle. He knelt down by his dying child and burst into tears. Marcella could just look kindly on us for a few seconds, and then her eyes were closed in death. My father and I were still hanging over my poor sister's body when my mother-in-law came in. At the dreadful sight, she expressed much concern, but she did not appear to recoil from the sight of blood as most women do. Poor child, said she. It must have been that great white wolf which passed me just now and frightened me so. She's quite dead, Crance. I know it, I know it, cried my father in agony. I thought my father would never recover from the effects of this second tragedy. He mourned bitterly over the body of his sweet child, and for several days would not consign it to its grave, although frequently requested by my mother-in-law to do so. At last he yielded and dug a grave for her close by that of my poor brother, and took every precaution that the wolves should not violate her remains. I was now really miserable, as I lay alone in the bed which I had formerly shared with my brother and sister. I could not help thinking that my mother-in-law was implicated in both their deaths, although I could not account for the manner. But I no longer felt afraid of her. My little heart was full of hatred and revenge. The night after my sister had been buried, as I lay awake, I perceived my mother-in-law get up and go out of the cottage. I waited for some time, then dressed myself, and looked out through the door, which I half opened. The moon shone bright, and I could see the spot where my brother and my sister had been buried. And what was my horror when I perceived my mother-in-law busily removing the stones from Marcella's grave? She was in her white nightdress, and the moon shone full upon her. She was digging with her hands and throwing away the stones behind her with all the ferocity of a wild beast. It was some time before I could collect my senses and decide what I should do. At last, I perceived that she had arrived at the body and raised it up to the side of the grave. I could bear it no longer. I ran to my father and awoke him. Father, father, cried I, dress yourself and get your gun. What? cried my father. The wolves are there, are they? He jumped out of bed, threw on his clothes, and in his anxiety did not appear to perceive the absence of his wife. As soon as he was ready, I opened the door. He went out, and I followed him. Imagine his horror when, unprepared as he was for such a sight, he beheld, as he advanced towards the grave, not a wolf, but his wife, in her nightdress, on her hands and knees, crouching by the body of my sister, and tearing off large pieces of the flesh, and devouring them with all the avidity of a wolf. She was too busy to be aware of our approach. My father dropped his gun. His hair stood on end. So did mine. He breathed heavily, and then his breath for a time stopped. I picked up the gun and put it into his hand. Suddenly he appeared as if concentrated rage had restored him to double vigor. He leveled his piece, fired, and with a loud shriek down fell the wretch whom he had fostered in his bosom. "'God of heaven!' cried my father, sinking down upon the earth in a swoon as soon as he had discharged his gun. I remained some time by his side before he recovered. "'Where am I?' 
said he. What has happened? Ah, oh, yes, yes. I recollect now. Heaven forgive me. He rose and we walked up to the grave. What again was our astonishment and horror to find that instead of the dead body of my mother-in-law, as we expected, there was lying over the remains of my poor sister a large white she-wolf. The white wolf, exclaimed my father. The white wolf which decoyed me into the forest. I see it all now. I have dealt with the spirits of the Hearts Mountains. For some time my father remained in silence and deep thought. He then carefully lifted up the body of my sister, replaced it in the grave, and covered it over as before, having struck the head of the dead animal with the heel of his boot and raving like a madman. He walked back to the cottage, shut the door, and threw himself on the bed. I did the same, for I was in a stupor of amazement. Early in the morning we were both roused by a loud knocking at the door, and in rushed the hunter Wilfred. My daughter! Man, my daughter! Where is my daughter? cried he in a rage. Where the wretch the fiend should be, I trust, replied my father, starting up and displaying equal collar. Where she should be, in hell. Leave this cottage, or you may fare worse. Ha! replied the hunter. Would you harm a potent spirit of the Hearts Mountains, poor mortal who must needs wed a werewolf? Out, demon, I defy thee and thy power. Yet shall you feel it. Remember your oath, your solemn oath, never to raise your hand against her to harm her. I made no compact with evil spirits. You did, and if you failed in your vow, you were to meet the vengeance of the spirits. Your children were to perish by the vulture, the wolf. Out, out, demon, and their bones blanch in the wilderness. Ha! My father, frantic with rage, seized his axe and raised it over Wilfred's head to strike. All this I swear, continued the huntsman mockingly. The axe descended, but it passed through the form of the hunter, and my father lost his balance and fell heavily on the floor. Mortal, said the hunter, striding over my father's body, we have power over those only who have committed murder. You have been guilty of a double murder. You shall pay the penalty attached to your marriage vow. Two of your children are gone, the third is yet to follow. And follow them he will, for your oath is registered. Go, it were kindness to kill thee, your punishment is, is that, that you, you live. live. End of The Werewolf by H. B. Marriott. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.